The following message is best viewed on an oscilloscope. Okay, um, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you for join joining us. This is a neutrino session three, and today we will have 11 talks, and each talk will have 15 minutes, including question and uh, answer time. So I think let's get, um, let's get started with the first talk. First detection of solar neutrinos from CNO cycle with Braxino from Andonanic. Please. Okay, good morning. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay, so- But not uh, full screen yet. It's a uh, full screen now. Okay. So I, I, I'm going to tell you about the first detection of solar neutrinos uh, from CNO uh, cycle in Borexino. So Borexino is a um, detector which consists of 280 tons of liquid scintillator viewed by 2212 uh, 8-inch PMTs inside an active uh, water sharing of muon Vito. For this uh, specific... Sorry, uh, sorry to interrupt, but we don't see your full screen and the screen is not changing. Maybe there is a delay. Uh, we can wait a few minutes, but I think somebody, can anyone else confirm that you don't see the full screen? No, no, yeah, we don't see the full screen and it's no delay. This is not a full screen, uh, and this is a full screen. We see now black screen. Black screen, huh? Yes, black yes, screen. Yes, we see a black screen. Uh, I stop and re redo the sharing. If not, I can also share for you. So I, I redo the sharing. You want to try it a second time? If not working, then I can share for you. Yes, okay, thank you. We can see now full screen. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, the Borexino consists of uh, 280 tons of liquid scintillator inside an active uh, water Cherenkov detector. Uh, for this specific data set, uh, we have used uh, 1238 uh, active channels uh, and uh, a, an energy resolution at 1 MeV of 6% and a special resolution of 11 centimeter at 1 MeV. So this is the inside of the Borexino detector, the inner detector with the photomultipliers, and this is the detector completely filled with liquid scintillator in 2007 when we started the, the data taking. So Borexino data taking has been divided in three phases. The first phase uh, ended in 2010 between the first and the second uh, we performed a, a liquid scintillator purification campaign uh, by means of water extraction. And then at the end of phase two, uh, we uh, installed a thermal insulation uh, system and an active temperature control system, which is uh, important for the present uh, analysis uh, of uh, CNO neutrinos. 
In phase three, we detected uh, the CNO neutrinos. So solar neutrinos are produced, uh, as you know, by the PP chain uh, and by the CNO cycle. In particular, for the CNO cycle, neutrinos are produced uh, by uh, beta decay of nitrogen and uh, oxygen, mainly, with a subdominant uh, production of uh, beta decay of fluor, 27, uh, 17. So uh, while uh, this process is uh, running, uh, hydrogen is fused into helium. Solar neutrinos uh, are related to energy production. As a matter of fact, uh, as you can see in this relationship, the luminosity of the sun can be written in terms of uh, solar neutrino fluxes when one assumes uh, energy conservation. So the importance of the two chain uh, production for neutrinos uh, depends on the mass of the star and uh, as a consequence on the central temperature. For the sun in particular, where you have about uh, 15 million Kelvin at the center of the star, the main production energy is due to the PP chain. Uh, CNO cycle is producing only about 1% of the energy. And this makes uh, uh, more difficult uh, the detection of these uh, neutrinos. So here you can see the solar neutrino spectrum, energy spectrum on the left. And on the right, when you fold this spectrum with the neutrino electron elastic scattering, uh, uh, as is the case in Borexino, then you can see the uh, visible spectrum as a function of the electron recall energy. And in particular, what you can notice is that the CNO neutrino spectrum, which is in green here, is featureless. On the contrary, the beryllium-7 and PP neutrino spectrum uh, has a, a peculiar Compton-like edge, which makes uh, more easy the detection of these uh, neutrinos because they are monoenergetic. So this, in this table, you can see the achievements on solar neutrinos uh, by Porexino. So this uh, column here uh, reports uh, the prediction uh, of the standard solar model for high uh, metallicity and low metallicity. And uh, uh, I report here also the rate, which is the measurement uh, uh, performed in Borexino and the Borexino flux when you assume neutrino oscillations. So Borexino uh, before, uh, 2020 has measured uh, uh, all the sources uh, from uh, the PP chain. And uh, this year we have performed a measurement of the CNO neutrinos. So what is the challenge uh, to uh, measure solar, uh, CNO neutrinos? Uh, first of all, the expected rate is small. It's uh, between three and five count per day in 100 tons from the solar standard model. The main background is bismuth 210, which comes from lead 210. And here you can see the decay chain of lead, which produces bismuth 210 and polonium 210, beta and alpha respectively. So if there is no uh, other source, but only uh, lead, the chain is in secular equilibrium and the activity of bismuth is the same as of polonium. The other important uh, uh, point is the strong correlation between CNO, PP, and bismuth. As you can see here, this is the real data where uh, I have highlighted uh, in red uh, the CNO uh, expected uh, uh, spectrum, and in blue and red and green uh, the uh, bismuth and uh, uh, PP. So there is a strong correlation between uh, these uh, spectra and therefore uh, one needs to uh, have an extra information to break uh, this uh, degeneracy. In any case, uh, the expected uh, signal to background ratio is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.3. So this makes uh, the measurement uh, uh, more difficult. So let's go to this slide. So the strategy is based on the thermal insulation and temperature control. On this upper left plot, uh, you can see a picture. You can see the water tank of Borexino with the uh, thermal insulation. 
uh, and inside uh, the uh, underneath the thermal insulation at the top uh, there is also a, a temperature control system by means of which we can inject uh, some uh, heat so on the uh, plot on the left on the right you can see the deployment of uh, 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 temperature probes to determine to measure the temperature in different locations inside the detector and uh, uh, Borexino is sitting on a cold floor at 7.5 Celsius. And at the top of the temperature, uh, the air temperature, it's about 15.8 Celsius. So there is a gradient of 0 0.5 Celsius uh, uh, per meter. And uh, the idea is to uh, keep uh, this uh, gradient stable in time in such a way that we avoid uh, uh, convection currents uh, inside uh, this scintillator. And in the lower left plot, you can see the trend of the temperature after the uh, startup of the insulation and temperature control system. So this is very important for the CNO measurement. The strategy uh, is based on uh, mitigation of correlation uh, uh, due to bismuth 210 by the reducing the convection currents and keeping the gradient constant. The convection currents can bring inside the fiducial volume bismuth, but mainly polonium 210. The second uh, uh, point in this strategy is to exploit uh, pole shape discrimination to determine polonium and from polonium determine bismuth, uh, uh, determine bismuth to 10. So here you can see the um, uh, trend in time of polonium to 10 measured by means of the pole shape discrimination inside the fiducial volume. As you can see before the uh, thermal insulation uh, the, uh, installation, the polonium was moving a lot inside the fiducial volume. And even at the center of the detector, we had uh, uh, many counts uh, per day. Uh, after the installation of the thermal insulation and the temperature control system, convection currents uh, uh, diminished a lot, uh, decreased, and uh, at the center of the detector, we have a very uh, low uh, polonium uh, rate. As a matter of fact, we can establish that the polonium rate is due to the bismuth rate, which is in secular equilibrium with polonium, due to intrinsic lead to 10 contamination, plus polonium coming from the vessel, from the outer region. And this is uh, taken inside the fiducial volume by means of the convection currents. So if the convection currents are zero, then the polonium and the bismuth activity is the same uh, due to the secular equilibrium. So the real idea is that to measure polonium uh, inside the fiducial volume uh, uh, where there, are, there is no convection currents and determine a constraint for the bismuth. The other important point, once the bismuth rate is measured, is to establish that the bismuth to 10 is uniform and uh, uh, in time and in space. Uh, so stable in time and uniform in space inside the fiducial volume. And we have tested that. And here you can see in this plot uh, the trend of uh, beta-like uh, events in the region of interest. Uh, where there is no uh, uh, polonium activity. And uh, in this region, you can see that uh, the beta uh, event uh, rate is stable uh, in, in time. And we have also tested that it's uniform in time. And this is because the distribution of lead to 10 inside the liquid scintillator is uniform. So with this information, we determine uh, a, an upper limit for the bismuth to 10 rate of 11.5 plus minus 1.3 count per day in 100 tons, including systematic effects. So with this, uh, we can proceed uh, to analyze the data and determine uh, the CNO uh, solar neutrino flux. So we have chosen an energy window for the spectral fit between uh, about 300 kV and 2.6 MeV. Uh, we have a fit uh, at the simultaneously the energy spectrum the ra and the radial distribution of the events. The three parameters in the fit that you can see here on the upper 
uh, right plot uh, is CNO, Krypton, carbon-11, which is cosmogenic, potassium-40, uh, thallium-208, bismuth-214 from radon, and beryllium-7 from solar neutrinos. The solar neutrino PP rate is constrained to 2.7 from the PP measurement, and uh, uh, it, uh, the bismuth 210 is constrained to what we have uh, uh, established using polonium 210. So we have used uh, 1,072 days of lifetime and uh, standard selection cuts, so reducing muon and muon daughter, uh, selecting a fiducial volume and exploiting a threefold coincidence to reduce the carbon-11 cosmogenic background. So here you can see in the lower right plot uh, the uh, delta chi square uh, profile as a function of the CNO rate. Uh, the solid black line is without systematic is with the systematic, and the dotted uh, line is uh, uh, without systematic. Uh, in addition, the histogram reports uh, accounting analysis just considering a beam of energy, which is the one highlighted in the upper right plot uh, in yellow, uh, where the main component is, as a matter of fact, CNO neutrinos. So from this, uh, we have determined this result here, which is the first measurement of CNO neutrinos. So uh, the updated uh, table that which I've shown uh, before is this, uh, with all the solar neutrino measurements in Borexino, and this is uh, my conclusions. So the observation of CNO, it's a breakthrough uh, in uh, solar neutrino uh, science, uh, and uh, I'm open for any questions uh, uh, from you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. And if you have a question, I think we have uh, like, a short question. If you have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, I think we have one. And uh, let me see. So please, let me see who is, but I cannot. I think uh, we have one audience raise the hand, but I don't see who this is. Uh, hello, you, this please. is Tony. Yes. Uh, yes, please, uh, go ahead. Okay, so excellent talk and congratulations again for the CNO neutrino uh, observations with Thank five you. sigma. Uh, as far as I understand, your result is uh, you know uncertainty on your observation is dominated by statistical uncertainty. And my question is, uh, are you going to take more data until you you know disinstall your detector, or are you stop? You already stopped, or what? How is it? What's the situation? Uh, okay, uh, thank you for your question. No, we are taking data. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, by at the end of last year, we have improved uh, the temperature control inside uh, the experimental hall, and so now we have a very uh, accurate uh, determination of the temp of the air temperature inlet inside the hall and this is improving uh, the stability of the inner part of the detector <clears throat> so we hope that uh, with the data that we are taking now before the decommission of the detector we could even improve uh, this uh, uh, measurement because we could we could improve uh, the determination of bismuth uh, to ten. So we at presently we are taking data and we think uh, there are some uncertainty, but we can take data till the end of uh, this year uh, and uh, be before the decommissioning. But the decommissioning time is uh, unknown at the present time, and so uh, we can we we are going to take data till we can. Uh, keep the detector running uh, and we hope we can with this improvement we made last year we can even improve a little bit the present result thank you thank you i think we are running out of time so let's go let's thank our speaker and uh, let's go to second talk the react to anti neutrino flux and the spectral measurement at daya bay uh, feng peng would you please share your screen Okay, please.
I'm going to talk about the radical anti neutral flags and spectrum measurement at IB. Uh, I'm from, from East China University of Science and Technology. Uh, here is a brief overview of the IB radical neutral experiment. Uh, it is designed to measure T23 using antineutrinos produced by uh, six reactors, and uh, each reactor with uh, 2.9 power. We installed uh, eight identically designed antineutrino detectors in the experimental halls, two near halls and one far hall. And uh, this experiment starts from uh, Christmas of 2011, and we discovered the non-zero T13 mixing angle in 2012. And the IB collaboration is an international collaboration. Now we have 191 collaborators in 41 institutes from Asia, Europe, and North America. Uh, reactors are very strong anti neutrino sources. And uh, in the IB, the six reactors have a total thermal power of 70.4 gigawatts, producing 3.5 times 10, 10, 10 to the 21 electron anti neutrinos per second. And the antineutrinos are mainly produced by the beta decay of the fission fragments of uh, these isotopes to uranium and to plutonium. And the fission fragments of the isotopes has uh, intrinsic uh, mass distribution. So for each isotope, uh, they have a intrinsic uh, antineutrino spectrum, uh, like shown in here. Uh, this is the human mirror model showing the Antineutrino spectrum of the four isotopes. Uh, in IAB, we detect uh, antineutrino with uh, inverse beta decay and uh, using liquid scintillator detector. This detector is designed with three zones. The inner zone is uh, filled with 20 ton gasoline doped li li liquid scintillator uh, at the antineutrino target. The middle layer is filled with liquid scintillator, 20 ton as a gamma catcher. And the outer layer is filled with 40 ton mineral oil as a radiation shielding. And 192 uh, PMTs are installed to collect the photon signals. The combined detection of the detector efficiency is 8.2% uh, plus minus 1.2% uncertainty. Uh, and the energy resolution is 8.5%. The neutrino uh, interact uh, with the proton while inverted the decay, producing one positron and one neutron. And the positron ionizes uh, immediately and uh, producing a proton signal. And the proton will uh, be captured on proton or gadolinium later, forming a uh, delay signal. So with this character, we can exclude the background effectively. The lower plot shows the uh, inverse beta decay cross section, and the dot, dotted uh, plot is the uh, predicted uh, antineutrino spectra in the detector. Besides the C213 measurements, the IB also did a series of uh, antineutrino flux and spectrum measurement uh, from the beginning, uh, from 217 days data taking time to now 1958 uh, days data taking. And the statistics uh, for now is 3.5 million IBs in the near side, which is 10 uh, more than the beginning ones. And in this talk, I will talk about the recent uh, work we did, the improved measurement of the reactor antineutrino flux and the IB, and the extraction of the two isotope antineutrino spectrum and the IB. Uh, in recent development, we improved our systematic uncertainties. The first one, we improved the energy scale uncertainty from 1% to 0.5%. And we reduced the uh, lithium-9, uh, helium-8 background uncertainty from 45% uh, to 30%. And we reduced the spent nuclear fuel uncertainty from 100% to 30%. And lastly, we improved the neutron detection efficiency uncertainty from 1.69% to 0.74%. In the next page, I will talk about this. And to improve the neutron detection efficiency, we did a comprehensive detector calibration and model studies. For the calibrations, uh, we use the three calibration axes vertically inside and outside the gallium region uh, with two neutron sources. And a total 58, 59 source calibration points are obtained. 
And for the models, we use three neutron scatter models and four neutron gallium capture gamma models. And the combined uh, altogether is a 20 simulated model combination. With these calibrations and model studies, we improve our uh, neutron detection efficiency uncertainty from 1.69% to 0.74%. And the total flux uncertainty improved from 2.1% to 1.5%. So here is the recent anti neutrino flux measurement using 12 or 30 days data. And uh, we compare the, our measurements to the Himmler prediction. In the previous analysis with the 621 days analysis, the ratio is uh, 0 0.946 plus minus 0 0.02. And now this is uh, the ratio is 0. 0.952 and uh, with the uh, improved uncertainty 0 0.014. And this result agrees with the other experiments. In this left plot, the uh, blue line is the world average, and uh, our result agrees with the average uh, within one segment range. And this is a red uh, anti neutrino spectrum measurements uh, with 1958 days uh, measurements. You can see, comparing with the previous analysis, the uncertainty improved a lot. And the comparison with the human model, human model, the spectral shape decreases with the human model at 5.3 sigma. And an excess in 4 to 6 mm range is observed with the 6.2 6 sigma discrepancy. Uh, with more, with much more events collected, we begin thinking of uh, uh, extract the uh, total spectrum from this uh, total uh, spe manual spectrum with the detector data and the fission fraction data provided by the nuclear power plant. Here is an example of a fission fraction in a typical refueling cycle. You can see the fission fraction evolves with the burn up and the you can expect that the total anti neutrino spectrum will evolve with, with these changes. Uh, this plot shows all the refueling cycles stacking together from the beginning of our experiment. And we also define the quantity called the effective fission fraction, which is a fission fraction observed by detectors because uh, each detector can observe six reactors and uh, with different baseline. And uh, these reactors are at very different burning stages and uh, each detector has some differences. So uh, we define this fission fraction, effective fission fraction. And here shows the effective fission fraction of plutonium-239 uh, of near size. You can see these up and downs reflect the uh, activities of the reactors. And the effective fission fraction of uranium-235 ranges from 50% uh, to 65%, and uh, for plutonium, ranges from 24% uh, to 35%. Here is how we extract the spectra of two isotopes with uh, 1958 days data. Firstly, the 3.5 many antineutrinos detected in near size are divided into 20 groups ordered by the plutonium-239 effective fission fraction. Then we fit the uranium and the plutonium spectra as two unknown arrays with uh, 26 energy beams for each isotope. Here's the cat square uh, function we constructed. And uh, this term is the likelihood function comparing the predicted spectrum of the 20 groups and the measured spectrum of the 20 groups. And the plus one constraint on using parameters since our measurements are not sensitive to uranium-238 and plutonium-241. So we use them as constrained terms in, in this term. And using Hume-Muller model as their priors and uh, sign a uh, large uncertainty, more than 10%, both in rate and shape. We also consider the time-dependent contributions from non-equilibrium isotopes, then nuclear fields, non-linear nuclei, and the backgrounds. And we also did an independent analysis using Markov chain Monte Carlo based on Bayesian inference on uh, and obtains uh, consistent results. And here is the 
extracted uranium-235, plutonium-239 spectra, uh, together shown with the human model. And this is the first extraction of the two isotope spectrum of, of uh, commercial reactors. And in the four to six MeV range, the two isotope spectra have similar bomb structure like the total spectra. And the local deviation for uranium-235 is four sigma, while plutonium-239 is 1.2 sigma due to large uncertainties. And for the IBD ratio, uranium-235 is 0 0.92, plutonium-239 is 0 0.99. So you can see that uh, uranium-235 is more likely to be responsible for the reactor anti neutrino anomaly. Uh, in previous slide, we treat uranium-238 uh, and plutonium-241 as constrained uh, uh, term. So, uh you can see that uh, they have some uh, this fit has some uh, dependence of the two terms so to reduce the plutonium uncertainty we combine the plutonium 239 plutonium 241 as one term using this formula uh by fitting the relations with the uh, fitting fraction of uh, the two plutonium uh, uh, isotopes and after this combination we extracted the uranium-235 uh, spectrum and the uh, plutonium combo spectrum. Then the dependence of the input, input of plutonium-241 is largely removed. So the extracted plutonium combo spectrum uncertainty is 6%, which is uh, much smaller than 9% for plutonium-239 only fit shown here. So here is my summary. In recent development, we reduce particular cinematic uncertainties and acquire more, uh, more than 50% more statistics than the previous analysis. And we improve measurements of uh, reactor and neutrino flux and agree with other experiments. And we improve the, the measurements of uh, reactor neutrino spectrum. The spectral shape disagree with the human model prediction now is that uh, formed uh, 5.3 sigma. And the bump range, the local deviation is about 6.3 sigma. And uh, we have a uh, first extraction of the two isotope spectrum of commercial reactors. And uh, both of them have uh, similar access in the bump range. And uh, uranium-235 is more likely to be responsible for the reactor anti neutrino anomaly. And uh, these extracted spectrum can be used as a reference spectrum for other experiments. And uh, that's all, thanks. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have time for a couple questions. So please raise your hand if you do have one. Okay, so I don't see um, I don't see any question. Um, since we are we are kind of delayed, uh, so I think uh, let me just um, let's go, let's just start with the next talk. If you have some questions for uh, Feng Peng, you can ask him offline. So let's go to the third talk. Latest result: neutrino oscillation results from the Diaby experiment from Beta. Reskovic. Beta, please. Okay. Yeah, hi. Uh, okay. Um, I am I'm following on, on, on Fan Pan. I will also talk about the experiment, but I will cover the latest reactor neutrino oscillations. Um, uh, Okay, uh, so so as there will be a lot of introduction common to Fampang. So as Fampang already um, introduced, the experiment is located about 60 kilometers from Hong Kong at the coast of, of, of southern China. And it was primarily designed to measure theta-1,3 mixing and the, through the reactor anti-neutrino oscillations and uh, about the, the baseline of two kilometers. And it is very successful experiment because it's actually discovered this non-zero value of theta-1,3 just after a few months of, of, of running. Um, so uh, 
the Derby experiment uses six reactors um, as a source of, of, of these ant uh, reactor antineutrinos, and the reactors in general, not only Derby reactors, are the source of pure electron antineutrinos. It's very good, there are no contamination. And it's also very, very strong source because each of the detectors produce about six to 20 uh, antineutrinos uh, per second isotropically emitted, you know, uh, to all directions. Um, okay, these, these antineutrinos are, are detected in eight functional identical antineutrino detectors placed in 300 ground experimental holes. So while uh, fang Peng results were about uh, this, this uh, uh, near hole detectors, which are adjacent to the, to the reactors, uh, my result will, or the, report, the results I'm going to report will be mainly based on uh, the, the, the fire detectors. There, there are four, uh, four antenna detectors based about this ideal baseline of about two kilometers where we see the effect of, of the neutrino oscillations. In, in each experimental hall, these detectors are submerged in the water pool, which is instrumented for you know, muon detection, the, the, the chilling of light uh, caused by the muons for, for the background suppression. So uh, each of our detectors, as as Pamela already explained, is uh, consists of three 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 uh, nested volumes where you know uh, two inner volumes are filled with uh, with liquid scintillator. The most inner one even with a, is doped with a, with a, with gadolinium, and then it works as our main target. Uh, we detect our antineutrinos through this inverse beta decay reaction, which was already described, where the antineutron hits a proton and produce uh, the positron and neutron, where the positron uh, quickly loses its energy and uh, annihilates with, with, with the electron. And the energy of the, of the prompt signal can be directly linked to the energy of incoming uh, antineutrino. For the neutron, it takes some time uh, to get thermalized and eventually get captured on, on atom of gadolinium, producing is, this 8 MeV gamma cascade. And since, it's, it's, since it takes some time, it is a delayed signal. The neutron can also capture on hydrogen, emitting just 2.2 MeV gamma. Uh, and then uh, these prompt and delay signals are spatially and, uh, uh, spatially and time correlated, which uh, really helps us to, to suppress the background of any kind on beyond any, 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 you know, any belief. Or, I mean, it's very strong suppression. Uh, Diabe is actually low background experiment with only 2% of, of background to signal ratio for, for this neutron capture on gadolinium in, in, yeah, in, in all the detectors. So uh, since I'm the first to speak about the neutrino oscillations in this session, let me give you some brief introduction. Uh, so currently, it's well established that, 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 that flavor states, neutrino flavor states, when we've got, uh, currently we think that they are three flavor states, uh, they are a superposition of mass states, and, and this superposition can be parameterized uh, through this mixing matrix, which features three mixing angles and, and one delta CP uh, variation phase. And each of these sectors can be actually explored by uh, neutrinos from different sources at different energies. And, and, and we focus on, on this middle, middle, middle block, which features theta 1, 3, which was last to non mixing angle discovered by the airway, because it can be studied with the reactor neutrino oscillations at the baseline of, of two kilometers. And apart from that, neutrino oscillation frequency is, is driven by the mass square differences, the differences between the, the masses of, of these mass states here, yeah, they are called mass states. Okay, uh, so how do we actually measure these oscillation parameters? Uh, so what, what in, in, in reactor antineutrino experiments, we are looking at the, at the survival probability of electron antineutrinos, where at the reactor, I already told it's pure of, of electron antineutrinos, so it, it, uh, there is 100% of electron antineutrinos, okay? And then, however, if we uh, put our detector at some distance, and also it's a function of energy, we, we do not see 100%, we might see some deficit. Uh, and this deficit is because of some of the neutrinos can uh, oscillate to other flavors. And these oscillations can be expressed by the survival probability, which, which has got kind of two modes. One I would call medium baseline, which for reactor antineutrinos is demonstrated at the oscillation length of about 60 kilometers, which was for the, for first discovered by the Kemblant experiment. And we've got this also short baseline oscillation mode, uh, which you know features this theta one three mixing angle, and it, it and, and it was discovered by Darby experiment. So so let's just zoom in in this two kilometer distance where you know I, I plot the oscillation formula. The medium baseline term does not matter; it's about only about the short baseline term. 
And then we can see that, uh, you know, if we, the deficit observed at about two kilometers uh, is proportional to the amplitude of the oscillation, which is driven by sine square theta one three. And also if you measure the position of this minimum, which is, you know, determined by the oscillation frequency, which is driven by the mass square difference, we can also uh, determine this, this difference in, different between masses of the neutrinos. Uh, um, okay, it, it sounds like very easy, right? But th there is a reason why Tito 13 was the last to know mix angle because it's, it's very tiny. So we really need to optimize our experiment to, uh, you know, to be very sensitive. And, and what Darby did, uh, and not only Darby, but also other experiments measured Tito 13, we, 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 we employ these near and far detectors, where the near detectors kind of measure the flux of anti neutrinos and also the spectrum uh, directly almost, without almost any oscillation effects, because there is, for the, with the prediction of reactor anti neutrinos, there is large uncertainty related. So, so we, we can measure, measure it more precisely. And then we also have this fire detector, which sits at the ideal baseline. This is also optimized for the airbag, where you know, we sit at the oscillation maximum or minimum. Uh, I mean, it depends how you look at it. Uh, essentially, we see the maximal effect of the oscillations, and then we just compare the deficit of the seen in the fire detector compared to the near detector. And apart from that, Darby has got you know powerful source of reactor anti neutrinos. It's next to the one of the most uh, powerful comp reactor complexes in the world. We've got a lot of large detectors, and and also we are working on experiment. So as I already told, uh, Darby experiment already discovered the one three in 2012, but we are still keep improving our, our measurement. And apart from adding statistics, we also improve our systematics. And essentially my list is the same as, 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 as list, list of, of Feng Peng. Uh, we were able to, to actually half our absolute energy scale of some that they having uh, this special collaboration campaign and also employing the full ADC readout in one of our ADs. Uh, we were also able to reduce uh, our dominant background, which is from the, 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 the decays of the cosmogenic isotopes like lithium-9 uh, and helium-8. And on, on the reactor part, uh, we were able to, to actually significantly reduce the spent reactor nuclear fuel um, uncertainty or the neutrinos, because there are neutrinos coming from the spent nuclear fuel by utilizing you know, precise history of, of, of the, the, the spent nuclear fuel provided by the power plant. And with that, let's, let's get to the results. So, so our latest measurement with the sample where the neutron got captured on gadolinium, it is based on almost 2,000 days of data and, and it, 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 it contains almost 4 million of anti-neutrino interaction, which is the largest uh, reactor anti-neutrino data set in the world. So Darby is really powerful in this regard. And then what we, what we can see, so this is the measured spectrum in the, in the fire detector where, you know, the, the red, curve is the prediction based on the near detector measurement. However, we don't observe the red curve. We observe some deficit, which are the black points, the data, and then the best fit uh, is, is the blue curve. And the best fit is, is you know, very consistent with the neutrino hypothesis. So if we translate it into this the probability oscillation curve, we nicely measure this, 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 you know, this oscillation probability. So we can determine theta one three and, and, and the mass square difference. Uh, and that's what we did. So with our value of sine square theta one three, it, it has got work leaving precision of 3.4%. And, and the, the mass square difference, we, we report in effective mass square difference, how it can be easily translated to you know, delta n square three two, given some mass ordering. Uh, with the 2.8 percent, we actually has got comp we actually have got, has got we actually have got a comparable precision with accelerator experiments, which also measure this parameter. And we are about still statistics dominated, so we we will improve our result. And how I mean how it, it's shown on this slide. So actually, Darby will end data taking uh, at the end of this year in December this year, and then what we expect uh, with a uh, Final precision of sine square theta one three, it actually be below three percent, and 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 we reach almost two percent with with the mass square difference. So that's very very impressive. Apart from the study of of the data sample where neutron capture on gadolinium, we also look at where on the sample where neutron capture on hydrogen, um, and this is essentially independent analysis from from oscillation analysis from from NGD sample because you know the statistics are completely different. Uh, and it's mostly decoupled in systematics. However, this, this analysis with, with the, the neutron capture hydrogen data sample poses some challenges because there is much larger background, like especially in lower energies. 
uh, but also the, in general, the systematics are larger. So our you know, latest result is actually quite old with only 600 days of data. And we got consistent result in theta 1.3 from as a, in, in GD analysis. And, and the update is you know, under intense preparation. And I, see, I, I suggest to see the poster of, 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 of Jinjing later, later today. Um, OK, and so and Diabe also does not just study the three neutrino, the oscillation in three neutrino framework. We also go beyond and search for light surround neutrinos. I mean, the stereo neutrino would be like additional flavor state apart from those three knowns. And then it should it, it is linked to additional mass square, mass, mass state, and then, then additional mass square difference. And if such a state exists, and, and there is a link between the sterile and active sector, we would see additional oscillation modes on the top of the known one, uh, known ones in the general in our our in our experiment. So our latest uh, analysis, based on 1,200 days of data, did not see any significant signal for 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 the sterility in oscillations, and thus we were we were able to place the most range limit on this kind of new mixing angle. Uh, for the new mass square difference uh, below 0.2. So this is essentially in this parameter space, we include everything here. And then we further uh, extended our exclusion limits combining with Bourgeois experiment. So at this larger delta square value, we were also able to, to exclude this. Uh, okay, so we did not combine only with Bourgeois 3 experiment, we also combined with minus and minus plus experiments. And we did that in order to scrutinize um, some, some uh, like, allowed region for sterile neutrino oscillations uh, from the observation of electron neutrino excess in the muon neutrino beam and LSND and mini boon experiments. So why do we actually combine with Venus and Venus plus? Because the thing is following. In, in these experiments, LSND in mini boon, uh, the oscillation or the probability uh, can be, I mean, the excess of electron neutrino neutrinos which they, they observe can be, you know, interpreted could be interpreted as a sterile neutrino oscillation with this new mass square difference and this effective mixing angle. And this effective mixing angle actually consists of theta 1, 4 and theta 2, 4. And then here comes the combination, okay? So theta 1, 4 is constrained by diabetes in this disappearing channel of electron anti neutrinos, while theta 2, 4 is constrained by minus and minus plus in, 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 in this disappearance channel of new neutrinos or, and anti neutrinos. And then combining together, we can actually constrain this effective mixing angle, and then we did. And then what, what essentially what we got, we did not see also any signal of sterility in oscillation, and we were able to, to, to exclude uh, the allowed parameters, uh, oscillation, sterility in oscillation parameters for LSND and mini boon uh, on more than, uh, the, 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 for the time square for one smaller than 1.6 EV squared, everything from down here. Uh, on 99% confidence level, and we were also able to rule out the global fits just on appearance experiments, and also the global fit of all the oscillation experiments, and global fit of sterile neutrinos, again, on more than 99% confidence level. And if you want to know more, I suggest about this like sterile neutrino searches, uh, please see the poster of, of Georgian again later this afternoon, or I mean, maybe it's, it's still in the morning uh, for, for, for any other time. So this brings me into conclusions. Uh, so, yeah, the latest Diabetes reactor anti station measurement is based on, on where we use the new sample with neutron, where the neutron capture on gadolinium uh, with more than five years of data yielded uh, the most precise measure value of theta 1, 3 in the world and, and the mass square difference, delta m square EE, comparable uh, with a comparable precision to accelerator experiments. We also have independent analysis, uh, independent theta 1, 3 measurement using the neutron, uh, sample of neutron capture on hydrogen. And it's quite old and new results under preparation. We also search for light cell neutrinos and, and, you know, there has not found any. And, and so then the Diabay, J3 minus, minus plus themselves or even together place the very strong limits on, on sterile neutrino mixing. So, and just to conclude, I already mentioned the Diabay will end data taking in December this year. And then, then you know, the final result on theta 1, 3, the final value will be probably the standard for, for this, you know, for this mixing angle for, for the foreseeable future. Okay, so stay tuned. Thank you, Beda, for this nice talk. And I think we are running out of time for your question. So I encourage everyone who, are in, who have questions to go to the Metamost Neutrino Physics channel for any other uh, questions not being able to raise here. 
now we go to next talk, a recent result from Reno, uh, from uh, Xin Chang Dong. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm Chang Dong Shin from Chandan General University, Korea. Today, I will talk about the recent result from Luno. The Luno collaboration consists of nine institutions and 40 physicists. And this experiment site is Hanbin Nuclear Power Plant at Yangwang. We started data taking from August 2011. This page shows the Luno experimental setup. In Hanbin Nuclear Power Plant, there are six reactors. The total thermal power is about 16 kilowatt. We installed two identical detectors on the mountain. Near detector is located at around 300 meters from reactor array. And the part detector is 1.4 kilometer. The overburden is 120 meter water equivalent and 450 meter water equivalent and near and part detector respectively. And we are using identical detector Therefore, we can cancel out the systematic uncertainty related with the reactors. The Luno detector consists of four concentric cylindrical detectors from center to outer, target, gamma catcher, buffer, and beta region. Target is filled with 16 tons of gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator, and the gamma catcher is filled with a liquid scintillator. The buffer and the beta region are filled with non scintillation oil and pure water, respectively. And the 354 PMTs are mounted on the inner wall of the buffer. And 67 PMTs are mounted on the inner wall of beta. We use the inverse beta decay process to detect the neutrinos. Electron anti neutrino from reactor occurs the IVD reaction in the detector. And the IVD reaction requires a threshold energy of 1.8 MeV. After IVD reaction, it makes a pyrotron and a neutron. Then pyrotron makes signal through pair annihilation, and it's called a prompt signal. The energy range of this prompt signal is 1 to 8 MeV. After that, neutron are captured on gadolinium or hydrogen and this is called delayed signal. The NG decays has 8 MeV energy and a mean catcher time of 30 microsecond. This case is used for our main analysis. In the NH case, the energy is about 2.2 MeV and the mean catcher time is about 200 microsecond. This page summarizes the recent result from Luno. We published the paper about pure composition dependent reactor antineutrino held at Luno and the observation of reactor antineutrino disappearance using delayed neutron capture on hydrogen at Luno in 2019 and 2020, respectively. And we also reported about search for sub electron sterile neutrino at Luno. This is posted at archive in this year. In addition, we updated the analysis result using 2,900 days of data. This page shows the measured spectrum of IVD prompt signal. This result used the 2,900 days of data. Black dot is the observed IVD candidate. Blue line is expected IVD spectrum. The number of observed IVD event is about 1 million in year detector. The part detector has 100,000 events. The background fraction is 2.3% and 4.8% at near and part detector, respectively. And this result shows clear excess at 5 MeV. This plot shows observed and expected daily IV delay. A low line is expected delay with oscillation using best p value of oscillation parameters. The variation of IVD delay is effect from reactor on and off. The observed and expected delay are in good agreement. 
We also check the correlation of pi value of excess with the reactor thermal power. The x axis is the IV delay from the thermal power. And the, y, and the y axis is the pi MeV excess lake. And the bottom plot shows the fraction of pi MeV excess over the each point. This fraction is about 2.5% at both near and part detector. This plot indicates that pi MeV excess has a clear correlation with the reactor thermal power. This means that pi MeV excess comes from the reactors. We also measure the absolute reactor neutrino flux. The data for prediction was determined to be 0.940 using data of the near detector. Most other experiments also show that the measurement results are lower than the prediction. And this deficit indicates an overestimated flux or possible oscillation to sterile neutrinos. Here is a part two near prompt spectrum. Blue line is the expected spectrum with no oscillation. Yellow line is the oscillation case. Both spectrum based on observed spectrum in near detector. Black dot is the observed data at part detector. In the bottom panel, this, this shows the data to prediction curve. You can see the obvious oscillation spectrum. And we updated the sine scale to theta 1, 3 and the delta M E scale using 2,900 days of data. Black cross marker is the result of late early analysis. It is used to delta M E scale of PDG. And the black dot is the best peak value with the ray plus spectral analysis. The sine scale to theta 1, 3 is measured to be 0 0.089. The statistical and the systematic uncertainty is about 0 0.004. Delta ME scale is 2.74 10 to the minus 3 power electron volt scale. Statistical uncertainty is about 0 0.10 and the systematic uncertainty is about 0 0.06. As shown in this plot, there are global average value of oscillation parameters. The Lunos result about sine scale to theta 1, 3 is consistent with the global average. And there is NH result. This result is also consistent with other result. I'm going to talk about this NH result in a moment. However, the result of delta 3 to scale is slightly larger than global average in both normal and inverted hierarchy. It can also show the survival probability as a function of effective L over E. The blue line is a prediction curve obtained from real data with the best peak value of oscillation parameters. The black dot is the data of part detector. These data will describe the prediction curve. We are also analyzing using NH event. The motivation of NH analysis is independent measurement of theta 1, 3 value and the consistency and the systematic check on reactor neutrinos. This analysis is difficult to remove background due to long capture time and the low energy of delayed signal. However, it is able to use event of gamma capture, which is twice than target volume. Therefore, the statistics of NH event is enough for the analysis. We reduce background fraction via code optimization, and we obtained the result of late only analysis result. As shown in this page, there is a measured spectrum of a prompt signal using 1500 days of data. Even though we tried to reduce background fraction, the a lot of accidental background are remained in the final sample compared to NGD sample. As shown in this figure, NH result also showed a 5 MeV excess. This fraction is also about 2.5% at both near and far detector. And the sine scale to theta 1, 3 is obtained to be 0 0.086. Statistical uncertainty is 0 0.008. Systematic uncertainty is 0.014. This result is consistent with the NGD result. The sterile neutrino search result is as shown in this page. For this analysis, 
we used the 2,000 to 200 days of data with the NGB event. This analysis used the spectral say comparison between near and part detector. On the left side, this plot shows the observed prompt energy spectrum divided by expected spectrum with the best p value of three neutrinos. The gray band is represent to total uncertainty of three neutrino model. Other solid line is assumed the four neutrino model using three different parameter of delta m square. In the right side, this plot shows the comparison of exclusion limit from other experiment. The black solid line is the Lunos result with 95% confidence level. The right side region of a black solid line is ruled out. Since each experiment uses different confidence level, we cannot compare the result accurately. However, Lunos result rule our little more region at low delta M square level. This is a summary. We update the value of zeta 1, 3 and the delta M E square using 2,900 days of data. And the absolute reactor neutrino flux is obtained to be 94%. And we also measured zeta 1, 3 value using NH data. And we reported the first Luno sterile neutrino search result. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk. And uh, um, so question time, please raise your hand if you have a question. Hi Chen, I have a question, but I cannot raise my hand. Oh, just go ahead, you can speak, yeah. so. so. Okay, yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk and a lot of results from Reno recently. I have a question. Uh, first, on slide eight, you showed um, the, the number of antineutrinos over time. Uh, and and I, I, with this last 700 days of data, it seems that the power plant is running in half half power or something like, do, 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 can you comment on that? Do you know if they are like refurbishing some of the, 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 the reactors or, or how come, you know, they are running on, on the very low power? Please, please, please tell me again. Yeah, I mean, in this last 700 days, the, the average rate is about 200 IBDs, while the average rate before in this two, two, the, the, the first period of, of 2200 days, it's, let's say, 500, or I don't know what is the average. So it seems that in, in the last 700 days, the power plant is running all the course, I mean, in, in general, in half, half of the power. Do, do you know why? Is there something going on in, in the power plant, like some... Uh, 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 there are, uh, in Hanbin nuclear power plant, there are six reactors, uh, and sometimes uh, only one reactor is uh, going on, so. I see, okay, yeah, but I mean, okay. And then I have a second question, if I may. Uh, so on slide 17, you show the stereo neutrino limits, and then uh, you show that you are more sensitive in then Dia Bay for, for low delta and the mass square differences. Uh, but when you show just the three neutrino result, your precision on, on, on delta and square is like, I don't know, at least five, 50% worse than, than, than Dia Bay. I mean, can you comment on that? How you can achieve such a precision here, but do not see it in, in three neutrino analysis? I think they would be very linked. Like, that it's hard to believe that with video optimization and then shorter baseline, if that you can actually achieve larger, you know, more stringent constraints than diabetes for this region. Okay. Well, in order to understand about the, we should discuss with the diabetes collaboration. However, we are thinking lower delta M scale region is more sensitive in higher L over E value. So this is maybe correlated with the low energy data. And the method to calculate the chi scale is slightly different with the Taya Bay. So we should discuss about this. Okay, yeah, thank, thanks for the answers. Thank you. I think um, uh, our time is running out. So if you have more questions, please go to the Metamos channel. Uh, thank you again. And let's go to, um, let's go to the next talk. 
uh, latest results of the stereo search for a stereo neutrino at a research reactor from Loyal Lab. Yes, please. can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, uh, I'm sharing my slide. Do you see it? Uh, not yet. I, I didn't see your slides. Okay, okay. yes. Oh, hold on. It just disappeared again. Yes, I can see it. Please go go ahead. Okay, so I'm Loic and I'm very happy to present you the latest result of the stereo experiment today. So the stereo ex oh. uh, the stereo experiment was designed to probe the oscillation toward the light steroid neutrino, which is one of the main hypotheses to explain the six percent deficits in measured flux known as the reactor antineutrino anomaly. Another interesting measurement that can be done by stereo is the energy spectrum of a pure uranium-235 reactor to try to understand the spectral distortion that has been observed by several experiments, especially if it's due to an underestimation of some isotopes contribution. The detector is composed of a two-tone gadolinium dot liquid scintillator target, which is segmented, segmented in six cells and surrounded by a gadolinium free liquid scintillator gamma catcher. The wall, the wall detector is surmounted by a water Cherenkov muon veto, and we detect neutrinos through inverse beta decay which gives a prompt signal, namely the positron ionization and annihilation, and a delay trigger, which is the neutron capture on, on gadolinium, which gives a cascade of gammas for about um, 8 MeV. Our main background is due to fast neutrons, which can mimic IBD signal. Um, it's a surface level experiment located at Institut Langevin in France, near a compact research reactor core which is fueled with highly enriched uranium-5. At a distance of about um, 10 meters, it is placed just underneath the water channel of the reactor, which provides additional shielding uh, for about 15 meters water equivalent. Uh, we've been taking data now since November 2016, and you can see on the top plot, the, it's the cumulative days of reactor on data, as a function of the time. Phase one and two uh, amounts to 179 days of reactor on and 335 days of reactor off. The large number of reactor off days is uh, critical to characterize our, our background. You can see on, in the bottom plots in red is the correlated pairs for the on and off periods. And so it gives you an idea of our signal to background ratio. We plan to continue data, data acquisition until the end of this year. Uh, the detector is calibrated each week with a manganese source and monthly with uh, americium beryllium. And we use other gamma sources with energy that ranges between 0 0.5 and 4.4 MeV several times a year. You can see on the top plot um, the cosmogenic boron spectrum. And at the bottom of the plot is the data to Monte Carlo ratio, which shows a, a quite good agreement. On the bottom right plot, you can see the neutron capture on hydrogen, which we use to monitor the time stability of the detector. At the top is the relative deviation to the energy mean, and at the bottom of the plot is the energy resolution. And you can see that the mean energy is stable at the 0.3% level. Uh, and finally, at the bottom left plot, you can see the calibration coefficient normalized to the manganeses. And at the bottom of the plot is the data to Monte Carlo ratio, which shows agreements better than 1%. Uh, how do we extract the neutrino signal? Well, we use pool shape discrimination. So we can see on the top plot, the time profile of light emission 
for a, for an ionizing particle like a proton, you can see that the distribution will have a larger tail. So basically, we compute the the tail to the total charge ratio. And for so for an electronic recoil, we'll have a lower ratio than a proton recoil. Then we model our PSD distribution for the on data with three components. Uh, in red is the correlated background, which, which is shared with the off data, except that it is normalized with a parameter that accounts for the difference in the number of days between the on, on period and the off period. A second component in gray is the accidentals, and we account for the neutrinos with a, a Gaussian here in green. And both the on, on spectra and off spectra are fitted simultaneously. Uh, once we have the neutrino signal extracted, we can perform the oscillation analysis. So it's a spectrum shape only analysis. We, we don't use information from the absolute traits. So basically we, we compare our data to our model multiplied by a parameter, which is uh, different for each energy bin, but is common to all cells. That makes the analysis independent from the absolute traits and independent from the predictive spectrum. Uh, we take care of the uncertainties by adding Muisson's parameters in the chi-square. The list of these uncertainties you can find here in this bottom table. Uh, the result of this oscill oscillation analysis. So uh, I must mention that we obtained our delta chi-square distribution from Monte Carlo pseudo experiments because the standard chi-square law doesn't apply in our case. Uh, the contour you can see on the right is obtained from a two-dimensional delta chi-square map. So you can see in red is the uh, exclusion contour of our data and at 95% confidence level. And in blue is the expected sensitivity with the, this number of days, 179 days of reactor on. Uh, our data doesn't reject the no oscillation hypothesis, but we can exclude the error best fit point, which is the black star here, uh, at more than 99.9 .9 confidence level. Uh, the second result I wanted to present to you today is uh, the absolute trait measurement. So we obtained a, a ratio of observed to predicted rate of 0 0.948, which is in agreement with the current world average and um, consistent with the error deficit. Uh, you can find a lot more details on this analysis in the, the archive uh, listed here. And the final result I will show you today is the unfolding of the spectrum shape. So to unfold, basically we compare our data to the unfolded spectrum multiplied by the response matrix. Uh, you can see in, here in this plot the uncertainty budget as the function of the prompt energy. And you can see that our main uh, uncertainty is statistic. So we had a regularization term in, this, in the chi-square to smooth the unfolding of the statistical fluctuation. And we choose the strength of this regularization term to minimize the dependence to the prior spectrum, which has been chosen to be the U best spectrum for uranium-235. Uh, the result of the unfolding. So you can see here on the left is the, the result for the prompt energy and on the right is the unfolded, uh, unfolded results. So at the top of the plot is the spectrum compared with the Uber model and the summation model. Uh, in the middle, you can see the ratio to the Uber model. So you can see here uh, the spectral distortion. So a fit with a free Gaussian gives an amplitude of 10% uh, at 4.8 MeV. And you can see at the bottom of the plot, the local p-value, which gives the local a measure of the lo local discrepancy between our data and the Uber model. 
Um, so to summarize and to conclude, we have uh, excluded a large portion of the area parameter space. In particular, the area base fit point is excluded at more than 99.9 .9 confidence level. We have a measurement of the of a almost pure uranium-5 uh, reactor, which give a result uh, consistent of, with the area deficit. And we have the unfolding of the spectral shape, which gives indication of a 10% spectral distortion at 5 MeV with respect with, to the Uber model. We plan to continue uh, data acquisition until the end of this year. And we expect more than 300 days of reactor on, which is twice more statistics than presented uh, today. You can see here is the expected sensitivity with the 300 days of reactor on. Uh, and as uh, Chani mentioned uh, yesterday, there is an ongoing joint uh, spectrum analysis between prospect and stereo collaboration. So stay tuned for the results. And uh, so you can find a lot more details on the results I presented you today uh, on archive for the oscillation result and for the absolute rate measurement. And also since the last IHEP conference, we published a paper about the improvement of the gadolinium uh, cascade simulation that you, you can find the reference here. I thank you for your attention and I'm ready to hear your question if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you for the nice talk. And uh, I think, uh, so questions. So I, I, I do have one question. I think when we're waiting for others to raise their questions. Um, I My understanding is in, in the, the result you show for the uranium 235, the deficit it agree with the uh, what average, which is, which is about 5%, right? Um. You mean for the absolute rate? Uranium, right, so the, the rate. Um, I remember um, from An Feng Peng for the diabe uh, spectral measurement, he mentioned that uh, the uranium-235 uranium compared with the theoretical prediction, um, it's about like 80% deficit. So how can, say, how can I understand these two numbers? Can you comment on this? Um, I think this is related to the, the thing that um, uh... Yeah, maybe I can comment, sorry. I mean, now, now in Diabay, we see a deficit for the latest result, we see like 8% for the spectrum decomposition, we just see 8% deficit for uranium-235, not 80 just eight, eight. Yes, eight, sorry. Yeah, so, and then I think here they mentioned the, the red point, sorry, the green point, they have, the, the it's not the latest result, this is the latest published, and this is, this is 92 point, yeah, so, so I mean, yeah, so we observe something about 7.8 to 8%, I think the latest result is 8%, uh, yeah, and they, they, the stereo just observe like 5.2, so. So is there any tension between these two numbers? Uh, I think, well, uncertainty wise, it's not very far. I don't think there is really a tension here. Uh, but these two numbers, these two different, two different conclusion, right? If you say uh, you're in 235 has say 8% deficit, that means that the major deficit come from uranium-235 other than that other isotopes. So, well, well I guess, okay. Um, okay, I guess the error right now is a little bit high. Thank you. Um, other questions, I think I see. Um, Okay, 
I don't see any other questions. Yeah, so I, I, I just, sorry, I cannot again raise my hand. I just have a comment. I, I, I really think, I, I really like your results. I think, yeah, congratulations to this. And especially, I really like the, the, the spectrum measurement and this 10% excess. I think it's very impressive. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, just congratulations. I don't have a question. I, I just have a comment, so, so yeah. Okay, thank okay. you. We, I think the time is out. So thank you very much. And let's go to your next talk um, from Yu Feng Li, uh, Reactant Neutrino Anomalies and the Possible Solutions. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, I will share my screen. Okay, so you see my screen? So hello, Jun, can you hear me? Oh, I was, yes, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay, I, okay, thank you. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. So uh, we have heard several talks on reactor neutrinos uh, in, in particular for the reactor rate and the spectrum measurement. So here is my theoretical talk about the, the theaters of the, of the anomalies and also the possible studies on towards the solutions. So next slides, sorry. Okay, sorry. Okay, so not the moving. Next, your next, your next, next slide, slide is okay. Here it comes. It's okay. So, so f the fundamentals of the reactor neutrino have already been discussed uh, by other talks. So I will skip this. So I will go directly to my main body for the rates and the spectrum measurements and uh, what our study in these two aspects. And finally, it's my summary. So first, uh, we, as we all know, for the reactor neutrino flux prediction, we have two different methods. The first one is the so-called summation method or ab initial method. So for this one, we need to rely on nuclear database and uh, rely on the spectra for single beta decay. So you can see from the formalism, we first need the spectrum for one beta decay and then the branch ratios, the fission yields and all the other fission fractions. So finally, if we sum up all these contributions together, we will get the final spectrum. On the other hand, there is uh, another semi-empirical method, the, the so-called commission method. So for this one, we, we used a beta spectrum measured in 1980s as a benchmark and to use around 30 virtual branches to, to convert this beta spectrum to the neutrino spectrum. So the so-called Huber plus Mueller model for the uh, uranium 235, plutonium 239, and the 241, all the three isotopes are used uh, commission method. And the, the fourth one, the uranium 238, is using the uh, submission methods uh, developed by Mueller and his collaborators. And then this is one reminder for the measurements. We have first uh, the uh, consistently depth state for the re reactor rates measurement from the inverse beta decay reaction. And the, the depth state is around 6%, as you already know from previous talks. On the other hand, for the spectral measurement, uh, there is uh, not a uh, depth state, but the excess at around the 5 MeV range for both the uh, current oscillation experiment and even more, for example, Prospect, uh, Stera, and others. And uh, first, uh, we, we want to, to see the rate anomaly. And first, uh, let's see the rate data. And for these slides, you don't need to read all the numbers, but I want to show you in the next slides, slide six. For, for the left part, you can see we group the reactor rate experiment in two different groups. For the first one, it's research reactors like Sarah, as we just discussed. So it's, your, it's mainly the urine 235. For the, other, for, for the other group, it's the commercial reactors. So it's uh, our four different isotopes, and the, the contribution is their combination. So if we observe different uh, depth state of the, uh, for different uh, groups of the reactors. So it means uh, the contribution is from the uh, uh, miscalculation of the uh, prediction. Uh, if we think it's uh, all the different uh, uh, reactors have the same depth state, it may indicate that it's uh, a common reason, for example, the short beta oscillation. 
Another factor is to classify the experiment is the, the baseline. Uh, as you know, the, if it's due to the neutrino oscillation, it will have the baseline dependence rate depth data. But now it seems there are also no oh, this trend in the near range, for example, in the several, several tens of meters. So when we combine all the data together, we need to compare this to different hypotheses. For example, first is there is some problem in the 235 or there is uh, the reason because of oscillation. Because this is a non-necessary model, also we need to do the Monte Carlo simulation to do the statistical assessment. Uh, and uh, as we show in the right plot, you can see it seems uh, both hypotheses are consistent with the data. And uh, if we do the assessment, uh, we can see the oscillation is uh, slightly favored at around uh, 1.7 sigma. What's more is the new data from Diabe and Reno is not only measure the total rate, but also measure the rate as a function of the fractions you can see in the comparison between these two experiments. Uh, interestingly, the, for this uh, measurement, uh, there are two, there's one, uh, one new measurement. Uh, the first one is uh, the depth data compared to the uh, prediction showing the vertical or uh, shallow bands. So you can see the uh, the total rate is smaller than this, and also the slope of the of the of this curve is not also not consistent with the with the model. So you, by combining these two experiments together, you can see both experiments show the deficit is because of the uh, two thirty five, not because of two thirty nine. So uh, so so this measurement provides a new information for the rect rates uh, data and. Uh, it seems that this is not consistent with model prediction. The computing level is around three sigma. So by combining these two different uh, group of data together, the rate and the evolution, field evolution data, actually we tested all the possible hypothesis with one, um, one deficit of one particular isotope or with two or even three, and also uh, because of the oscillation and even Finally, the hybrid uh, uh, hypothesis for combining these two together. Uh, after the uh, analysis, we have the three, the, the following three conclusions. First is a common increase of the order beta convention. That means the, uh, two, uh, the 235, 239, and 241 are equal. It means uh, uh, it seems it's not a pro problem of the convention itself. If the, the problem is because of these two, three isotopes, it's because, uh, because of one single isotope, not uh, all of them. Another is uh, no matter w w what kind of uh, hypothesis is, it seems a uh, deficit of 235 is always uh, favored. So this is uh, also can be seen from single experiment uh, for example, there B and there. No matter what the size of the deficit, it seems this should have some problem. Another is uh, if we want to see the oscillation, it seems uh, uh, it's, it can, uh, there's no conclusion on this. It can, uh, including this and uh, excluding this, uh, it, they are all, all agree within one or two sigma. To test the oscillation, actually, we need more uh, different data. Uh, here, I want to show the beta decay data. Uh, uh, for example, the Cartesian data last year, one can see it can, uh, because of one can, because we know if there is one sterile neutrino, there will be a kink in the in the spectrum. And if with the data we can constrain the high mass square difference range, because for the high mass range it will have more rate, so the uncertainty is smaller. So it will have even better constraint on this range. So for the beta decay data can rule out a large part of the high mass square range, and the low mass square range is tested using the so-called vector spectral ratio data. Uh, it's what the low mass range. So finally, actually, if the react normally is because of oscillation, actually we already wrote a large part of the, most of the uh, primitive space so leaving only a small range. And in the future for three years, it will even, even better. 
the second topic for me is about the uh, spectral anomaly. So first, uh, I want to show the study on the submission method. So in submission method, uh, many different uh, groups already studied this and uh, identified different uh, problems. For example, there are some incomplement uh, and also the bias in the database. For example, in these two different databases have different results. And also for the some, some nuclear data measurement problem, the pandemonium effect shown here. And for single beta decay, there are also some problem. For example, the contribution of forbidden decay is, uh, is still unknown or have large uncertainty. Also, we need to know the accuracy of the different approximations, which I will show in the next slides. So here we want to test uh, the, the usual approximation in the beta decay spectrum formalism is valid or not. So in the, in, in the euro case, it can, for this analytical calculation, can reproduce the lifetime very well, but actually there's no test for the spectrum. So in this calculation, in this paper, we use uh, exact lifetime function calculation. It's a fully numerical calculation, and we we do the, calculate the final beta spectrum and the neutrino spectrum and uh, test it with the analytical one. So here we consider three different effects. The first uh, is what's uh, the famous Fermi function and the approximation is uh, how, how accurate for this. Another is a finite size correction. Uh, the finally the neutrino wave function approximation. So here is our result. We here I listed our assumption. We use the, the EDF B8 and also the struct data in SDF for the decay data and also for the single beta decay, we use the full numerical calculations. From this plot, you can see uh, we, compared to the analytical, analytical one, it seems there is access for the neutrino spectrum for all the three, all the four isotopes uh, as, a, as a similar size and uh, it's increased uh, as, a, as, a, as a neutrino energy increases. So the size of this is at around the six MeV, it's around uh, two percent. And also for the new for the electron electron spectrum, it have a deficit, and the size is around the six around four percent. So here I want to remind the, the spectral anomaly is compared to the convention um, method. So if we use the convention method for the same effect, uh, because we are tuning the beta spectrum, so all the uh, deficit and the excess will contribute to the bump. Finally, it's my, our, the third study is uh, uh, study the commission method, but we include the forbidden decay contribution using the shift factor. Here we use the full relativistic calculation for the shift factor shown in, in here in the, in the dash line. So uh, to, 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 to First study, we, we need some statistical information about the nuclear database. Uh, for the left plot, you can see for different energy uh, endpoint, the contribution for the allowed and the forbidden decay are different. Uh, interestingly, you can see at around the five or five MeV, actually, they are the allowed uh, decay and the forbidden decay are comparable. Uh, so. Another thing is uh, the effective charge for, for the, from the database. You can see for the forbidden decay trends to have a larger effective charge compared to the loud one shown in the, in the red line and the, compared to the blue line. So based on these two different uh, statistical information, we can do our uh, convention method because we first uh, pick uh, from the high energy range, we pick endpoint uh, and uh, do the statistical sampling. Um, based on the, our previous uh, histogram. So we determine uh, is uh, allowed to decay or forbidden decay. Then if it's uh, forbidden decay, we will use the uh, shift factor for different uh, uh, tradition type, for example, GT zero minus or two minus. So based on this calculation, we, we get the neutrino spectrum and the, the beta spectrum. This is the comparison with uh, uh, using uh, for, for the EU-235 beta spectrum. You can see if it, uh, it, it is zero minus, it seems uh, it's consistent with the allowed one within 1%, but uh, if it uh, is a two, two minus type, actually for the neutrino spectrum, it's showing a 
very wide uh, axis in the high energy range from 4 MeV to 6 MeV, and the size is around uh, uh, 4 or 5 percent. So it means it it's cannot uh, reproduce the bump uh, itself, but it seems it can contribute uh, somehow some of the excess in this range. So there are also other studies for forbidden decays in these two papers you can see in my backup slides. So finally, it's my summary. The reactor rate and spectral anomaly are based on the reactor models developed in 2011. So somebody uh, concerned about this uh, problem because there might be some new physics uh, in this uh, study, for example, the stellar neutrino. But uh, before this, I need to know the standard physics uh, interpretation. For the reactor rate anomaly, we use the global analysis of the other flux or the rate data. It seems uh, no matter what kind of assumption we use, uh, there is a deficit in the 235 flux and also, but we don't know other contributions, the, the size of other contributions is from other isotopes or from the oscillations. So for the oscillation, we need the model independent method, for example, using the beta decay data or using the reactor spectrum ratio data, I think also uh, studied in the previous uh, talks. For the spectrum anomaly, actually there are many nuclear physics issues are examined. So uh, as I was showing in my previous slides, there are some trends, shown there are some access, but uh, it cannot fully accommodate this uh, bump size. So it's still an open question. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yifeng. <laughs> Unfortunately, I, I don't think there's any time left for, for questions. So we encourage everyone to, anyone who have, who have question to go to the Metamost channel. Um, so we will have to go to the next talk, which is uh, first the result from the solid reactor neutrino experiment from David Hanaf. David, would you please share your screen? Yes. Yes, I'm sharing the screen. Okay, can you thank see you. It? Please. Yes, we can see it. Uh, can you just go ahead, please? Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, so I will give today a status of the solid experiments. Um, measurement of antineutrino coming from nuclear reactor have shown one anomaly on the flux and a distortion in energy. Uh, a global deficit of the measured flux compared to the prediction have been seen, as you can see on this figure. It could be explained by a new oscillation into sterile neutrino. This is called the reactor antineutrino, antineutrino anomaly. Also, the GALAX and the SAGE uh, solar neutrino experiments have shown in the calibration data the same discrepancy. The uh, distortion on the energy uh, antineutrino spectrum uh, have been seen by the theta-1-3 experiments. This is the so-called 5 MeV bump. And the Diabe collaboration pointed out that one candidate could be the uranium-235. The solid detector is based near the, reactor, the BR2 reactor at Essica Sen in Belgium. This is a research reactor with a highly enriched fuel in uranium-235. We have a compact core, and the detector is placed at six meters of the core. We have also a low gamma neutron background from this reactor, and we have, but we have low overburden. It implies an important cosmic induced background, and this was a key challenge that gathered solid design. The detector main feature is to combine the, PVT, the two kinds of scintillators, the PVT and the ZNS mineral scintillators. It allows us to have a linear energy response and highly segmented targets. But the price to pay is to understand a complex detector and a new technology. The target is made of more than 12,000 cubes arranged 50 frames. The solid cube is a combination of two scintillators, the PVT cubes for electromagnetic signal and two lithium-6 ZNS screens for neutron capture. The scintillation photons are captured by more than 3,000 wavelet shifted fibers and read out by MPPCs. We also, have passive, uh, we also have passive shielding made of water bricks and polyethylene to mitigate the fast neutron background. The signal that we are looking for is the inverse beta decay, which is the interaction of an antineutrino with a proton giving a positron plus a neutron. We first start by exploiting spatial and temporal coincidence between 
the prompt signal, which is the interaction of positron plus the two, the two annihilation gammas in the PVT, and a delayed signal, which the, in the, the capture of the neutron on lithium inside the ZNS. But beyond the spatial and temporal criteria, and thanks to the high segmentation of our target, we can exploit the detailed topology of the prompt signal, which is given by annihilation gammas. But the capital issue in, of solid detector is to control two backgrounds. First, we have the cosmic induced background, which is proton recall that mimic the prompt and delays that have the same features as IBD. It impacts all the IBD energy spectrum. The second background is, an un is the BIPO background. It's a, it is an unexpected and critical internal contamination of the DNS layer. It's nearly two order of magnitude above IBD before selections. Uh, the beta decay of BIPO is mimicking the prompt and the alpha decay of BIPO is mimicking the delayed signal. It's impacted uh, the IBD uh, spectrum up to 3 MeV. We have designed a specific variable called the BIPO initial using a pulse shape discrimination techniques uh, in ZNS antiator by comparing waveform of alpha and neutron interaction as you can see on this plot. In both cases, the space and time prompt delay distribution are close to IBDs. This makes the control of them even harder. We firstly, at the first attempt, design a basic selection using only prompt and delay space and time coincidence. The reconstruction of prompt topology is done by, uh, is given to find a list of cube positions and energies that minimize the likelihood to measure the given set of fiber signal above 200 keV. We use sequential CRUD and we uh, only use this, uh, those variables and looking at uh, a prompt energy between two and seven MeV. We have this kind of discrimination for those variables. We reach this level of performance. We need something else. For that purpose, we will use the topology of prompt to be competitive. And this is given by adding information coming from annihilation gammas. Those information are low energy deposits and back-to-back -back behavior. But there are challenges. Lower the, low, we have to lower the fiber and its ratio to, from 200 TV to 100 TV. It implies also to understand the detector response in deep details. We have, made, we have two approaches to reconstruct annihilation gamma. Firstly, we split the detector in two hemispheres, as you can see on this scheme. And secondly, we do a tracking by minimizing the likelihood of cube positions according to the cross section. Then we have access to new variables, the energy of gammas, the angle between those gammas, and so on. You have the, the, the new discrimination power of those variables, for example, the energy and the dot product here with the back-to-back -back, uh, annihilation gammas. We have improved the previous selection by selecting those annihilation gamma, and thus we improved the background rejection by roughly a factor two. But this is again not enough. To do better, we have to use MVA to better exploit topology. For that purpose, we needed to bring our understanding of the detector to the necessary level. And this is given by calibration data. We use four gamma sources for calibration, the cesium, the bismuth, the sodium, and the americium beryllium. We firstly have a look at the, light field, the cube light field homogeneity, and we found 3%, as you can see on the top. We also have probed the linearity response of the PVT scintillator, and we have measured the neutron detection efficiency find at 52% using two sources, americium, beryllium, and californium. We have done a precise Monte Carlo tuning. We have taken uh, advantage of the BIPO background to control first the reconstructed energy, especially for tuning the light leakage between two cube to cube, and the topology because the BIPO could be followed by radiative decay. The sodium-22 uh, source is used to tune the PVT energy in the simulation and control the energy below one MeV. You have example of the data MC agreement that we reach on the BIPO and in the sodium-22 uh, in, uh, in calibration runs at different uh, reconstruction level. We also have cross-checked that the new introduced uh, topological variables have a good data MC agreement using the BIPO background. And you have here the number of cube and the energy of the two for the two gammas and also the dot product of the between the two gamma.
then that we have reached a sufficient uh, confidence in our simulation, we can use a multivariate analysis. We have developed two independent approaches based on commonly used MVA tools. Firstly, a uniform boosted decision tree. This is a tool designed to optimize the discrimination while keeping uniform efficiencies. In our case, it's as a function of the prompt energy and the baseline. As you can see on those plots, we reach a flat, we, we have a flat response of our selection within 20%. We also have designed a TMVL neural network to cross-take the uniform decision, uh, boosted decision tree. Um, you have example on the top of the discrimination power to go from the zero gamma category to, two, to the two gamma category. The both, the, the both approaches are trained in category and the same variables as previous, uh, and we use the same variables as previous analysis. The gain of such approach is to have reduced the background again by a factor two. And you have a summary plot here, uh, which is the uh, background over signal as function of the excess and the uh, improvement by using topology and multivariate analysis in simulation. Now that we have optimized our selection, we can look at real data. We have two backgrounds with a different day-to-day -day evolution. The BIPO may change because of radon release and the fast neutrons are correlated with pressure variation. The first thing that we have done is to have a highly enriched BIPO selection. We do that by flip the BIPO initial cuts. Then we select, uh, we remove accidental, sorry, from those the two selection, IBG and BIPO, and then we can subtract the BIPO uh, contamination in the IBG selection. It remains only fast neutrons. Then the fast neutron rates could be modeled. We can model the fast neutron rate dependence as function of the pressure. This is done on this figure with a linear fit. We can, thus, we can thus subtract the fast neutron background in, uh, in the signal region, and we can see the excess, which are the neutrinos. We also have cross-checked that the excess extracted as function of the neural network cut is uh, in agreement with our prediction, as you can see on the bottom left figure. We also have evaluated uh, the neutrino excess and the S over B in real data and cross-check that this is consistent for all the selection that I have previously presented. You have the summary plot on this uh, on the top, which is again the, the background over signal as function of the excess. You can see that in blue, the prediction and in red, the extracted numbers from data and you can see that they are in well agreement for when we are not using topology, when we are using topology, and when we have topology plus MVA tools. We also have cross-checked that the neutrino excess is uh, in agreement with our prediction in energy and baseline. So after subtraction, we compare the excess with the simulation, and as you can see in energy and in position, we have a, a good agreement. And to go further, we need to improve the efficiency to see annihilation gamma because our selection is based on that. For that, we have upgraded the detector with a higher light yield. Taking advantage of the new generation of MPPCs, which have a better probability detection efficiency and lower crosstalk, we have demonstrated that we will have a gain of 40% in light yield. The, we already have this mounted the, the, the data at the beginning of July, and we are currently replacing all the MPPCs of the detector. We also have these. Uh, we also have improved the Biponisher, which was a simple ratio by developing a one-dimensional conventional network, and we expect to reduce the BIPO background by a factor two or three. So to conclude, Solid has to face a very challenging background condition. We have kismic induced background and an expected rate of internal BIPO background. We have focused uh, on exploiting the annihilation gamma topology thanks to the, our high uh, segmentation. We are also working hardly on, systematics, uh, on systematic studies and we, the grade is coming soon. So stay tuned and thanks for your attention. Thank you for the nice talk and the questions. Would you please raise your hand? Okay, I have one. Let me see, this time I should be able to find it. 
Oh, Sunny, right? Yes. Hi. Uh, yes. Please. So, uh, so you listed uh, the you know your backgrounds uh, here in the conclusion. So, so what, what is the main background among those? So which is dominant. So uh, after selection uh, on uh, with MVA tools and the topology. Uh, it's a 50-50 background. So we have 50% of people and 50% of fast neutron. A fast neutron, I see. Okay, so thank you. Thanks. Thank you. So the fast neutron, because your overburden is so low, right? Yes, it's between uh, six and eight meters. Okay, uh, okay, thank you. Equivalent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, we, let, let's let's go to the next talk because we we have uh, we are a little bit over late, uh, a little bit late. So let's go to the next. Thank you very much, and let's go to the next talk, which is atmospheric neutrino oscillation with super chemical Conde, uh, from uh, Volodymyr Tekhistov. Hello. Hello. Yes. Can you okay. share yeah. your slides? Thank you. Oh, let me try. Uh, can you see? Yes, I can see it. Okay. Uh, Please great. go ahead. So uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to give uh, this talk. Uh, I'm uh, William Tejista from UCLA, and this will be on atmospheric neutrino oscillations with Super K. And uh, by the way, this is a picture I took uh, inside the Super K during the upgrade, and uh, you see Super K looks uh, great. <laughs> so uh, let me start by briefly describing the state-of-the-art neutrino observatory. Super Kamiya super Kande. Now, uh, the experiment is uh, 22.5 kiloton fiducial volume, one kilometer uh, rock overburden, uh, inner and outer detector, and five run periods, uh, totaling about 20 years of data. And right now, something very exciting is happening is that uh, you have, uh, we have gadolinium loading. And we'll hear more about this later. But uh, it cannot be uh, overstressed uh, how amazing experiment it is. It is a, a very great multi-purpose physics laboratory. Uh, first, uh, you have a very uh, big energy range that you cover. And second, you cover a very large amount of topics. Solar neutrinos, atmospheric neutrinos, supernova, diffuse supernova, dark matter. And there's also various dark matter and direct uh, detection things that you can do here. Proton decay, baryon number violation, and uh, other neutrino astrophysics. And also you can do various exotic things such as look for cue balls, monopoles, and so on. So this is really great. And of course, the discovery of neutrino oscillations. Okay. Now, the detection technique is uh, Cherenkov ring imaging. And uh, on the left uh, side right here, you can see a schematic from Ed Kearns that the neutrino comes in and uh, interacts and you get a Cherenkov ring that you can then detect with PMTs. On the right-hand side, uh, you see basically what uh, the events uh, that Super K detects. Uh, you have uh, the uh, showering uh, showering events right here that are E-like, uh, e and they come from the uh, E plus minus and the gammas, and the non-showering-like uh, without an E and M shower from the uh, muons and pions. And uh, what is very nice is that these are actually real date events from 1998. So this is uh, very exciting. Okay. Now, uh, let me jump into atmospheric neutrinos. So cosmic rays interacting with the atmosphere uh, result in very many neutrinos. And here on the right, you can see a schematic. You have uh, isotropic flux of cosmic rays coming in hitting the atmosphere, producing uh, uh, mesons, and then uh, you will have uh, a bunch of neutrinos. And uh, what is great about this is that uh, this is basically an atmospheric collider, or more precisely, atmospheric fixed target experiment that is always on. So uh, you do not have to worry about the beam being on and off. And uh, the uh, propagation baseline uh, ranges from 10 to 10 to 4 kilometers, uh, depending uh, on uh, where the neutrino is coming from, so you can take advantage of that. And here on the bottom, you can see uh, various uh, calculations of the flux, the three leading ones, Honda, Fluke, and Bartol, 
of what do you expect. And so you see that the energy, typical energies, uh, energy ranges that you expect for atmospheric neutrinos of order uh, uh, from basically from MeV to uh, uh, TeV. Yeah. So uh, the atmospheric neutrinos uh, experience uh, Earth matter effects. And uh, as you can see right here on the previous page, uh, I didn't mention this in detail, but as neutrinos propagate through Earth, as you can see, they will encounter different layers within the Earth. And different layers can be char characterized uh, very simply by just different uh, densities. And so uh, this will affect the neutrino propagation. Uh, in particular, as you go uh, to, uh, as you pass uh, the mantle, the core, and so on. And so you will experience Earth's uh, matter effects, the Earth's MSW effects, which modify the effective Hamiltonian for neutrino propagation by the, uh, basically this term, uh, which depends uh, on the density. So as you go through different layers, you, you affect the propagation. And for antineutrinos, you change the sign. Now, just look and uh, as you go through the equations, you will see that as you change the normal inverted hierarchy, this will reverse the effect of neutrinos versus antineutrinos. And here is uh, this effect, how it is actually is uh, visible from the 2018 Super K uh, publication. And uh, the atmospheric neutrino oscillations are sensitive to uh, hierarchy, uh, theta to three and uh, delta CP. And so then you can do a fit and uh, look uh, what you get for these parameters. Okay, I would like to note. I would, I would like to also note that Super K uh, has detected new tau neutrinos from new mu oscillations, as pointed out in the 2012 uh, PRL, and more recently actually measured the cross section from the updated uh, 2018 analysis. So this is also very nice. And uh, actually, the atmospheric neutrino analysis is quite a in-depth fit. You have more than 15 data samples uh, for the full three flavor combined fit and more than 150 systematics. So this is a very in-depth uh, analysis. And here are the, uh, just a preliminary uh, view of the very recent fit. And uh, here is the, uh, what exactly is the update compared to the previous Super K results of the uh, full fit. So the uh, current uh, results uh, that will be shown, they correspond to full SK1 to 4 lifetime, corresponding to exposure 365 uh, basically kiloton years. And this is compared to 328 for 2018 SK published result. And this is this paper right here. Now, the main improvements in the analysis itself uh, come from neutron tagging efficiency, uh, from neutron tagging, of efficiency of about 25%. And uh, this uh, helps for a uh, new new bar separation. Uh, right. And uh, also there's a new boosted decision tree based selection for motoring events, which uh, increases signal efficiency and sample purity. Now here is a particular illustration of uh, how the hierarchy would be affected. Uh, it's uh, not uh, very obvious, but uh, this is how the various data bins would affect it. This is basically the up uh, and down asymmetry. This corresponds to different cosine and zenith angle. And so as the data moves around, uh, you can see that uh, the different bins will be affected for the normal inverted hierarchy and how it will look. Here are the uh, preliminary results of the combined fit. So uh, you can see that uh, SK data disfavors inverted hierarchy at uh, basically 70 to 90% confidence level. And this is to be compared to the SK 2018 published results, uh, which uh, disfavor at a uh, somewhat stronger level. Okay, so the uh, preference for normal hierarchy slightly uh, decreased. Uh, but uh, again, if you if you look specific at a specific data samples, it's uh, there's many bins that can affect these results. Additionally, SK data prefers first octant of uh, uh, theta to three, 
and the delta CP of 3 pi over 2. Okay. And these, uh, these three quantities are the three pillars of uh, what we want to determine from the atmospheric uh, fit. Okay. Here are the uh, combined results projected on a 2D plane. Uh, so here is the uh, SK2020 uh, updated analysis, which I'm describing. And here on the dashed, you can see the SK2018 analysis. So the counters have slightly moved around, uh, but the overall region uh, preference is, uh, uh, stays similar. Right. Now, I would like to point out that uh, Atmospheric neutrinos don't just do the uh, these three parameter fits, which I just described, to do the uh, the hierarchy, the octant of theta to three and the delta C p, but you can also do other exciting things with them, and actually provide great opportunities for BSM studies. Uh, in particular, I'd like to mention non-standard neutrino interactions. So. Uh, there are many experts in the audience, uh, but just briefly, uh, various BSM theories can have extended gauge symmetries beyond the standard model, SU3, SU2, uh, and uh, uh, U1. And you can also have an extended particle content. And uh, quite often, depending on the model, uh, you will have non-standard uh, neutrino interactions because of this. And so this will affect the uh, propagation in matter by these additional interactions. Forgetting about uh, the model specifics, you can take a phenomenological approach and parameterize all the possible additional interactions as basically four fermion operators with two neutrinos and two other fermions. And this will basically add a three by three non-standard uh, uh, interaction matrix to your Hamiltonian, which I was showing before. And these are these uh, NSI entries. Now, uh, uh, SuperK has different sensitivities to different entries, but you can fix the oscillation parameters to the SuperK best fit, which I just described previously without the NSI, and then see what comes out for the new parameters. And this is basically how the analysis is done. Here on top, uh, uh, on the uh, right up, you will see preliminary results. And uh, this is how uh, this compares to the uh, old uh, results as shown on the uh, 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 right uh, on the bottom. So the new results are for SK1 to 4. And again, these are preliminary results. And the old results are only for SK1 and 2 from the 2011 publication. So there's a very slight preference, but there's no significant evidence for uh, any such effect. Now, uh, and of course, you can try to do other modifications uh, of the interactions beyond the NSI. But uh, you can do a lot of things, uh, a lot of great things with atmospheric neutrinos. And I would like to briefly mention, uh, before I conclude, that the uh, future is very bright for SuperK with uh, SKGD, and we'll hear more about this in the upcoming talks. Uh, so I will just very briefly touch up on this that right now, uh, I'm sure you have heard, SuperK is uh, being loaded with uh, gadolinium. And the purpose is to transform a really great experiment into a very powerful ester particle detector. And uh, the main benefit is you will, uh, you will uh, improve uh, neutron tagging efficiency uh, from 20%, roughly 20% on hydrogen to 90% on gadolinium. Uh, and uh, please see the talk by uh, US on all of this in more detail. And once you improve this tagging efficiency, that means that the neutrino interaction, uh, like shown right here, uh, you will be able to look for the coincident signals and uh, clearly see. Now, um, the main purpose of this is, as we'll hear in the next talk, is uh, a first detection of diffuse supernova neutrino in the background. But I'd like to point out that even if this is not seen, this will still provide amazing information about astrophysics. So this is great either way. And additionally, uh, you will also suppress uh, atmospheric neutrino background for proton decay, because for usual proton decay signals, you usually do not expect uh, many neutrons. And SuperK already being uh, the best proton decay experiment, this will push this even farther. And of course, there is a lot of benefits uh, just for the standard atmospheric analysis, such as uh, neutrino to neutrino separation, 
which right now is done with basically 25% uh, efficiency tagging, but will, this will be improved and additional uh, other benefits. So there's a lot of exciting things uh, coming. So let me conclude that after nutrient oscillation discovery, it is important to pin down fundamental uh, oscillation uh, parameters. Supercase leading neutrino observatory and atmospheric neutrinos provide a fruitful arena for uh, exploring these further. Now, the uh, new SuperK results, and again, this is preliminary, uh, are that the data disfavors inverted hierarchy at 70 to 90% confidence level and prefers uh, theta to 3 uh, first octant and delta CP 3 pi over 2. Additionally, uh, using atmospheric neutrinos, SuperK can broadly search for any kind of modifications uh, of the uh, oscillations and directions beyond the standard, uh, the standard ones, such as NSI, which I mentioned, uh, and we see no significant evidence. And we expect uh, improved results with very new and exciting SKGD experiment, which we'll hear more about uh, later. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice talk and uh, congratulations on the new result. And we have time for, for questions. So uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand. And I see, OK, so there's one question on slide 13. Fix oscillation parameters to SK best, uh, fixed, uh, best fit with no non-standard interaction. Would you please explain this with SuperK best fit you use? Uh, yeah, so uh, previously I mentioned that uh, because uh, of the, uh, the, the matter effects and things like this, the atmospheric super K fit is basically sensitive to hierarchy, uh, theta to three, and also uh, the delta CP. So you fit together these quantities and you get some numbers. And this is what the, is the official super K result. Uh, now, uh, then you can add additional quantities like this, like the NSI, or you can do the Lorentz relation or whatever you want. Uh, and then you can ask, given the best fit parameters without these additional quantities, what can I say about them? So, and then you can perform the fit and uh, ask for that. Okay, thank you. Just this this question is from Emia. Sorry, I meant I forgot to mention the uh, the name. Okay, so I think uh, um, we are running out of time for this talk. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, let's go to um, next slide. The next presentation for the diffuse. So the diffuse supernova neutrino background in super chemical candy from Sonia L. Hendry. Hello. Uh, okay, let me start the video and the screen. Great, we okay. can see your slides, but not full, it's not full screen yet. Oh, I have put it, I just put it full screen. Uh, do you see it now? Not yet. Maybe there's a delay, but... Okay, that's strange. I'm definitely in full screen. Um, maybe because of the, the, the network, somehow I cannot... No, I cannot see it either. And I propose you do now yeah, full, okay, screen, you... Do full screen and then share. If you can unshare okay. the full screen and share, I think we would see the full screen then. Yes, but I'm not sure that I will be able to see the Zoom window once I have the full screen. Yeah, now I cannot share anymore. I have the full screen. Uh. Um, well, may, do, do, do you mind uh, turn off the video first to see? Uh, yes. It might be the in network. Yeah, let's see. So I share without the full screen. Now I go to full screen. Does it work? Uh, no. OK. So oh, yes. Miss... OK, hold on, hold on. Oh, yes. OK. OK. Somehow, it's... hold on one second. It was, but then it come back to the non full screen again. Yeah, it's because I removed it, but then I put it back. So maybe in a few seconds. Um, now he doesn't come back. Okay, so let me- oh, hold, hold on, hold on. Yes, it's come back. Oh, well, somehow it, 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 when, you, when you turned off, it- uh... Each time I turn it off, then it, uh, it goes back. So, okay, here it's right. back. It's um, oh, there are two options. Whether either you do it this way or you let me to um, show the full screen for the audience. I think this way it's okay, good too. 
it's not okay. just it's big enough. Hmm. Okay, let's let's do it this way. Sorry for the delay. Uh, okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I'm going to present the latest Super Cameo Candy preliminary results for the diffuse supernova neutrino background. Okay, so what is first this mysterious DSNB? Uh, core collapse supernova bursts emit a gigantic amount of neutrinos, about 10 to the 58 of them. However, experiments on Earth are only sensitive to uh, galactic supernova, which are very rare. So if we want to learn as much as possible about supernova mechanisms, we have to consider the accumulation of neutrinos from distant supernova, which we call the diffuse supernova neutrino background. And this DSNB contains unique information about um, neutrino emission spectra. So uh, you can see, for example, that it allows to infer the fraction of supernovas that end up forming black holes, like the purple arrow and the plot on the right. Uh, if all, the DSNB also allows to understand the history of star formation, which is the overall <clears throat> normalization of the different spectra you can see here. And it contains information about the universe expansion. However, this signal is quite elusive and it is relatively low energy. So now we're going to need an experiment that has a low energy threshold, decent resolution and is large scale. And uh, so we can use, for example, Super Cameo Candy. Super Cameo Candy is a 50 kiloton water Cherenkov detector, 22.5 kiloton fiducial volume located in the Kamioka mine in Japan. Uh, the water is constantly purified and we have more than 10,000 photomultipliers on the inner detector. This allows for an energy coverage that ranges from 4 MeV to TeV scale. And currently, um, as was mentioned, uh, SK is being doped with gadolinium. So this is a very exciting phase, but data is a bit fresh. So here what I'm going to present is uh, data from phase four, which is the longest data taking period of Super Cameo Candy. So what can phase four do for us, for the DSNB? Well, the most obvious way to see the DSNB Super Cameo Candy is to consider inverse beta decay, IBD, which is the interaction of an antineutrino with a proton giving one positron and a neutron. Uh, in principle, this IBD is very characteristic. And if you were able to characterize it fully, like in the plot on the right, you would see a very nice sweet spot for the DSNB between 10 and 20 MeV in Super Cameo Candy. However, life is not that simple. And what you are going to see is a prompt signal from the positrons that we typically investigate between 12 and 80 MeV, and that is easy to find, and a very weak delayed signal for the neutrons that before Super Cameo Candy 4 was not even picked up at all. So in practice, the backgrounds you have to deal with are overwhelming and can mainly from cosmic muon spallation here at low energy and from atmospheric neutrinos at high energy. Uh, so for an efficient search, we need to characterize spallation and atmospheric backgrounds and absolutely identify the neutrons. For this reason, the DSNB analysis will rest on three main pillars. First, dedicated analysis for spallation cuts. Second, uh, dedicated analysis to characterize and reduce atmospheric backgrounds. And third, neutron tagging that is, has been possible only since SK4, so it's quite new. Let's start with spallation. Spallation backgrounds uh, come from radioactivity induced by uh, cosmic muons passing through the detector. Uh, they take place pretty much every two minutes, which means that they have to be considerably reduced if we want to see the 5 to 20 events per year of the DSNB. Fortunately, uh, for later, most of the signatures do not involve neutrons. In less than 1% of the cases, we also have a more problematic signature that has a neutron, mainly coming from lithium-9. So the way we get rid of spallation is by considering uh, correlations between potential DSNB candidates, low energy events, and uh, preceding muons. However, these correlations occur over very large time scales, and uh, we cannot model them during using simulations right now. So spallation reduction strategy will operate with two steps. First, preselection pre steps where we identified clustered uh, candidate DSNB events and neutrons from muon showers. And second step where we investigate correlations between muon and DSNB candidate events. The way we investigate correlation is that we pair each DSNB candidate event with muons up to 30 seconds before. So for one event, we have 50 pairs to consider, about 50 pairs. And for each of these pairs, we investigate correlations using a likelihood analysis based on the following four variables. 
So we consider time difference between the two events, uh, distance to muon track, and also the muon shower, the, the profile of the shower induced by the muons. Who says likelihood analysis also says distributions. So we extract spallation distributions directly from data by comparing our data pairs to random pairs where the muon and the DSMD candidate are definitely uncorrelated. You can see the extraction process here for the distribution of the transverse distance to the muon track on the right of my slide. This procedure allows to remove a bit more than 90% of the background, which is not enough. The good news is that it's much more efficient for the problematic lithium-9 signature. And then we're having about 40 to 90% signal efficiency, depending on the reconstructed energy. So we'll go back to how to improve spallation further, but first let's consider atmospheric neutrino backgrounds. Atmospheric neutrino backgrounds can come from either neutral current interactions that produce one or more gammas and charged current interactions producing a bunch of charged particles. Uh, these gammas and charged particles give rise to <clears throat> specific light patterns in SK that allow us to categorize backgrounds. And since life is difficult, sometimes, more rarely, we are having neutron emission too. So we are now having four categories of atmospheric backgrounds, two reducible and two irreducible. And for the reducible backgrounds, we have a series of high signal efficiency cuts based on the Cherenkov light pattern. And these cuts allow us to get the spectrum, atmospheric spectrum on the right, which brings us to another problem, which is that uh, atmospheric neutrino simulations are associated with large systematics at low energy. So here we can mitigate the systematic somewhat using uh, side bounds, for example. But what is going to really save the day for the DSMD analysis is that the decay electron spectrum, the Michel spectrum, can be measured directly from data, so very well characterized. So now I have presented dedicated spallation cuts, dedicated atmospheric analysis, and if I stopped there, this would not be very qualitatively different from analysis in SK123. However, SK4 allows for something new, which is neutron identification. So neutrons are being seen because they are captured on water after some time, some long time. And in SK4, you can see it because we have added to this SHE trigger uh, for the positron and a large AFT trigger window where we can look for neutron capture signals. However, these signals are tiny, so looking for them is amounts to looking for a needle in a haystack. But looking for a needle in a haystack is possible if you have a good enough magnet. And here our metaphorical magnet is that neutron capture occurs near the positron vertex. Uh, this fact allows us to do a time of flight subtraction, which will concentrate all the photomultiplier heats associated with neutron capture in a 10 nanosecond window. So after a basic preselection cut for this 10 nanosecond window, we can identify uh, neutron candidates. And these neutron candidates can then be individually analyzed using a boosted decision tree. And here you can see the performance of this boosted decision tree. This allows for uh, excellent uh, background projection power, but you pay, some, you pay some price in signal efficiency, I was mentioned in the previous talk. And uh, what you are going to see in the next talk by Luis is that uh, you are going to have considerable performance enhancement for this neutron identification after gadolinium doping. So now we are having neutron tagging, dedicated spallation cuts, atmospheric cuts. So we can perform two types of analysis. The first one is a supernova model independent analysis, that is uh, an exclusion bound optimized for different energy bits. Here we perform at low energy and we try to, re uh, to reduce systematics and atmospherics, which in practice will mean that we'll have larger energy bits. The second type of analysis is a spectral shape analysis, so completely model dependent, that uh, takes place at higher energy because we need to get rid of spallation backgrounds entirely. And here we rely heavily on the fact that uh, the dominant background will come from decay electrons that are well characterized. So let's consider the supernova model independent analysis. And on the left, you can see exclusion bounds for three large energy bits. Uh, you can see, sorry, the backgrounds and the, and the data for three large energy bits. On the right, you can see the associated limits on the DSMB flux and examples of predictions from a few models. 
So here, uh, neutron tagging allows us to go to lower energies than before, 12 MeV now, instead of 16. And if you look at the last column of the table, high energy limits, and compare the observation to the under model, which is an optimistic DSMD model, you can see that we're getting quite close. So this is very encouraging for super K gadolinium. However, one thing that we have to keep in mind is that if we want to go to low energy and make the most of SKGD, we need to understand the uh, neutral current atmospheric backgrounds that are associated with large systematic uncertainties. So now let's move on to the spectral analysis. So here I'm going to present it for one model, which, which is this ANDO uh, very optimistic model. Uh, we perform spectral feeds over different Cherenkov angle regions and with, uh, uh, with neutron tagging and without neutron tagging. So here are very preliminary results. On the right, you can see uh, corresponding likelihoods for the analysis um, without neutron tagging, which is the dashed line, with neutron tagging, that is the dashed dot, and uh, grayed out in the background, I have added the results from the previous phases of SK. And now the solid black curve corresponds to the combination of all of this. And if you look at the combined result, which is the last line here, we see that the limit uh, on this endoflux, 2.7 centimeter, um, 2.7 per, per second per centimeter squared is close to the prediction, which is 1.7 per second per centimeter squared. So we are getting close here too. So let me conclude now. This was the first analysis of the diffuse supernova neutrino background with a full SK4 data set and with neutron tagging capabilities. You can see that the most optimistic models are getting very close. So SK, there are very encouraging prospects for SKGD. However, one lesson to remember is that we will really have to deal with atmospheric backgrounds and in particular with neutral current backgrounds at low energy. And this could be done, for example, by uh, separate intermediate detectors in hypercamiocande. So stay tuned for the near future, but also for the far future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, a time for a quick question. If not, I think I will urge you to go to the MetaMost for your questions, and then we, we are going to the next talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It's a very nice talk. So next talk is uh, status of the SKGD project. Florian Luis Margo. Can you, sorry, from Luis Martin Margo, Margo. Can you please? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, can you see also my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Maybe it's coming because I, I am in principle projecting this. Yes, yes, I can see it. I think you okay. can start. If you All want right. to share your video, that would be great too. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't know how to do that right now. Okay, in that case, then <laughs> ah, we can okay, start. Right okay, okay. Um, so thank you. So yeah, I will present the status of the Super Kamiokande Gathering Project. And uh, I was kind of scooped because uh, you already know that uh, we are already loading. That's a very good uh, news, I think, because uh, that's something we expected uh, quite some time ago, the people that have been working in this project. I think I had the best... Uh, introduction and motivation from Sonia. Also, Volodymyr introduced uh, the Super Kamiokande detector. So I, I will just briefly go on this. Uh, you have seen how tough it is to um, look for supernova relic neutrinos. And uh, what can be good if we have uh, an efficient neutron tagging? So once again, um, with uh, gadolinium, what we expect is that the neutron capture will happen much uh, faster than in just pure water, plus that the gadolinium uh, produces a gamma cascade of 8 MeV uh, to compare to the low energy of the single 2.2 MeV uh, gamma uh, produced on the neutron capture. So uh, how much gadolinium we want to have in super K? Well, uh, in the first loading, we plan to just load 0.02% of gadolinium sulfate. This will give us about 50% of the 
of all the gadolin uh, of all the neutron captures uh, on gadolinium, being the other fifty percent is still in water, which we uh, can still try to find, as uh, Sonia has shown. Our final target is uh, 0.2 percent, but that will have to wait for now. Uh, how does gadolinium sulfate look like? Is this uh, white powder here that, in fact, once is uh, diluted in water, is basically uh, transparent to Cherenkov light. So before uh, injecting this stuff into SK, we wanted to make sure that it's safe to do so. So we uh, started a, a R&D project called EGATS, evaluating gadolinium's action on detector systems already some quite time long ago, um, some quite uh, long ago in 2009. We checked actually many things to make sure that this would be safe. So EGATS was built using the same materials as in SuperK. This is a picture of that hole. It's a 200 ton tank, uh, which actually now is running as a standalone uh, galactic supernova detector. This plot here is very busy, um, but basically summarizes uh, a good deal from what we have seen in, in EGATS. So you have here uh, the concentration in the EGATS tank here on the right hand side the scale. So you see here how we start loading it and then we reach the final goal uh, of 0.2% and uh, it stays constant. So the water system is not eating up the gadolinium, it's not uh, disappearing. And on the upper side, we have the uh, water transparency. Then the blue band is the typical SK uh, value. So you see that if we run on uh, stable conditions, we reach SK values while we do not lose any gadolinium. Also very important, we checked even by eye whether we had uh, any harmful effect on the detector and we find none. Um, uh, these results and many more are actually published this year in 2020. So you can have a look um, if you want later. It's very interesting. There are many interesting um, things there. So anyway, before um, injecting this uh, gadolinium sulfate into SK, we had to refurbish uh, SK, the SK tank. So we emptied it and uh, refurbished it. We cleaned the walls. We uh, cleaned also the uh, detector structures. Since it was already open, uh, we uh, replaced it uh, inner detector and outer detector, PMTs, many other things were also upgraded or changed. Uh, we also had excavated uh, a new uh, hole to install the new water systems and water purification systems. We also modified the in-tank piping to have uh, an increased flow of water inside the tank and increase the power, cleaning power of our water system. We also fixed the leak we had in the uh, SK tank, so we do not leak any gadolinium into the environment. We observe no leak, has to be less than 20 per day, uh, liters per day. Um, so here in this picture, you can see the very uh, radio pure gadolinium sulfate that we uh, are already injecting. Uh, and this picture is showing the new cavern I mentioned before in the new equipment uh, to dilute and inject uh, clean also these um, gadolinium sulfate. So finally, we were ready to start uh, loading and injecting. That happened on July 14th, 10.29. This is the moment when we change the run from SK phase five to phase six. Happy people behind the masks. Um, we hear another picture when we started the looting and uh, injecting gadolinium. Here people uh, introducing the gadolinium into the um, uh, water system for the first time. So how do we do this? So we take <clears throat> water from the top, we dilute it, uh, dilute the gallium sulfate, I mean, uh, to 0.02% in mass, and then we supply it from the bottom. Uh, the supply flow is about 60 tons per hour. It means that in uh, roughly 35 days, we uh, complete this task. So where are we now? We are around here, 30th of July. Here's the amount of injected gadolinium already. We are 
almost halfway uh, towards our uh, first goal of 0.02%. Uh, um, so the question is whether we can already see this gadolinium um, in the SK tank. The answer is yes. We have been sampling directly from the uh, SK detector. In this case, I show you the inner detector. Uh, here I show you the Z, this, um, the Z variable, which is Z equals zero is the center of the tank. Negative values is the lower half of the detector. Positive values is the upper half. So um, you can see that the concentration quickly goes up uh, and um, going from basically pure water where the concentration is uh, zero to a high concentration happens in uh, say two meters. Um, and also you can see the front how is uh, going upwards in the detector too, in um, roughly 1.5 meters a day. Uh, you can also see that even in the loaded region, um, the, the concentration is not yet homogeneous, so we will not be able to compare later on with Monte Carlo. Nevertheless, in this lower half of the detector, we have already gadolinium, and we will look for neutrons, and that's what we did. Uh, we introduced uh, an emission beryllium source uh, surrounded by a BGO crystal so that the 4.4 uh, MeV gamma uh, would make the VGO crystal to scintillate. That is our uh, prompt event. And then we look for the uh, delayed event, the neutron um, being captured on gadolinium and producing this 8 MeV gamma cascade. So can we see this? Uh, we deployed this uh, source in three different positions. Z minus 12 meters, that's in the lower part of the detector. Z equals zero at the very center and then plus uh, 12 meters. Uh, by the way, this was done when the front was far away from the center still. So here you see the, um, the spectrum of these uh, neutron capture candidates. And you can see that only at Z minus 12, there is a clear signal for gadolinium, while uh, for the um, other positions, you still see the 2.2 MeV. This is an efficiency uh, effect um, from this 2.2 MeV gamma. So we can also see the capture time um, distribution at Z minus 12. This time constant is about 130 microseconds. This is roughly what we expect at these kind of concentrations, although again, the concentration is not yet uh, that homogeneous to really compare to Monte Carlo yet. Um, now we have other uh, sources of neutrons. Espalation neutrons is another one. We have in super K, a uh, cosmic ray immune rate of about two Hertz. So we expect espalation, about 10,000 espalation neutrons per day. Uh, so we can look for neutron candidates near the paramion in the lower half of the detector. Here I am comparing uh, runs before injecting gadolinium and runs after injecting gadolinium. Again, you see very clear in the uh, energy spectrum, the 2.2 uh, MeV gammas, and then very clear the um, captures on gadolinium. Again, the capture time, very clear, similar results as with the previous analysis, 136 or so uh, microseconds. Very nice in this analysis is that we can look at neutron multiplicity, uh, comparing pre-GD and uh, now GD runs. We can see that we do not only see more neutrons, but also very high, we are able to see very high neutron multiplicities. I think this is really nice to, to see because it allows many, many improvements in many, um, in many studies. So you can see here in this study, uh, these neutron capture candidates, how we can see them more and more in upper regions of the detector approaching the, um, the center part of the detector. As the time goes by and we have more and more gadolinium in SK. 
finally stopping muons, stopping muons uh, captured on uh, oxygen. Uh, finally, they may eject one neutron, again, being captured on gadolinium. Uh, if we look at the lowest part of the inner detector, we can very quickly see how this is happening in very early days of the injection, not yet in the upper regions, but sure enough, um, at some point, we see them too in higher and higher regions of the detector, and we expect to uh, continue to do so in the next days. So with this, uh, sorry, just the um, loading schedule, we are right now here almost in August, still the looting and uh, injecting gadolinium. We will finish by middle of August, then it will come a commissioning phase, and uh, afterwards some calibrations just in time uh, for uh, possible T2K physics runs at the beginning of 2021. Uh, let me summarize very quickly. Uh, neutron tagging is very useful as Sonia and other speakers before has, uh, Volodymyr too, uh, has been uh, shown. Uh, it's safe as we have shown also in EGATS. Um, the tank has been refurbished. We have been starting injecting gadolinium from July 14th. We will finish around uh, middle of August. We have seen gadolinium already in the detector, not only directly uh, from samplings, uh, directly from the inner of the detector, but also looking at neutron captures uh, from different uh, neutron sources. So yeah, exciting physics days ahead uh, with neutron tagging at Super KGD. Stay tuned. That's all, thank you. Thank you very much. No questions? Okay, we have audience raise a hand. Let me see. Is it Marco? Marcos? Oh, who is raising the hand? Somehow doesn't she? Okay, Sunny, okay. Sunny? Yeah, yes. I think you can. Uh, yes, down. okay. So, congratulations. Uh, it's really nice to see this neutron capture on gadolinium. And my question is, uh, you, you show this, you know, the neutron capture on gadolinium and hydrogen, the spectrum. If you can go back that slide. Um, you mean yes, I'm here, really yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I see the, you know, so gadolinium capture case is supposed to be around 8 MeV and hydrogen capture should be 2.2 MeV, but it doesn't but, seem to match. It's because <laughs> calibration... Yeah, only apparently. It's very, very easy to, to understand. Uh, the, the, uh, as you say, the uh, gamma casket is 8 MeV integrated, but then this has to be converted into... Uh, an electron, right, uh, going into the, uh, into the, uh, running into the uh, escape tank um, and quantum scattering. So that's basically 4.5 MeV. That converts into 4.5 MeV. Ah, okay. And for 2.2 MeV case, it becomes around 3 MeV? Yeah, no, the thing here is that uh, we have, we are not 100% efficient on 2.2 MeV. So this would actually go up this is an efficiency uh, artifact, so to say. Ah, if OK. We, uh, That's we inefficiency. That. Yeah. Because you. That then I think with. Because your energy uh, threshold is not really close to, to MEV. Right. This is, this is actually uh, a specific uh, DAQ that it's trying to push. Actually, it pushes the. Um, the uh, efficiency is as low as we can in, 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 in Super K, but it's not yet, I mean, it's not as efficient uh, as we would like in 2.2, uh, for 2.2 MeV gammas. Okay. Anyway, congratulations. Yeah, that, and... where we want gadolinium, right? So we yes. have a clear signal at high energies that we can, where we have much higher efficiencies to, to detect. Okay. And you are, your ultimate goal is to have a 0.2% loading, right? Yeah. I'm afraid so when, you will ask me when. <laughs> when it will be? 
Um, I think this depends on many factors. They are not under, definitely not my control. And I, I cannot really answer to this question, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. I, I think we're running out of time. I, there is one question in the question and answer. So I would uh, uh, suggest uh, uh, Luis to go ahead and take a look. So we're gonna go to next uh, talk. Um, so, the, so we come to the last talk of this session, the sensitivity study for astrophysical neutrinos at Hyperchemi Candy from Dr. Kan Takatomi Yano. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think you can see my slide. Yes, I can see your slide. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Takato Miyano from University of Tokyo for hypercomic band collaboration. So I will talk about the sensitivity study for astrophysics neutrinos at hypercomic band. So at first, the Hyperkamiokande project is next generation, a uh, large water chain of detector. And the uh, Hyper-K will be constructed at Gif Prefecture at, uh, in Japan. Yeah, uh, the detector size will be about eight times larger than Super Kamiokande. And uh, the fiducial volume size will be nine times larger than that. And uh, we have improved photo sensors so the photo detection efficiency is about twice of that was used for Super Kamiokande. So yeah, let me say we will have uh, twice of photo electrons comparing to SK at the same energy. And the uh, Japanese budget is approved at 2020. And uh, yeah, we plan to start our observation at 2027. And so, yeah, basically the detector structure and the detection method of neutrinos is quite similar. I mean, actually identical with Super Kamiokande. So, yeah, we will use Cherenkov Light. And uh, yeah, I'm showing some uh, event display that's coming from simulation. So, for 100 muons and 10 mV electrons. And uh, yeah, the property of neutrinos could be measured with charge lepton, yeah, charge lepton generated by uh, reactions in ultra pure water. And the energy position direction and uh, uh, particular ID can be done. And uh, the point is real time and event by event analysis is possible with our detector. And uh, yeah, for astrophysics neutrinos, uh, here I will mention about the solar neutrinos, and the supernova neutrinos, and the supernova relic neutrinos. And uh, yeah, the, for the purpose of solar neutrinos, yeah, is, uh, what to say, confirm the burning process or modeling of the sun, and uh, yeah, check the property of neutrinos, I mean, neutrino oscillation. And for supernova neutrinos, yeah, we can. Uh, examine the supernova explosion mechanism, and uh, we can work as the supernova monitor, or yeah, it may be possible to uh, examine the nucleosynthesis scenarios. And uh, yeah, for supernova relic neutrino, yeah, also for supernova explosion mechanism, or and the star formation rate, and the extraordinary supernovae, like a black hole formation. So, and of course, we have another uh, astrophysical neutrinos. For example, dark matter annihilation or following up measurement with gamma ray burst or gravity wave measurement. But, uh, yeah, I will mention about low energy part in this slide. And uh, for solar neutrinos, yeah, there was uh, several good uh, slides in this session. Yeah, basically, science burning with nuclear fusion reaction, uh, sorry, fusion reaction, uh, I mean, PP chain or CNO cycle. And uh, yeah, the neutrino CCC. Uh, only neutrino can bring out the information of today's status of solar core. And with hypercomiokande, uh, yeah, the target energy threshold is, let me say, uh, above 4.5 mb uh, in our visible energy. So yeah, but still, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, with this energy threshold, our main target will be boron-8 neutrino. 
and we expect 130 neutrino event per day. Yeah. And uh, with this large statistics, we can perform uh, solar neutrino uh, studies. So, yeah, solar neutrino is uh, important in particle physics and also for astrophysics. And the uh, first thing will be the uh, first thing in particle physics will be the precise measurement of delta time square. So that's daylight asymmetry and also supernova neutrino spectrum uptown. So that's related to uh, non standard non standard interaction. So that was mentioned previously. And uh, also that's the astrophysics uh, topics. So discovery of uh, HEP neutrino or variation of supernova neutrino flux. Uh, yeah, will be important. So yeah, uh, right up a figure I'm showing the super key result of the ERE neutrino variation and the uh, uh, yeah, sunspot numbers. Yeah, we can uh, perform this kind of analysis with more statistics. And uh, yeah, non-zero day-night asymmetry uh, of solar neutrino caused uh, by terrestrial matter effect. Uh, is indicated by uh, super K. And uh, the day-night asymmetry leaves smaller delta M square value in solar neutrino analysis comparing to the reactor neutrino analysis. So for the yeah, day-night, so with hypercomial kind of statistics, we can uh, separate uh, the solar best delta M square value uh, and the uh, camera and I mean reactor best value above four sigma with 10 years uh, measurement and assuming 0 0.3 systematic errors. So, and, uh, CP, uh, and we can also perform CPT violation test or difference, uh, check the difference between, uh, let's say, uh, neutrino and anti-neutrino. Yeah, we, we can perform CPT violation, violation test uh, by looking at the difference between neutrino, uh, neutrino oscillation and anti-neutrino oscillation. And uh, precise uh, delta M square tube measurement also contributed to uh, CP violation, uh, CPV test, violation test in hyper-K long baselines. And uh, in bottom figure, I'm showing the uh, super-K result at tw uh, 20, 19 and uh, yeah, but uh, it will change after over 20 years measurement. So we can separate after 20 years, we can separate them uh, by five, five sigma. But uh, as you yeah, already know, so recently, Super Camio Kande updated their oscillation results and the tension between SK plus snow and the camera and the best. Uh, so, tension was reduced to 1.4 sigma uh, from 2 sigma. So, yeah, for new super-k delta time square value, the hyper-k sensitivity of separation study is ongoing. And uh, yeah, left bottom figure is showing the, uh, what to say, our uh, observation period and also sensitivity uh, to the delta time square separation between solar best and uh, uh, so reactor best. And uh, the other solar neutrino topics is, one is the uh, HEP process neutrino. So yeah, this is undiscovered solar neutrino uh, because of its small branching ratio. So yeah, we hope hyper-K uh, large statistics will work on that. And uh, yeah. And we can, uh, we hope to test the solar models. The sensitivity will be 1.8 to 3 sigma after 10 years. So, yeah. And uh, also, there is another topic, energy spectrum uptown. So, that's the verification of the neutral oscillation. Uh, yeah, that's, that's also correlated with uh, the delta M square measurement. So, or to search the new physics beyond the standard model, so non-standard interaction or sterile neutrinos. So, 
Yeah, we can separate uh, the scenario with uptown or without uptown uh, with, uh, let me say, three sigma after 10 years measurement. Okay. And so, yeah, next topic is supernova neutrino. So, yeah. Or perhaps supernova neutrino emits all kind of neutrinos and 11 neutrino events uh, was, uh, were observed by Kamio Kande from the supernova 1987. So, yeah, we expect 15 to 80,000 events uh, in Hyper-K from supernovae at 10 kiloparsec. And uh, yeah, our physics motivation is uh, Examine the explosion mechanism of, of such a supernovae or a proton neutron star formation or a black hole formation. And of course, we can perform a kind of neutrino physics like mass hierarchy. And uh, yeah, we can perform, I mean, we can contribute to large mass messenger measurement with gravitational wave, gamma ray, X ray, yeah, that kind of measurements. And uh, yeah, let me uh, talk a bit more detail. So yeah, for supernova neutrino observation, we can provide precise uh, supernova neutrino time profile and energy spectrum measurement. And uh, based on this uh, result, we, uh, one of our member performed the supernova this model discrimination study. So, yeah, model discrimination between five supernova models uh, recently studied and presented at the Neutral 2020. So, I took a table from uh, his poster. And with 300 events, so that's corresponded to uh, six to 100 kiloparsec, uh, we can identify these models uh, above 97%. So, yeah, we believe that's quite. Uh, what to say, variable input for cell lists, and we can cut down, or we can, uh, what to say, we can spot some area of theoretical uh, available uh, cell. Hmm? Sorry, anyway, uh, we can provide uh, important information for cell lists. And also, uh, with uh, the large volume, we think we can prove dim supernovae or black hole, black hole formation at nearby galaxy by uh, using neutral observation. So I mean, by, so if black hole uh, formation is happened, we will see uh, large neutrino flux at first, but it will be suddenly dropped uh, after the black hole formation. Yeah. And so that's for supernova. And uh, I would like to make a uh, last comment about supernova relic neutrino with hypercoming one day. So, yeah, it's also uh, already mentioned. So, yeah, relic neutrino, supernova relic neutrino is diffused the neutrino uh, coming from all past supernovae and not discovered but promising the extra galactic neutrino source. And, uh, uh, yeah. Our motivation uh, is to test the star formation rate uh, by detecting the supernova relic neutrino. Uh, yeah, there is factor two discrepancy between rates uh, of, uh, how to say, the rates of formation and the number of supernova, new, uh, supernova neutrino, uh, supernovae. Yeah, so we can contribute to uh, resolve, resolve it that discrepancy. And uh, yeah, yeah. So we can deconvolute the energy spectrum of supernova burst neutrinos. So, so that corresponded to temperature uh, inside the supernova neutrinos. And uh, also, as I said, we can see the contribution of extraordinary supernovae. So black hole, hole formation of supernova in supernova relic neutrinos. So in left upper figure, I'm showing the one example, two examples of uh, relic neutrino model. 
with different uh, neutrino temperature. So if we have I mean, there are about two minutes left. Okay. Sorry. Let, uh, Anyway, if we have black hole formation, as uh, so energy uh, will be a bit higher. And uh, yeah, we can observe uh, so superparallelic neutrino events in 70 plus minus 12 events by, uh, in 10 years. And uh, so it will be about four sigma for relic neutrino signal sensitivity. Okay, so finally, this is the summary. And sorry, I don't have enough time to, what to say for this summary. So. Please just read it. Thank you very much. Um, I think we, we, we already occupied the coffee break time. Just one quick question, if there's any. Uh, if not, I think I would uh, uh, encourage you to do the MetaMost channel to, to, to uh, exchange ideas and ask questions for, and, uh, for discussions. And I would like to thank all the speakers for their nice talk. And, uh, and this will then um, conclude this session. So thank you very much. Thank you all for the, thank you. Oh, the next session will be in, I think six minutes. Hi, can you hear me okay? I'm the next chair. Yes, I can hear you. I'm about to leave, <laughs> leave as a chair, so. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I, I occupied the coffee break. Yeah, it's a coffee break. Do, do any of the speakers uh, for the next session want to test their presentations or has everyone, uh, everyone done that already? No, if it's possible, it would be nice. I do. Okay, hi, hi, is that, uh, is that Constantin? Yeah, yeah, it's me. Okay, so uh, are you able to, do I need to do anything? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I can try. Okay. So I can, hmm. no, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Can you see my screen? I can see your video, Constantin, but not your screen. Strange. Oh, yeah, one moment. Like this. Now you see. Yeah, that's good. Mm. Do you want to try going to full screen? Yeah. Perfect. Okay, you see everything, yeah? And you yep. hear me well. Yep, sounds, sounds perfect. Okay. Let me just ship. Okay, everything is visible. Okay, thank you. I'm ready now. Great, thank you. Okay. Does anyone else? Does anyone else want to uh, test their presentation? Uh, hi, David. I would also like to uh, to test it. If Go possible. ahead. Looks good. I can see the slide in full screen. Okay, very good. Thanks. Okay, great. Perfect.
Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to the second part of today's Neutrino Parallel session. So um, this time we, we still are covering a variety of, of topics, uh, starting with Ice Cube and Dune, and then we're going to hear a lot more about uh, neutrino mass determinations directly and also through uh, some very recent and interesting neutrino list old beta decay results. Uh, so we have uh, more than 50 people uh, currently in the session. So uh, I suggest we go ahead and start. And the first speaker uh, talking about constraining dark matter neutrino interactions with uh, ice cube data uh, is uh, John Cook Kim. Can you start your sh screen share? Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I... Okay, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you and see your screen, so go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction. Hello, I'm Jungkook Kim. Today, I'm going to talk about new dark matter neutrino scattering bound. So by using the ice cube uh, recent event, I obtained the new constraint on the dark matter neutrino scatterings. So in this work, I collaborate with Professor Kyung Choi and Professor Carson Lo. Uh, so this is contents of, of my talk. First, I will talk about what is the ice cube 70092A event. And I will talk about the how to get a new constraint on dark matter neutrino scatterings. And I'll briefly review the what is known constraint on constraints. And as an example, I will consider the complex color dark matter models and find some scattering, uh, search for the scattering behavior and conclude my talk. First, almost three years ago, Ice, Ice Cube collaboration detected 300 TB neutrino event. And thanks to the Ice Cube neutrino alert system, the other experiments such as uh, Perimlot, Magic, and uh, Sweep, and so on, they detect the gamma ray, gamma ray uh, signals. So that, and uh, the gamma ray signal from the direction of neutrino propagations. So this event is identified with, uh, to the in the flare, flaring blazer, which called the this. And thanks to the, uh, the neutrino gamma ray, uh, both neutrino and gamma ray observations, the, we can uh, find some distance from the source to the earth. The distance is 1.4 gigaparsecs. And take, taking into account equatorial coordinate system, we can describe the uh, the source in, uh, into the two angles. One is light as ascension and is 77 degree and declination is 5.7 degree. And from this information, which physical quantity can be, uh, we, can we calculate it? So we, that is our question. So we, we consider the, the mean prepares for the neutrino. And the, mean pre the definition of mean prepass is given by this. The so mean prepass is inversely proportional to the, the number density and scattering cross sections. So, sure. okay. so if there exists the neutrino and uh, interaction between neutrino and dark matter, the mean prepass uh, can be awesome. We can evaluate the beam prepass of neutrinos. So we will uh, consider this one. And thanks to the, uh, sorry, the interactions of neutrinos with the dark matter can suppress the, the original flux of uh, neutrino coming along uh, from the blazers. And this is our, so this pi, Pi is not, not is the unknown factor, so we will focus on the this exponential suppression factors. And the given uh, 
neutrino energy, then scattering cross-section becomes constant. So only important information is the is dark matter number density along the path. And taking into account the 90% suppression of original flux, then the integration of cross-section times number dense, dark matter number density is less than 2.3. That is our uh, constraint. Uh, so to change the uh, to change the code uh, to uh, get the number density along uh, following the neutrino propagation, we have to change the coordinate from equatorial coordinate to the galactic coordinate. So. Uh, from the galactic coordinate, uh, the angle, uh, it is also described the two angles, L and B. So L is 15.4 degrees, so around, uh, along the, this direction, and B is mi minus 19.6 degrees, so this direction. So neutrino propagation, uh, neutrino, uh, neutrino does not travel through the galactic center. This means the, we have the, we can choose any uh, document of, of profile. Uh, this, this because the, the, uh, the document of profile have the, some, there is the division be, uh, along uh, inside the galactic center, but the neutrino propagation is, or uh, uh, all, all document of profile is, uh, is same or uh, behavior is same, so we can choose any documentary profiles. And the suppression factor can be divided into the two contributions. The first one is comes from the cosmological dark matter. This is the out of outside of the galaxy, so we don't know the information about the outside of the galaxy. So we take the average dark matter density, which determined by the Planck 2018 data is the energy density is given by this. And we, uh, we obtain 10 to 22 GB per centimeter squares. And the other, the other one is comes from the, the galactic dark matter. So as I uh, said before, the we have the any document profile. Uh, uh, we can choose any document profile since there is no document profile dependence. And, but I take NFW document profile and calculate the the uh, integration of the uh, total number of uh, document density, and we get we got the 10 to 12 2 GB per centimeter square. Accidentally, both contributions from cosmological dark matter and Milky dark matter are very comparable. This, this is because very small cosmological dark matter is compensated by the long distance from the source. And so identific identification of the source can allow the precise evaluation of neutrino flux change due to dark matter neutrino scattering cross sections. So this is our main main result. So cross section uh, over the dark matter mass is uh, is less than five times ten to minus twenty three centimeter square over GB at when neutrino energy around three hundred TB, TB. This is our main result. And let's uh, and now let's review the known constraints. First constraint comes from the originally from the Lyman alpha uh, Lyman plus. So if dark matter stay in thermal equilibrium, then uh, for a longer time, a longer time due to some elastic scattering process, then this phenomenon suppress, might suppress metal perturbation and reduce the amount of small scale structure today. So to avoid these problems, we, uh, we the electric scat uh, elast elastic scattering should, should less than these values. 
there is the two two scattering uh, bound. One is the constant cross sections. The other one is the temperature dependent cross section. But here, this constraint only uh, can be applied for the utility energy at around 100 electron volt. So we put put it here 100 electron volt, and T zero is the current uh, temperature of the universe. So this factor is 10 to 6. Then this uh, constant cross section and T dependent cross section is is the same same order at temperature uh, when temp uh, universe temperature around 100 electron volt. So this constant is the same at 100 electron volt. Then another one is the uh, the other constraint comes from the supernova explosions. Supernova is the first most multimate messenger observation. So when you uh, super comet conducted new, uh, ener uh, neutrino coming from the supernova with the 10 MeV, and we can uh, obtain the distance. So thanks to the, the fixed direction and, uh, and energy, we, we can neutrino dark matter intention can also constrain. So this is the current uh, is known observation values here. So in the neutrino energy and scattering elastic scattering cross section regions, there is a three upper bound, three upper bounds. So if we consider simple power law scatter uh, power law cross sections like like this given by this, then if in the case of n equal zero case, the Riemann alpha provides a stringent constraint, but if we, in other case, for example, n equal two or four case, the ice cube, the new constraint obtained by our study, this cross section, this boundary can provide a strong bound. That is uh, some our point here. Then now let's embed our bounds into the, the complex color document models and the relevant interaction. Uh, Interaction Lagrangian is given by this. Chi is the dark matter, scalar dark matter, and N is the mediator, and nu L is active neutrino. So here, as input, I I took the dark matter mass equal to one kb, and depending on the mediate mass, the behavior is is changed changed like this. So. Uh, so, so let me conclude my talk. So identifying source of astrophysical neutrinos give us the additional information. So to using, uh, uh, by using the, this uh, I think, uh, information, we found some new constraint on dark matter neutrino scattering is given by this. When the at neutrino energy equal 290 TB. So some certain class of new physics mo document models can be proved by the, uh, or some constraint by this new uh, values. So thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Do we have uh, any questions for the speaker? Maybe I can ask a quick question if that's okay. Can, what, one, one, piece oh, yeah. of your, one piece of your argument I didn't fully understand is, is, is how do you know that the flux is suppressed by at most 90%? Ah, uh, this, actually the, the, this original flux is pi not, is unknown, but, but we obtain, uh, we observe the dark uh, neutrinos from ice cube. So this is pi uh, is the neutrino flux, expected neutrino flux from ice cube. And there is the ex exponential suppression factors. So exponential, so 90% uh, suppression, which means the exponential minus 2.3. Yeah. 
But how how do you know how do you know the initial flux? How do you know that phi zero is not much larger than we think, and so the, uh, so the suppression could also be much larger to give this. Uh, yes, um, that is some um, might be some oh, okay, but we we do not uh, know uh, we don't know much about the blade blaring blazers, so we just assume the Pi not uh pi not uh might be the some uh, we is almost same with the pi zero or some there is some some suppression so mm -hmm. I just uh consider the 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 some the, focus on this one so like like a, some two sigma constraints. Okay. Um, okay. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I think we better move on to the next speaker in the interest of time. So, uh, Seb, are you ready to share your screen? Yep, I will go ahead. Um, okay, so Seb Jones is going to talk about uh, uh, the June um, uh, physics program. Go ahead, Seb. Okay, so yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to give an overview today of the June Experimental Physics Programme. So, um, DUNE is the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. Um, it consists of a broadband neutrino beam, which is sent from Fermilab in Illinois to the Stanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota which is baseline of 1300 kilometers. I've included a kind of helpful diagram here at the bottom. So the beam is produced at Fermilab uh, where it's initially measured in a multi-component near detector, which includes a liquid argon component. It then propagates through the earth um, before being measured again uh, with some of the neutrinos having oscillated um, in a liquid argon far detector which will have an eventual 68 kiloton mass. Um, the far detector is located 1500 meters underground at SURF uh, to reduce cosmogenic backgrounds. It consists of four individual modules, each with a total mass of 17 kilotons. Uh, that's equates to a fiducial mass of 10 kilotons per module. Uh, the diagram on the right shows the position of two of these modules in red inside the caverns. Um, the first of these modules will be a single phase liquid argon TPC. And for the further modules, the collaboration is currently developing both single phase and dual phase um, LA TPC options. Um, so the beam, as I mentioned, it's uh, mainly muon neutrinos. So the plot on the left shows the uh, flux at the near detector um, when running in neutrino enhanced mode, or mainly muon antineutrinos when running in uh, antineutrino enhanced mode. And then this beam is measured in the multi component near detector. I've got a diagram here of that. Uh, it sits 574 meters downstream of the beam, like neutrino beam production target. It consists of both a liquid and gaseous argon component and a beam monitor. And the primary purpose of this near detector is that to allow the characterization of the neutrino beam, as well as constraining uh, cross-section uncertainties. So what does the June physics program consist of? Today, I'm mainly going to be talking about the long baseline neutrino oscillation physics. Uh, June wants to make a measurement of uh, this CP violating phase of the PNS matrix, delta CP, and potentially this could lead to evidence for discovery of CP violation by neutrinos. Dune is also expected to determine the neutrino mass hierarchy. And furthermore, it can also measure, uh, it'll also have sensitivities to other elements of the PNS matrix, notably uh, the mixing angles theta 2, 3 and theta 1, 3. Dune is also expected to be sensitive to neutrinos from core collapse supernovae. Um, and there are also a whole host of BSM processes uh, that Dune will be able to search for, including uh, nucleon decay and neutron to anti-neutron oscillation. So 
there are some talks here at ICHEP that I have provided the, uh, the names of. So start off talking about our long baseline sensitivities. Our far detector samples are shown here. Um, and for our far detector samples, a full simulation re reconstruction was used, including um, a convolu convolutional neural network for identifying the neutrino flavor, um, of which there is a paper out now, which details this. Uh, the upper two plots show the disappearance measurement. So that's the um, part, uh, particles identified as muon neutrinos or anti-neutrinos. Um, and the lower two plots show the appearance measurement. So the expected event rates for um, electron neutrinos and anti-neutrinos. In the lower two plots, uh, the varying lines are just the diff change, in, change in expected event rates for different values of delta CP. The sensitivities uh, I show in this talk were determined using a four component fit of the far detector data, along with a constraint from the near detector. Um, a full suite of systematics was used and, and this has now been published. It, it's available on the archive, a paper detailing this analysis in further detail. Um, for our Asimov fits, the new fit 4.0 best fit points were used as the oscillation parameters. One quite big advance with this analysis was our like uh, thorough, very thorough implementation of the systematics. Um, our flux systematics were determined by varying both models of hadron production in the beamline, as well as and other certain design parameters of the beamline, such as the magnetic horn currents uh, and other parameters such as that. For on the neutrino interaction side of things, um, both reweighting parameters built into our neutrino interaction generator, Genie, were used as well as custom weightings developed for this analysis, which were sometimes drawn from work that has previously been done in other long baseline oscillation experiments. Finally, for our detector systematics, um, uncertainties on the detector, the energy scale for various part particle types were developed. And what this very busy plot on the right just shows is this is a, the post-fit constraints on all the various systematics that we used in this analysis. And you can see that some things that we expect to be well constrained by the near detector, in it, which are the green bars, such as our flux parameters. Uh, you can see that as we expect, uh, they're well constrained. And then there are other parameters, such as our far detector, um, detector systematics, which are not well constrained by our near detector. So these two plots show the CP violation sensitivity um, as a function of the true value of delta CP, uh, left for true normal ordering and the right for true inverted ordering. Um, the bands here are represent one sigma variations in statistics, uh, systematic and oscillation parameter throws. The lines are just the median of these throws. And what you can see here is that after 10 years, so the orange band of staged running, there is a significant CP violation discovery potential across true values of delta CP and for both hierarchies. You can see that these lines move beyond this uh, sigma equals five dotted line. So here we look at the CPs of E sensitivity, sensitivity over time. Um, the lighter blue line um, shows that after 10 years of running, uh, discovery potential is reached for 50% of true delta CP values. Uh, the difference between these two lines, the dotted line and the solid line here is just with and without an external theta one three constraint applied. And after 15 years uh, of running, the evidence of CPV uh, for 70, the evidence threshold for CP violation is reached for 75% of delta CP values. That's this lower blue line here. This is um, our delta CP resolution as a function of delta. And looking at the orange band, you can see that after 10, 10 years of staged running, the delta CP resolution varies between 10 and 20 degrees, depending on the true value of delta CP. And then moving to our longer exposures of 15 years, you can see that at the most favorable point, so the CP conserving values, um, the resolution drops down to around a seven seven degree kind of mark. 
here we can see that Dune is very, very sensitive to the neutrino mass hierarchy. Um, this shows the sensitivity uh, to the mass hierarchy. So what these blue lines are showing you are is that uh, Dune will obtain a definitive answer for the mass hierarchy within seven years, regardless of the values of the other oscillation parameters. And here you can just see how quickly that Dune will reach that result. Uh, the lower blue line here, lower blue band, I should say, um, shows that after two years for all values of delta CP, um, the mass ordering is measured to five sigma. I also mentioned that Dune will make precision measurements of theta 2.3 and theta 1.3. Uh, in both of these plots, the current constraints, the current 90% confidence limits on the oscillation parameters are shown in yellow. And the left-hand plot shows that um, after seven years, Dune will have already made a great improvement on these limits um, on the value of theta 2.3. And over on the right-hand plot, you can see um, after 15 staged years of running, Dune's theta 1.3 measurement will be comparable with reactor experiments. That's this, you can see that this green line here shrinks to around the size of the yellow uh, area. Dune will also be sensitive to supernova neutrino bursts. Um, so th these are primarily through galactic core collapse supernovae, and in particular, the electron neutrino flux. Um, so uh, via the production of an electron in the detector. Not only can this provide information about the physics of supernova core collapse, but it could also give some hints about the oscillation physics. This upper plot shows the time profile of events within the detector um, from a supernova, core collapse supernova. And you can see that in this neutralization section, um, there is a significant difference in the time profile between uh, where the neutrino mass hierarchy is normal or inverted. Uh, so that's the red and the green lines, or the green and the red lines. And finally, uh, Dune will also have sensitivity to uh, beyond the stand a wide range of beyond the standard model physics programs. Um, its large fire detector mass allows searches for proton decay, and in particular, the decay channel uh, of a proton to a K plus and an antineutrino. On the right, I just have a simulated event display of an event, of just such an event. And this was actually um, selected by the automated classification for this particular study. Additionally, Dune's very long baseline means that um, non-standard matter effects may be visible in the far detector uh, due to the very long baseline. And these are just two of many, many BSM searches that be able to be able to be searched for in Dune. So in summary, Dune will enable an exciting physics program, including the measurement of possible CP violation in the lepton sector, uh, determination of the mass hierarchy, precision measurements of other uh, oscillation parameters, as well as supernova neutrinos and many BSM searches. The far detector TDR volume two contains many more details on the physics possibilities and there are a series of publications either available or planned which are made up of parts of this volume of the TDR. And finally, I would like to say, encourage you all to go out and listen to some of the 22 other June talks at iCHEP this year. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Seb. Um, there is a question from, from Thomas. Um, Thomas, do you want to, do you want to uh, ask your question? Uh, yeah, I can ask the question. So, uh, thanks, Seb, for the talk. Uh, just one question. Could you be more specific on what is meant by your custom weighting of Gini interaction models based on what was done for longer baseline experiments? Like, I think you don't have any data you tune to, but what, what is actually you do with tuning the Gini interaction? So, for Gini, there are a number of, built into Gini, there are a number of um, tunes that cover discrepancies due to tuning on different data. So they were used. And then there were also, I think, weights developed for the NOVA experiment um, based on some of the cross-section yeah. physics that they observed that were integrated into this analysis. 
Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Seb. Uh, any other quick questions for Seb? Okay. I don't see any. So I think that's a good segue to the next talk, um, which is by Mateus Canero. Now I understand this is going to be a recording. Yes, I'll show, share the screen and start the, the movie. Can you see the, the start of the movie? Yeah, we can see, we can see that. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Matheus Cajonero. I'm here to talk about neutron interaction physics and the do near detector. Thank you very much to the organization for the opportunity. Uh, so let's jump right into it. I think the main point that I want to convey here is that knowledge of neutrino nucleus scattering cross-sections is crucial to the global neutrino physics program. Why? Well, although maybe we understand what happens when a neutrino interacts with a single stationary particle, like in this example here, that you have a neutrino interacting with a proton producing a charge of ion and <clears throat> a lepton and a neutron, we actually don't really have full, full understanding of what happened with these particles inside the nucleus. There are final state interactions and other different nuclear effects that can make this one charge of ion created showed up as a pi zero. It may be just undergo elastic scattering and change the momentum information. It can be absorbed and be seen in our detector. So we need to always keep in mind that this, this particle that was created didn't really walk it all the way free into your detector. What you really have is this somewhat black box where you have a neutrino interaction. You may see the lepton here, but you have these particles coming out and you actually need to identify them and then try to understand what happened. And we also need to remember that most detectors are made with heavy nuclei. So it's really important for us to understand this. To try to be more quantitative, uh, if you think about how these detectors actually extract oscillation parameters, there is a direction uh, interaction of interaction models and uh, neutrino energy reconstruction. Once that happens, you actually have these nuclear models affecting your event rate, which is the main thing that is used for oscillation. Right? Just putting here a quote from the NOVA collaboration, after a constraint from the ND is applied, so after the constraints that having a near and far detector are applied, Cross-section uncertainty is currently compromised 30 to 50% of the systematic budget. So it is a really big effect and we need to address it. Another example here is that I'm showing you uh, in two different ways, the new E appearance expected in the Dune far detector. What you see in this plot here with the dotted lines, it are actually the expectations for different values of delta CP and what you see here is the size of the systematics we have. It's not hard to see that the size of the systematics we have now may actually be a problem for the measures, measurements we plan to do. And this is not just true for Dune and Nova, but it's actually true for every oscillation experiment. Um, trying to be more specific, let me try to convey how this gets into something like CP violation sensitivity. So what I'm showing here is the CP violation sensitivity for the DUNE far detector, well, for the DUNE uh, as a whole, uh, for different cases. The point is that to convey all of this, we need to use event generators in Monte Carlo. But what about, what if the models that are, are included on it are not perfect? Well, first of all, we have this line here that shows you the sensitivity using Gini, which is our primary uh, neutrino event generator. Right? And in this study, I'm um, just using that as if it was a perfect model. And this is the sensitivity we, watch, we achieve. <clears throat> but if we use a different but plausible model that is usually implemented in a different event generator, and then we put this into, into our simulation as fake data, that generates a difference and actually that, need, that needs to be taken into account as a systematic error. Once with that systematic, you start you try to reevaluate the violation for the, the sorry the sensitivity for CP violation. This is the sensitivity you achieve. 
So you can see by just using one different model or considering one different model, the sensitivity actually goes down from five sigma. Well, and if you think about this a little bit more, there are not just two models out there. There are actually several different models. And not just that, there are different combinations of them and different implementations of them. So this, once you take this into account, you actually reduce the sensitivity even further. Um, okay, so how can we try to, to, to do this? Let me introduce you to the Dune near detector complex. The Dune near detector complex is formed by three subsystems. Uh, you have the NDLAR, which is a modular pixelated liquid argon TPC. It's a primary target because in here, the beam's coming from right to left. And it's the one that's most similar to the Dune far detector because of liquid argon. Then you have the NDGAR, which is a high pressure gaseous argon TPC. It is surrounded by an ECOM in a magnet. It is a phenomenal mu spectrometer, and because it have a nice particle identification and low energy threshold, it can also be used for constrained nuclear interaction models, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, and then we have the sand detector, that is a tracker surrounded by e call and a magnet. And the main goal is to be to have on-axis monitor of the beam spectrum. Why specifically on axis? Because both of the dispersed detectors, they can actually move up and down in this direction. So can, they can take data in different off axis points and what we call Dune Prism. I don't have a lot of time to actually talk about this, but if you are interested, there is a talk by Patrick Dune on the status of the Dune detector with way more details than this. Okay, so how can we try to use these detectors to separate interaction channels? Well, first of all, what I'm showing you here is the spectrum of neutrino cross-sections per neutrino energy. And you, I'm showing you what you usually see when you talk about neutrino interaction, that you have these different channels, right? A quasi-elastic versus a pion production, uh, deep in elastic scattering. The point that I said earlier, these are these map the initial interaction of the neutrino in the nucleus, but they do not really map to what you see in your final detector. What you see here, it's the are the events expected in the gaseous argon detector per ion multiplicity. So the point is that there's not really a mapping, I apologize. There's not really a mapping between different multiplicities here to the actual interaction channels. So how can we use that to convey and look into the models? Well, we have several different tools, but the first thing you need to do is to actually identify these particles. Uh, and this is one thing that we have really good uh, identification on both the gaseous and the liquid uh, argon detectors. So what I'm showing here is the final confusion matrix for the, the gaseous argon detector, where you have the reconstructed uh, different multiplicities and the true different multiplicity. And you can see that we have a really good efficiency on this. You actually should keep in mind that this is also done with preliminary simulation. We expect to have even better efficiencies once we get to new and different techniques that we can implement here. Another thing that's really powerful for us is the statistics, right? Sorry, this is a lot of information, but just to point, these are events per year in both the liquid detector and the gaseous detector. Uh, and just to give an idea, the most recent Minerva high statistics sample have 16 to the five events while with two to three years of data taking, while these are something that we can take in most channels here with less than a year. So this is also really important to achieve some. So, <clears throat> but how can we really address the model differences and those different bias? What I'm showing you here is the comparison between the expected events per different pion multiplicity in the final state for the Q square and GeV square in the gaseous detector. This comparison that I'm doing, this ratio that you're seeing, is between Neuro and Gini. Neuro and Gini are two different neutrino event generators, and they both have different models implemented on them. And it's not hard to see that there is a big difference in expectations 
of the final state events that we can have. And actually what I'm showing here is both the truth and the reconstructed, because this, this effect, right, the reconstruction itself also makes a big difference in here. <clears throat> and the, the, the point here is that if we have this power of comparing all of these different models with high statistics, enough to actually separate all the channels, and then we can compare that with data. This is a really good insight so we can select, optimize, and tune models working together with theory and community and the generator developers to have a higher precision in the future, not just for Dune, but for the community as a whole. A different technique that we can use, it's what we call the transverse kinematic balance. Uh, it's a newish technique, so let me try to explain for a second. Uh, first, imagine the neutrino interacting with a stationary nucleon target. So you have the neutrino momentum interacting with this nucleon target, and then well, you have the final momentum, and what you see here is just the transverse component of it. In this case, it's obvious that you would have a balance, right? You would have um, consistency between initial and final momentum, but what we really have, it's this target being inside the nucleus. The point is that you can put together smart variables that can tell you not just the initial momentum of the particle that was hit by the neutrino, but also the effects of the final state particles because they are the ones that gave you this imbalance between momentums. Uh, this is a technique that was used in both Minerva and SDK with really good agreement uh, with the current implemented models, but not really in the transition between different nuclear models uh, that we see. So data doesn't really agree in certain parts. So the whole point here is to try to use this in Argon because this would give us a really good uh, insight into not just uh, the different interactions that we can have, uh, but in the A dependence, one thing that we don't really have much is data of neutrino cross-sections in argon, and having this measure can be really important. And you can see the difference here. Uh, well, of course, it's not just the same energy. It's not really the same energy, but you also have different um, targets. And you can see the difference, like Dune would have, give us really good access to 2 p 2 h interactions, also the IS interactions, and this is really important for us to look at. Okay, well, thank you very much. I hope you understand that neutrino nucleus cross-sections is really necessary for oscillation experiments and for neutrino experiments as a whole. The Dune detector not only provides the nearby detector ratio to constrain the flux and Uncertainty, right, is usually the main reason to have the near detector, but it also can measure cross sections and constrain the different interaction models using argon and in the exact same beam as the, the, the far detector, which also give us consistency to take both neutrino and antineutrino data, which is also something really important to understand in the cross section point of view. Uh, the junior detector CDR will be publicly available soon with way more details than this, so please stay tuned. Thank you very much. Okay, I don't think the speaker is with us online. Um, so what I suggest is that uh, if people have questions addressed to that talk that they type them in the in Q and A and uh, the speaker may be online later to to address them uh, to address them directly. Okay, so I think we should move on and the next speaker is going to talk about uh, tau neutrino production at uh, SBS and the NA65 experiment. Svetlana, are you ready to share your screen? Uh, yes. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Yep, that looks good. It's in full screen. So uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you for introduction. So I'm glad to have a possibility to tell you about uh, GS Tau experiment, which studied our neutrino production at uh, CERN SPS. 
So at the moment, uh, tau neutrino is uh, one of the least studied particles. There are only few measurements. Uh, only donut experiment observed uh, tau neutrinos in a uh, direct beam. And there are several experiments which uh, registered uh, tau neutrinos uh, from oscillations. And uh, at the moment, cross-section error is uh, more than uh, 50% which mainly caused by systematic uncertainty in uh, tau neutrino production. And another interesting uh, topic that uh, LHCB uh, reported a hint on uh, lepton universality violation from beta decay. Uh, so a precise measurement of uh, tau cross-section uh, would provide um, information to test uh, lepton universality in a neutrino sector. Uh, if we have a look uh, on the scheme of experiment which uh, uh, measure tau neutrino cross-section uh, with accelerator, we can see that uh, the main source of tau neutrinos is uh, this decay, ds2 tau, when a couple of neutrinos are produced, uh, which uh, appears in uh, interaction of high energy protons. And uh, as you can understand from uh, our experiment name, uh, this is our main uh, subject of interest. So uh, the goals of our experiment is, uh, first of all, study of tau neutrino production for future tau neutrino experiments, which uh, include the uh, first measurement of uh, DS double differential production cross-section, and uh, will provide um, uh, and to provide um, tau neutrino production at the range of 10 GV with the beam dump method. Uh, and this allowed to reduce uncertainty on uh, tau neutrino flux from more than 50% to 10%. And also charm physics uh, is interesting in itself. For example, a study of uh, intrinsic charm component in the proton. Uh, so, uh, as I said, we are aiming to uh, detect uh, such um, events, and this is quite challenging because uh, the length of such topology is uh, just a few millimeters, and here you can see the kink between uh, ds and tau. It's about just a few milliradian. And detection of this topology is, uh, can be done uh, using emulsion detector with high uh, spatial resolution. This uh, how our uh, detector module looks like. It uh, made of 10 uh, basic units. Each unit is a, a target, for example, tungsten plate, followed by uh, 10 um, emulsion films interleaved with the plastic layers. And uh, here on the picture, you can see uh, the exposure of such a model. It's size uh, of 10 by 12 by 8.6 centimeters. And uh, yeah, actually this model also uh, have a so-called emulsion cloud chamber uh, in the downstream part to measure uh, momentum of uh, interaction production products. So, uh, if uh, we um, uh, use, if we keep to use uh, this size of models, uh, in the experiment we have to expose and analyze uh, 370 models to achieve our goals. Uh, during exposure, uh, model moved uh, with the target mover with respect to the beam position. And uh, also we have uh, detectors to uh, monitor beam profile and uh, beam intensity. Uh, so as I said, we are looking for such uh, signals where double kink from DS tau decays uh, accompanied with a um, uh, charm decay uh, charged on neutral. The detection efficiency is estimated with the PFA. It's uh, about uh, 20%. And uh, the main background uh, to this signal comes from uh, uh, secondary hadrons interactions. Usually there are nuclear fragments in the interaction vertices, but uh, if uh, there are no registered nuclear fragments, it's our background. So for full statistics, we expect uh, about uh, 1,000 um, signal events and uh, about uh, 18 background events. 
Uh, so at the moment, we already perform a feasibility study, uh, test beam and pilot run. Now we are in the middle of analysis of uh, pilot run data. It's about 10% uh, uh, of the full scale experiment, which already uh, after analysis complete uh, will give a possibility to reduce uh, uncertainty on the flux up to 30% to revise uh, donut results and to perform some uh, study in charm physics. And uh, we are preparing to uh, physics uh, runs, which will be in the next two years, two weeks each. Uh, so we are planning to use two targets, uh, tungsten and molybdenum, and to collect about 500 uh, signal events in each um, target. And uh, uh, in some experiment, we'll use about 600 square meters of emulsion. So uh, for pilot run, we produce emulsion manually at Nagoya and Bern facilities with, uh, with a speed of about um, seven square meters per week. But for physics run, uh, uh, the amount of emulsion will be higher. So Nagoya University is uh, constructing the automatic uh, production line, uh, which will work with a speed of about uh, more than uh, 10 meters per day, uh, 10 square meters. And uh, it will be ready for production test in uh, September. Also, uh, we uh, pre prepare a new target mover, which will be able to operate with a large uh, module uh, of the size up to 40 by 40 centimeters. Uh, the um, large uh, volume of models uh, will allow us to speed up uh, scanning. And uh, during exposure, we use uh, intensity driving control, which uh, give a smooth uh, uh, proton uh, distribution uh, in the um, model with respect to the constant uh, speed uh, movement. So we are going to keep like this. And after uh, emulsion exposed and um, developed, the analysis uh, goes into steps. Uh, so first step is a fast full area scanning. Uh, after this, we are able to reconstruct uh, track segments in emulsion plate and uh, the tracks in the volume and able to select uh, decays with a uh, angle more than 20 milliradians. So of course, uh, this means um, at this step, we have just a preselection. We select uh, double charm events and uh, our signal events, but uh, we, can dis we cannot distinguish this from tau at this step, just to uh, see the tau decay. Uh, well, for this uh, uh, task, we used the uh, hypertrack uh, selector in Nagoya uh, with a scanning speed of 0 0.5 square meters per hour per layer and resolution of about two milliradians. And since, uh, so uh, we already finished uh, full area scanning for pilot run, but since in the um, uh, physics run, the amount of emulsion will be higher to be able to finish each uh, scan of each physics run in one year, uh, the new system is under construction, which will be five uh, times uh, faster. And uh, on the second step, uh, we will work with the events preselected in uh, first step, and uh, we will use a nano precision system with an angular resolution of uh, about 0 0.3 milliradian. And on this step, uh, already uh, it's possible to distinguish DS from tau and to uh, register sig uh, signal finally. Uh, so I will, uh, for pilot run, we uh, working now on the first uh, step and uh, I will concentrate on uh, this only. Uh, the track density level uh, in uh, our models is about 10 to five, 10 to six uh, tracks per square centimeters. Here on the plot, uh, you can see the amount of track and the piece of data. And uh, anyway, the 
unique spatial resolution of emulsion allow us to efficiently recognize tracks and vertices. The track finding efficiency is in a single film is more than uh, 94 percent. And here is example how the vertices looks like in a um, tungsten target. And uh, here is a multiplicity of uh, uh, proton interactions in uh, different materials of our detector. Now we are working on comparison uh, of uh, some distributions with uh, those obtained from different generators. And here from uh, distribution of vertexes along the model, you clearly can see the structure of a uh, model. And the uh, final task at the first step is a search for double charm event, uh, event topology. You can see here on the picture, we look for charged one prong decay. And uh, in the same vertex, it should be another charged or neutral decay. Here is uh, shown in neutral, for example. Uh, so far, we... Um, analyzed uh, just a part of the um, pilot run data, which corresponds to about 3.4 times um, 10 to seven protons. And the uh, number of uh, uh, registered proton interactions and found uh, double decay topology uh, is in agreement with uh, those expected from the Monte Carlo simulation. Also, flight length distribution shows that uh, our charm analysis chain, chain of works. And uh, to uh, conclude, I would like to say that our experiment was proposed uh, to CERN SPS and um, it was approved uh, as NA65 about a year ago. So the aim is a detection of uh, 1,000 uh, DS2 tau decays in uh, 400 GV proton interactions using emulsion detector with a special resolution of uh, 50 nanometers, uh, which will allow to reduce the systematic uncertainty in the new tau cross section measurement from 50% to 10, and also will allow to study charm particle production. So we successfully performed a pilot run and collected about 10% of the data, performed a fast full area scanning, and now we are working on the analysis of this collected data. And also we are preparing to the physics run, which uh, take place next two years. So we are optimizing detector geometry and preparing fast emulsion uh, production line and faster readout. Okay, thank you for attention. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions? If so, please raise your hand. I don't see any questions. Maybe I can quick. Maybe I can ask a quick one myself. Um, just a very simple question: the the, the scanning uh, technology is it is it building on the the Opera? technology or is it really a new development? Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, yes, there are many people uh, which participate uh, in uh, Donut, uh, Opera and so on. Yes, and Nagoya University um, uh, participated in Opera and uh, it's uh, based on this, but uh, now the uh, scanning speed is uh, much more faster. And uh, if you have a look on this um, uh, new HTS2, uh, which is under preparation, you can see uh, <laughs> the size, the objective, the table. It's uh, the scanning speed uh, much more improved from opera times. But yeah, but uh, you see the uh, from 72 square centimeters uh, up to uh, 25,000 square centimeters. I see. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any other questions, so I suggest we move on. And uh, now we're moving to a series of talks on neutrino mass. Uh, 
both direct measurements and neutrinos double beta decay. And we're, st we're starting with a talk on, on Katrin uh, from uh, Alexei Lokov. So you can begin, but we can see your, we can see your slides. Yeah, thank you very much. And I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation uh, to, to this conference. It's great pleasure for me to present Katrin's first uh, results and future prospects here. I would like to start with uh, three ways uh, to uh, assess the absolute neutrino mass scale. And uh, the first one is uh, looking at the cosmological observables in the era of precision cosmology, or we are already in this era, uh, this is a very sensitive uh, way. Uh, 100 milli electron volt uh, of the sum of the neutrino masses. Uh, this is the value from Planck. Uh, the second uh, method is to search for the neutrino as double beta decay, the process that is uh, allowed if neutrinos are Majorana particles. Uh, this is a direct uh, process of electron number violation, uh, but it uh, is somehow model dependent. And there are several talks uh, in this session and also uh, beyond is uh, gonna give uh, some uh, discussion uh, this next week. And uh, finally, uh, one can look at the energy momentum conservation law and without any further assumption, uh, looking for example on time of light uh, of neutrino from supernovas or uh, at kinematics of uh, weak processes like uh, tritium beta decay and uh, electron capture on Holmium. Uh, and before Katrin were achieved through the tritium beta decay measurements. Now, why do we use uh, tritium beta decay? Uh, well, uh, the, the description itself is uh, rather simple. It, the formula fits on one slide uh, and it's rather model uh, independent. The neutrino mass enters uh, this uh, rate of the tritium beta decay here and uh, the general shape of the spectrum is very well uh, recognizable. The uh, neutrino mass, the effective neutrino only at the a very high energetic part of the spectrum near the endpoint. And uh, unfortunately, the amount of events there is rather small. It's the spectrum. And uh, tritium was uh, chosen uh, because it has very low endpoint energy and uh, rather short half-life because it is a super allowed decay. But also, as I said, the electron capture on holmium is used in uh, different projects. We need very high energy resolution, uh, low background. And in Katrin, we uh, approach this with the Maki filter technology, uh, but uh, other projects uh, have uh, various techniques uh, to, uh, to, to assess neutron mass as well. Let me quickly introduce you to the Katrin experiment. Uh, the Katrin uh, collaboration contain, uh, consists of uh, 150 people from um, more than 20 institutions and uh, our 70 meters long uh, setup is located at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. The uh, setup is split into uh, six uh, components, the gaseous uh, tritium source uh, that uh, where the electrons are emitted in the beta decay and then they are guided uh, by uh, several Tesla magnetic field through the transport section where the tritium uh, flow is reduced by 14 orders of magnitude. Then uh, the press spectrometer um, filters out uh, most of the low energy electrons and uh, the uh, high resolu energy resolution spectroscopy is done with the uh, main spectrometer of Katrin. Then the detector uh, basically counts electrons one by one. And from the uh, opposite side, the beam line is uh, closed with the rear section that has several diagnostic tools uh, on it. The windowless uh, gaseous uh, tritium source of Katrin uh, is a 10 meter long tube where tritium is injected in the center and pumped out at the ends. And the electrons, they are guided with the magnetic field of about 2.5 Tesla uh, towards the spectrometers without any obstacle here. So uh, the, the requirements for the source, ability of uh, temperature, uh, tritium purity and uh, tritium pressure. The uh, temperature can also be adjusted in a rather wide range from the uh, Kelvin. And of course the setup uh, has to handle uh, this huge amount of tritium of about 40 grams per day in the nominal operation mode. 
The high energy uh, resolution of Katrin is achieved uh, through the so-called Maki filter technique, and this stands for magnetic adiabatic collimation combined with electrostatic filtering. The idea here is uh, to guide electrons through the whole beam line adiabatically, so uh, conserving uh, this orbital magnetic moment of electron. And um, as you can see here, if we reduce or drop the magnetic field by several orders of magnitude, uh, as we do in the center of the, uh, all the electrons are uh, effectively aligned with the magnetic field lines. And then if we apply uh, retarding potential, electrostatic retarding potential uh, to the spectrometer and to the inner electrode system, we create a high pass filter for the electrons. Of course, this uh, comes with the uh, cost of having this uh, giant spectrometer that was uh, barely feeding to the streets when transported to the experimental site uh, at Karlsruhe. And now the experimental spectrum of Katrin, uh, the expected rate for each retarding potential that we set is uh, created by a convolution of theoretical beta spectrum with the experimental uh, response of Katrin. And experimental response is uh, uh, essentially computed also from the first principles, but uh, checked uh, through uh, extensive calibration with the electron gun and uh, Krypton conversion uh, electrons, and uh, Michal is going to give some uh, details in his uh, post presentation uh, tomorrow. The, um, uh, the 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 spectrum is uh, depending on the background rate uh, in this region, the endpoint energy, uh, the normalization of the spectrum, and of course the neutrino mass squared. In 2018, we have performed our uh, first engineering run with very low tritium concentration to check the functionality of all the systems and also to prove uh, the stability of the source parameters under working conditions. And uh, the stability is was reached uh, on the sub per mil level. And this also resulted in a very recent uh, publication of uh, this uh, first uh, spectroscopy of tritium uh, done by Katrin. And uh, in spring last year, uh, we have uh, performed our first science run for weeks long with very high purity of tritium and high source activity, which was still uh, only 22% of the nominal activity. And uh, we do the scanning in uh, the following way. We uh, change the voltages, uh, go with the voltages uh, up and down uh, over two hours uh, with a two hours uh, interval and we have performed about 300 of uh, such scans uh, of uh, tritium beta decay in this uh, campaign. Then uh, in the analysis this uh, 300 uh, scans are um, combined into this nice spectrum of Katrin. Uh, say that here the error bars are enlarged by a factor of 50 just to make them visible. Nonetheless, the fit uh, is uh, very good. The blue line and uh, the residuals are very good. The uh, um, goodness of fit uh, is, uh, very, uh, is excellent. And uh, we have performed bias-free analysis by applying the whole analysis chain first to the Monte Carlo data and only uh, on the final step uh, on to the experimental data. Uh, the analysis was done uh, using two independent method, uh, methods of propagating the uncertainties, and both methods agree uh, very well. And our neutrino mass uh, squared best fit result is uh, minus one plus minus essentially one EV squared, which is uh, very well compatible with zero. And uh, our endpoint fit, um, uh, best fit value can be converted into the Q value of uh, tritium and compared to the independent measurements with the penning traps, uh, which uh, gives also very good agreement. To set an upper limit, we have used uh, two uh, procedures, uh, Lokhoff and Kachov and Feldman and Cousins, and we have chosen uh, this more robust uh, LT method uh, for our first result, um, uh, which is 1.1 EV at 90% confidence level. Now, uh, let me uh, quickly introduce you to the um, our very uh, recent results on the sterile neutrino searches with Katrin. Uh, we are looking here to a characteristic distortion of the spectrum, uh, kind of a king coming from the uh, fourth neutrino mass eigenstate. 
and we are, we're using the same data set as for the neutrino mass. And one of the peculiarities of Catherine is that our signal to background ratio is uh, about a factor of 70, which is uh, not so typical for uh, sterile neutrino searches. Here is the, our result. Uh, the blue line is the exclusion curve search for the EV scale sterile neutrinos. And in the high mass region, we improve uh, a bit on the exclusion of uh, uh, different experiments and exclude some part of the parameter space of the reactor anomaly. And uh, for the low mass uh, range, we improve on mines and troids limits and approaching this hint from the neutrino four. In the future, we uh, plan to probe with our final uh, sensitivity, projected sensitivity, a large fraction of uh, reactor A uh, Couple of words on the search for key these sterile neutrinos. This, uh, he, here we looked into the deep scans uh, far away from the endpoint at, with our low activity commissioning data. And we found excellent agreement between the uh, data and the model and sensitivity uh, of about 10 to minus three uh, uh, for the mixing of 10 to minus three. And uh, this will be improved uh, with the, within the Tristan project with uh, novel uh, detector array uh, handling large counts and good energy resolution. One thing that we uh, have to fight with is uh, the uh, background, which is mostly, mostly coming from the main spectrometer of Katrin. And among other um, uh, techniques, uh, we are testing now uh, the so-called shifted analyzing plane configuration where the volume of the flux tube is effectively uh, reduced and uh, the volume dependent background component uh, is uh, reduced as well. We have found that it can lead to improvement of two in the signal to background uh, ratio and uh, we have performed already background calibration and tritium scans in this configuration. For, uh, yeah, in autumn last year, we have uh, performed the second neutrino mass campaign with uh, even a higher source activity uh, than before, and uh, the data uh, will be unblinded uh, soon. And actually on Monday this week, we have uh, finished our third neutrino mass measurement campaign. The analysis is ongoing. And uh, besides we have uh, performed extensive uh, studies of uh, our source properties and uh, our ways to reduce the background with the shifted analyzing plane. And uh, yeah, this brings me to my conclusion. Uh, Katrin uh, has uh, the new uh, the world best uh, upper limit on the neutrino mass of 1.1 electron volts at 90% confidence level. And uh, we are taking data to reach our ultimate cell sensitivity of 0.2 EV after five years. Uh, I have presented the first constraints on the EV scale sterile neutrinos uh, from Katrin and our uh, first search on the key EV uh, scale sterile neutrinos. We are of course doing uh, some other beyond the standard uh, physics uh, searches as well. And we have just completed our next uh, capturing run with optimized settings. So uh, you should stay tuned for the new results from Katrin. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexei. Um, are there questions for the speaker? Please raise your hand. I don't think I see any questions. Maybe I can ask a, a very quick one, Alexi. So um, when you discussed the, the Q value determination and you compared it with the, with the penning trap measurements, can you remind me, do you, do, you use the, do you use the penning trap Q value determination as a constraint finally in the extraction of the neutrino mass limit or, or not? Uh, uh, no, it's, uh, we do not constrain it. Uh, we yeah. just use it as an uh, um, external uh, comparison of our energy scale okay. um, knowledge. So this is just a cross check uh, that uh, <clears throat> gives us more confidence uh, in our energy scale knowledge. I see, I see. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, if there's no other questions, I 
suggest we move on. Thanks, thanks again. Um, is the next speaker ready to share their screen? Yes, I'm ready. Hi, right, so uh, Andrea Giacchiero is going to talk about new results from the Quarry experiment. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, that looks good. We can see your screen. Okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. I would like to thank the organizer to give me the opportunity to present the new result of the core experiment. Core experiment are in running at the Grand Sass and the Grand Laboratories um, with the goal to search the neutrino less double beta decay. Um, in the nuclear that will be the decay, uh, two nucleus decay simultaneously, and um, the two neutrino mode is allowed by the standard model, and uh, uh, it has already been observed in several uh, nuclei um, with uh, um, a, an expected life life uh, greater than uh, ten to the um, uh, eighteen years. The zero neutrino mode, in which two antineutrinos disappear in a virtual particle exchange, is forbidden by the standard model, but it's allowed um, by theory behind the standard model with an expected half life greater than 10 to the uh, 25 years. Uh, its observation would imply the violation of the um, lepton number conservation, and it would represent a key tool to, to, to study the neutrino properties, in particular the neutrino uh, nature, Majorana and Dirac, and the neutrino mass scale ordering, and the, the CP violation uh, in the uh, lepton uh, sector. Um, the half-life for the neutrino as double beta decay can be factorized uh, um, by uh, this formula in red, the, the first one on the left, uh, where uh, G is, is the two um, body uh, phase uh, factor, M is the nuclear matrix element, and F is the new physics term that is responsible for uh, the decay. Uh, in case of three uh, neutrino exchange, F is the uh, so-called Majorana mass, uh, defined uh, by the uh, electron electron entry of the uh, neutrino uh, oscillator oscillation uh, mixing uh, matrix. The experimental signature is a monochromatic line, line at the Q value of the study decay, and the experimental sensitivity in case of no peak detected at no zero background is given uh, by uh, the formula on the bottom of the slide, on the left. Um, in particular, the sensitivity is directly proportional um, to the detection efficiency and to the isotopic abundance of the chosen uh, nucleus, uh, directly proportional to the um, uh, root square of the um, uh, of the lifetime uh, times the, the, the detection mass, and inversely proportional to the uh, square root of the energy resolution time the background counts. So to reach, to reach a nice sensitivity is important to have a detector with a very good resolution, um, a very large uh, uh, detector mass uh, running for a, a very long time. Um, the high ideal isotope for the study of the neutrino as the property decay uh, um, should have a, a um, Q value greater than the uh, endpoint of the natural gamma slash beta uh, background and less than the starting point of the alpha natural background. Uh, this means a range within uh, three and four um, MEV. Um, this isotope should also have an high uh, statistic abundance um, and the isotope will be available uh, with reason re reasonable cost and uh, procurement time. Uh, at last, uh, it should be compatible with the availab available detection technique and better if su suitable for a configuration in which the isotope is embedded uh, in the detector. Um, low temperature detectors are powerful tools to study the neutrinos that produce beta decay 
in this detector and in pinging particle, uh, which are this an amount of energy in the absorber, is detected through a temperature rise that is converted in a detectable uh, signal by a temperature sensor coupled to the absorber. Uh, the temperature rise is proportional to the release of energy and inversely proportional to the um, absorber thermal capacity. So to maximize this effect, uh, a small uh, thermal capacity is a mandatory requirement, and this is possible by using uh, dielectric and diamagnetic crystal working at cryogenic uh, temperature. Um, the energy resolution of this kind of detector is only limited by statistical fluctuation and a relative resolution uh, on the order of per mile are uh, easily uh, achievable. Quorum use low temperature uh, detector based of crystal of mm, tellurium dioxide that uh, work both as uh, source and absorb. Uh, the decay under study is uh, the decay of the the double beta decay of the tellurium 130. Uh, these items of represent a good choice because uh, um, it has an isotopic abundance uh, of uh, 34.2 and, and this uh, uh, could uh, avoid the uh, enrichment procedure. And the equivalent is almost above the natural uh, beta alpha background and below the natural uh, uh, alpha background. Uh, moreover, the tellurium dioxide is easy to grow in bead crystal with a very low radioactive contamination. And it has a good mechanical properties uh, and uh, it presents a low uh, heat capacity. A sensor, Quare, uses a germanium thermistor doped by new, thermal neutrons with a resistance that depends logarithmically um, with the temperature. Quare is the largest thermal detector ray ever built. It's composed by 988 tellurium dioxide crystal for a total mass of 742 kilograms divided on 19 towers, 52 uh, crystal each. Each uh, crystal is a cube, uh, five centimeter on a side with uh, a mass of uh, 750 uh, gram. Uh, the material selection and the assembly procedure, uh, procedure, pro 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 procedure uh, follow a stringent uh, radio purity protocol uh, with the goal to, uh, to, um, to achieve a background level in the ROI of uh, 10, to the minus two count per kev per kilogram per year. And um, the goal with another goal, the second goal to achieve a resolution of five kV at the uh, tallium line. Uh, in this condition, the expected sensitivity in five here is nine times 10 to the 25 um, years. Uh, and that, uh, considering the current uh, nuclear matrix element, this means a sensitivity in the Majorana mass in the range uh, within the 45 and 211 uh, millihiv. Um, the base temperature has been reached for the first time in December 2017, and the data taking started immediately after. Um, to cool down this large mass of, of detector, a custom cryogenic infra infrastructure is needed. The system has to maintain a cryogenic temperature of the detector, but also all the internal shield. This is very large uh, load, and um, each cooldown lasts around one month. Uh, the whole structure is designed to minimize the mechanical vibration, and a noise cancellation system has been an active noise cancellation system has been developed to minimize the vibrational noise to the, uh, the cryo coolers. Um, from uh, uh, April 2017, seven data set have been collected with an average of uh, 900 and 950 valid calorimeter with an uh, average resolution of uh, seven kev at the uh, Q value. After, after an initial period discontinued by two optimization and maintenance uh, phases, now the data taking is continuing in stable condition, and this was true also during the recent lock lockdown, and the total acquired exposure of tellurium dioxide is uh, 372.5 kilogram uh, per year. Um, here, uh, I present the uh, result for the neutrino stable beta decay. 
the analysis is based on a Bayesian approach. Uh, the likelihood model is composed by a flat continuum with uh, a posited peak for the double beta decay and the peak for the um, cobalt 60. Uh, there is no evidence of double beta decay. Uh, the background in the ROI is uh, 0 0.0138. This is compatible with the target background. And the sensitivity for this exposure is uh, 3.2 times 10 to the 25 years. That means uh, um, a limit for the neutrino mass in the range uh, within 75 and 350 uh, milli -EV. Um here, the analysis, the, the result for the analysis of the neutrino mode, uh, the continuum background is reconstructed uh, considering giant force simulation, the measure detector response, and the experimental coincidence uh, and the detection, uh, the detector self shielding uh, to constrain uh, local sources. Um, the value, the obtained value is 7.71 times 10 to the 20 years. Uh, value that is compatible with the past value obtained with core zero uh, with a reduction or a factor three on both uh, statistical and systematics uh, uncertainties. So um, core now is uh, um, continuing in uh, running and the, 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 the data taking continues and th this double condition allows to continue data um, taking with minimal or silent uh, activity also during the recent lockdown. Um, Caller will reach the target sensitivity in few years, approaching the inverted hierarchy region. The next uh, unblinding um, is uh, foreseen at one ton per year of uh, uh, ex exposure. In conclusion, uh, the study of frontal subject in nuclear in uh, neutrino physics required the use of frontal detector. The observation of the neutrino less double the decay would prove that uh, neutrinos are Majorana particle. Quare accumulated uh, around um, 400 kilograms per year uh, of exposure, and the new data is being acquired. And Quare will approach the inverted hierarchy region in a few years. The successful performance of Square justifies future development of cryogenic calorimeters. And this is the program, the program of Cupid, that is the upgrade of the um, Core experiment. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, we have time for a question, if anyone wants to raise their hand now. Yes. Uh, Go ahead, uh, uh, Witold, are you able to? Yes, uh, Witold Kozanetsky, Sarah Sackley. Could you compare your sensitivity in Majorana mass to that of uh, EXO, or rather the new EXO? Uh, in the, the current uh, sensitivity, is less than the exosensitivity in this moment. But uh, um, in five years, uh, um, the goal is to enter uh, the inverted hierarchy region. Thank you. OK, thank you. And a, a, a very quick question from me. So um, just to understand. The next unblinding is expected at uh, one ton year, I think you said. Yeah. So just to be clear, you mean that the total crystal exposure, not not the tellurium one hundred and thirty exposure. The exposure, the exposure of tellurium dioxide. So the, the yeah, not of the tellurium one hundred and forty. Okay, understood. Okay, thank you. All right, very good. Thanks again, Andrea, um, and. We're ready to go to the next speaker now. Are you ready to show your slides, uh, Davida? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Okay, so the next speaker, Davida Chiesa, is going to talk about uh, uh, double beta decay results from Cupid Zero. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I will present now uh, the results from uh, the Cupid Zero experiments. So uh, 
I will go fast in the introduction because uh, Andrea uh, before me just uh, presented uh, the scientific goal of the neutrinoless uh, double beta decay experiments uh, and also the feature of the cryogenic uh, calorimeter that will be used uh, in, in Cupid and that have been used in Cupid Zero. Uh, I, I, I comment uh, the, the plot that was just shown by Andrea. Uh, here is uh, the, the sensitivity of core in terms of the effective uh, neutrino majorana mass. Uh, so you see that uh, core will, will approach uh, or even uh, in the better situation will touch uh, uh, the upper part of the inverted IRT region. And uh, the next generation experiments uh, want uh, to achieve uh, a sensitivity uh, down to 10 uh, milli electron volts. And uh, so uh, to, to increase uh, uh, the sensitivity, we have to, to measure half-lives uh, of the order uh, uh, of the, at least 10 to the 27, 10 to the 28 uh, years. And uh, so we need to, to have a very large number of uh, observed uh, double beta decay emitters. So a big detector mass of the order of one ton, uh, but also uh, isotopic uh, enrichment. And uh, we also need uh, a background in uh, flow uh, on career uh, exposure scale. The energy resolution is another uh, key parameter, but uh, as already shown by Andrea, um, the cryogenic calorimeters uh, have an excellent uh, resolution uh, and so are uh, a, a very good option to search uh, for uh, the peak uh, of the, uh, the signature of the neutrino less double beta decay at uh, the true value of the transition. Uh, scintillating cryogenic uh, calorimeters are uh, detectors that, uh, as uh, um, the, the cryogenic calorimeters uh, are um, operated at very low, low temperature and uh, have uh, high detection uh, efficiency. Uh, the, uh, in, in addition, they are, uh, the crystal absorber is also uh, a scintillator. And so the energy uh, deposited by single particle interaction is converted into both uh, an heat and a light signal. And uh, by uh, adding a, a light detector uh, aside uh, near the, the crystal absorber, we, we can uh, detect uh, the light and uh, by plotting uh, the light signal versus uh, the heat signal, we, we achieve uh, a scatter plot where uh, there are different clusters for uh, different uh, types of particle uh, interacting uh, in the crystal absorber. So we can distinguish uh, beta, part beta gamma particle interaction with respect to alpha particles uh, and uh, nuclear recoils that uh, are, uh, of course, a background because we are searching for uh, a double beta decay. Cupid is a, a next generation uh, experiment. Here there is the link to the pre-CDR document. Cupid means a quarry upgrade with particle identification. It will be made of uh, uh, 1,500 lithium olividate uh, scintillating calorimeters uh, enriched to more than 95% in molybdenum 100. The Q value of molybdenum is uh, about around 3 MeV. And uh, at this energy, the, the natural beta gamma background uh, is very, very low. And um, also, we have uh, the possibility to fully reject uh, the alpha background. And uh, an external um, muon beta will be, will be added to, to suppress uh, the, um, the very low flux surviving uh, at, uh, inside the cavern of the Gran Sasso uh, laboratories. Uh, so by rejecting the alpha background that is the, the dominant one uh, in uh, the quarry experiment, we aim to achieve a, a background of the order of 10 to the minus four counts per kV per kilogram per year with a reduction of a factor 100 with uh, respect uh, to quarry background. Cupid uh, has a solid base because uh, it will profit uh, from uh, the core experience in operating uh, a ton scale cryogenic experiment and uh, will uh, be hosted in the same quarry infrastructure that is uh, uh, running, uh, so quarry is running very well. So. Uh, that, that's very, very good for the future experiment. From, in order to go from, from Quarry to uh, Cupid, uh, demonstrator experiments have been uh, realized. Cupid Zero is uh, the first demonstrator. There is also Cupid Mo running uh, at uh, the Modan uh, laboratories. 
QP0 uh, is not only a demonstrator for the new technologies to be implemented in Cupid, but uh, it is also a competitive uh, uh, neutrino as double beta decay experiment uh, in its own right. So uh, in, in this talk, I, I will present the, the physics results we obtained from uh, the analysis of uh, QP0 data. Uh, here is uh, the, 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 the picture and the description of the QP0 detector. That is an array of uh, scintillating uh, uh, zinc selenide crystals. Um, so in this case, uh, the uh, double beta decay emitter is not uh, molybdenum, but is uh, uh, selenium 82 that has a two value around uh, three MeV. And uh, these crystals are enriched uh, to 95% in uh, selenium uh, 82 for a total mass of uh, 10 kilograms of zinc selenide or uh, 5 kilograms of selenium 82. Uh, the, the, the crystal uh, is, uh, um, is equipped with uh, uh, thermometers and uh, with uh, a germanium uh, um, vapor cryogenic like uh, detectors at the top and at the bottom of each crystal for uh, particle identification. And there is also uh, a reflecting foil aside to enhance uh, the, the light collections. Uh, here is the timeline of QP0 experiment that started uh, that take in 2017. Uh, and then uh, uh, around, uh, it ran for uh, uh, more than one year to, to um, uh, collect uh, about 10 kilogram per year uh, uh, zinc selenide exposure in the first phase and uh, with a, a very good duty cycle, uh, about 74% uh, of time was devoted uh, uh, to, to collect the data for uh, double beta decay physics searches. Uh, after that, uh, there was a detector upgrade and in the second phase, we uh, collected uh, uh, around five kilogram per year uh, exposure. The particle identification in the QP0 is uh, performed by analyzing uh, the different shape of the light signals. Here in this plot, you can see uh, how it changes uh, the, the shape of the tail of the pass detected by light detector when uh, the interaction is made from uh, an alpha particle or from a beta gamma interaction inside uh, uh, the absorber crystal. And uh, in this way, by defining a, a shape uh, parameter of the light, uh, of the, of the light uh, signal, we can build uh, this uh, scatter plot where uh, we clearly recognize uh, the, the cluster of uh, alpha events that uh, can be separated from uh, the beta gamma ones above uh, QMEV with uh, uh, more than 99.9 uh, discrimination uh, uh, capability. This uh, uh, feature is, uh, has been applied in uh, the search for the neutrino as double beta decay of uh, selenium 82. Uh, in, in gray here, you can see the, the spectrum, the heat spectrum, uh, without uh, applying uh, uh, particle identification. And uh, you can see that if we apply the alpha rejection, we, we significantly reduce the, the background uh, and we get the, the orange histogram. And, uh, we, we can further uh, suppress the background by uh, eliminating uh, the thallium uh, beta gamma events that are in delayed coincidence with the uh, uh, previous uh, alpha decay from uh, Vismuth. In this way, we achieve uh, the lowest background uh, ever measured with uh, cryogenic calorimetric experiments of the order of uh, uh, 10 to the minus 3 counts per kV per kilogram per year. And uh, we extracted the, the, the best half life limit on uh, selenium. 82. Uh, moreover, we also analyzed not only the region of interest for the neutrino as double beta decay, but we also developed a, a full background model to, to describe uh, all uh, the data that have been, uh, um, that have been um, detected by QP0. Uh, in order to understand our background, we uh, divided the experimental data according to different features. Uh, one uh, important feature is the multiplicity of the event and uh, also, of course, uh, the particle type. In this way, by analyzing the gamma lines uh, and uh, the, the alpha lines that we see in the spectra, we, we can recognize uh, the sources uh, of background and their uh, position. We can uh, simulate uh, the spectra of each background source uh, with a Monte Carlo Gen4 uh, very detailed uh, model of the experimental setup. 
And uh, in the end, uh, we perform a Bayesian fit to the experimental data with a, a linear combination of this uh, Monte Carlo simulated spectra of the background sources. In the end, uh, we obtain the uh, activity of uh, the uh, different uh, background uh, sources. And so we can uh, analyze uh, uh, the different components of our background. Here is the plot for the multiplicity one uh, beta gamma experimental spectrum. Uh, this is the, the, the region of interest where there are the, the, the different uh, background uh, components. This is a uh, useful information for the next ex experiments. And uh, since uh, the two neutrino double beta decay uh, shown here is a dominant component uh, in, uh, in the spectrum, we can uh, perform a, a physics analysis uh, regarding uh, this uh, radial decay. And also we extracted a, a limit on uh, CPT violation in uh, this decay. There is a, a paper here. I don't have time to, to discuss into the details. Uh, regarding so the, the measurement of the two neutrino double beta decay of selenium 82, we got the most precise uh, measurement. It is published, was published on PRL last year. Uh, here is uh, the result. And uh, this is the table of, the, of all the possible uh, systematic uh, uh, sources of uncertainty that uh, we analyzed. And we got uh, a final accuracy of the order of uh, 2%. So very, very accurate uh, measurements. Moreover, uh, we, we, we also analyzed not only the normalization of this uh, uh, component of the measured spectrum that gives us uh, the, the activity and, and so the half-life of the decay, but also the shape of the spectrum. In, indeed, there are uh, uh, different uh, um, nuclear model calculations that involve some uh, approximations. And uh, our uh, experimental data provides a very useful benchmark for such uh, models. And uh, in, in this paper, we analyzed uh, two different uh, possibilities uh, to describe uh, this uh, decay as a sequence of uh, uh, two virtual uh, beta decays going uh, through uh, only one or more than one uh, intermediate state of the um, excited state of the intermediate nucleus. And uh, in these two different models, we have uh, to uh, dif slightly different uh, shape in the two neutrino spectrum. We fitted uh, our data with uh, the two um, models. And uh, we, we found a strong uh, evidence that uh, the two neutrino double beta decay of uh, selenium 82 is a uh, single state uh, dominated. Uh, finally, a few words about the, the phase two. Uh, since uh, in the background model, we found that the muons are uh, the main residual background in uh, CP0, we installed the uh, immune veto. We also removed uh, the reflecting uh, foil. Here is the, the, the tower of the crystals uh, before and after the arc grade. This was done for a better understanding of our uh, uh, background, especially uh, from crystal surfaces. And uh, the removal of, of uh, reflecting foils allowed to measure the multiplicity through alpha events. And uh, also a, a new cop copper shielding uh, was uh, installed. So summarizing, uh, uh, QP0 is uh, the first uh, double beta decay experiment uh, based on scintillating uh, cryogenic calorimeters and uh, that are also the highly enriched. Uh, it uh, demonstrated uh, the excellent uh, alpha rejection capability and uh, the lowest uh, background measured with this uh, uh, technique. Uh, it allows us uh, to establish the best half life limit uh, on uh, the zero neutrino double beta decay and the most precise measurement of the two neutrino double beta decay of selenium 82. Uh, just a comment to conclude uh, Quarry, QP0, and also QP more are uh, providing the most string stringent limits on the neutrino double beta decay and the most precise measurement of the two neutrino double beta decay on three different isotopes, uh, in, uh, namely tellurium-130, uh, um, selenium-82, and uh, molybdenum-100. So this is uh, more than uh, a solid uh, foundation for uh, the Cupid experiment. Thanks for your attention, if you have questions. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions for the speaker? Please raise your hand or type a question. Okay, maybe I'll just ask a very, a very quick one then, if that's okay. Um, I mean, there, there are other uh, double beta decay experiments proposing to use molybdenum 100. 
um, like Amore. Is there any is there any issue with uh, with the supply of enriched molybdenum? How many uh, how many how many years worth of uh, enriched uh, molybdenum production does it correspond to for both experiments combined? Well, uh, yes, the, the, the molybdenum one hundred um, is. Uh, Will be will be produced for for Cupid. We we have uh, in contact with uh, uh, with groups that will uh, produce uh, in us uh, in us uh, molybdenum uh, 100. Now there is a discussion with the funding agency to uh, to cover the cost of the uh, of the molybdenum 100 uh, uh, reached uh, Okay. Um. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, so let's move on. Uh, Constantine, are you ready to share your screen? Yeah, sure. Hello. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Constantine Gustav, and he's uh, going to present uh, very recent uh, results from uh, uh, final results from, from Gerda phase two. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So I want to first uh, say thank you to organizers and also forgive the collaboration to give me such a nice opportunity to present our results here at this important conference. So, uh, uh, thank you to the previous speakers. So now you know how important it is to search for neutrinoless double beta decay. So I can skip these slides, and I just want to again mention that it's. The energy resolution is really crucially important for the double beta decay uh, search, uh, since you always have continuous uh, uh, background from two neutrino double uh, beta decay um, process. And another important point is uh, the it's very important to have a to reach uh, let's say zero background condition because in this case we will have the linear increase of sensitivity of the experiment versus exposure. So how, what is our way to reach such a condition, which we are using uh, germanium 76 isotope to search for neutrinos as double beta decay. Why? First, as has been also mentioned already, that it's important to have as low background experiment as possible. And so, and detector grade germanium is really high purity material. And also this uh, very well-known technology and very well established. Uh, another important point about germanium, the germanium detectors, they have a very good energy resolution, actually the best energy resolution amongst all competitors in this field. And in addition, uh, the, uh, we have our enriched germanium, now germanium detectors enriched in germanium 76. So the efficiency of uh, detection of this decay is quite high. So again, they used a phased, phased approach. The first phase where we used uh, detector from the previous experiments, uh, normal coaxial detectors uh, that was finished. And now I'm happy to tell you that the second phase of Gerda uh, also finished in December 2019. And here I am presenting you the last result of our experiment. Here you can see our collaboration, which consists of more than 100 physicists from 16 European institutes. So, and here you see we also, we still keep working in virtuality in this new reality where all of us now working. So the Gerda uh, cryostat is located in uh, Grand Sass lab, similar in the same hall actually as core experiment. Uh, so we have a big water tank instrumented with uh, uh, PMTs and uh, also on top of the clean room, the plastic scintillator panels. All together, this is our muon VETA of our experiment. Uh, here we have a clean room on top of the cryostat. We have a clean room with a lock system and with a glove box where we perform all operations with our detectors. And this is our cryostat with liquid argon inside. And uh, now inside this cryostat, this is a very important part of phase two. This is a liquid argon veto system, which consists of a, a fiber curtain, uh, which is written out by silicon PMs. And also on top on the bottom, we have lower reductivity PMTs. 
Inside this cylinder, we have the heart of our uh, experiment, the germanium detector array, and above, this, like 40 centimeters above this array, these are our low activity preamplifiers. And so here you can see the picture of one detector. Uh, the, the, I want to mention that the holder of the detector mainly consists of the silicon, which is also very pure material. This, this gray plate is a silicon. So some photos uh, which show you which show you the installation procedure and the first immersion of uh, our array inside liquid argon. Which uh, so phase two also uh, it was two parts of phase two. The, the first part is uh, included uh, thirty enriched BG detectors, seven enriched coaxial uh, detectors from phase one, and also three natural coaxial detectors. They were seven strings, which you can see here. And so, after two and a half years of data taken, uh, we decided to try to improve uh, our uh, speed, let's say, of data taken also, and also try to see and improve the liquid argon vector instrumentation. And so instead of natural coaxial detector, we put five uh, recently produced uh, novel inverted coaxial detectors and also improve liquid argon vector instrumentation. So, and here I also put the goals of uh, phase two. And so how can we reach our, let's say, background free condition of data taken? For this, we use, uh, different techniques of background rejection. So like pulse shape discrimination, anti coincidence between uh, neighboring detectors, and also starting from phase two, uh, we have a possibility to read out the uh, light uh, uh, close to the detector from liquid argon. So all of these allowed us uh, to re really distinguish between point-like or single site event, which is neutrinless double beta decay and multi-site and also surface events. And so here also the previous achievement of Gerda. You see that already last year, and it was presented on many conferences, uh, that we have uh, the background index like about 6, 10 to minus 4 counts per kf kilogram year, which was and, and the best amongst all competitors. And also the limit, uh, Gerda was the first experiment who overpassed uh, the sensitivity of 10 to 26. Uh, so I just want to mention that these two goals, uh, like background index and sensitivity, we uh, reached uh, already uh, in, in 2019. So, and uh, even in 2018. And so in 2018, we decided to perform the upgrade, which I just mentioned. Uh, the main goal was to test this uh, novel inverted coaxial detector. You can see one of these detectors here. And also uh, by this, we increase the mass of germanium and also improve uh, the liquid argon veto instrumentation. And for sure, for the future, for the, uh, our successor, for the Langer experiment, it was really important to, to show uh, the robustness and the reproducibility of the Gerda approach, uh, namely uh, naked germanium detector in uh, liquid argon, which used for cooling down the detector and for active vector at the same time. So here you see the whole phase two data taken. So this part you see here, I put the uh, the names of journals where it was published, the results step by step of this part of data taken. Here we made the upgrade, and these are the uh, goal of my talk, the, the results of my talk. And so I would want to mention the duty cycle of full phase one, even including this two month upgrade period, is close to 90%. If one excludes this upgrade period, since we did not take data during this time, uh, the duty cycle is well above 90%. So finally, we uh, ac accumulated more than 100 kilogram a year exposure. If one includes phase one, it means it's practically 130 kilogram years of germanium 76, which is uh, yeah biggest exposure ever collected for germanium 76. 
So now for data set is analyzed. So again, how we check the performance of our system, we do every week uh, the calibration with Storium source. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, the new inverted coaxial detectors perform similarly to BG detectors, but they are at least three times more massive. So this is, these detectors are really good candidates and perfect candidates for the future germanium experiments. And also it's uh, worth to mention here uh, that we reached, we, we really close to the best energy resolution, which was shown yesterday in my runner talk. So we have also similar to 2.5, we have 2.6 kV at Q better better. This is also one of the best energy resolution amongst all uh, experiments. Also the uh, performance of liquid argon that improved that upgrade. Sorry. So here our spectrum uh, after data quality, muon beta and INT coincidence uh, cuts apply. You see even here we have uh, something like 10 to minus two uh, accounts per kef kilogram year background in the analysis window. And then uh, I want to show you how our pulse shape discrimination works. Uh, here you see how effective pulse shape discrimination removing, for example, alphas from here, you can see. And I, I would it also it's, uh, spectrum from all detectors, but I think it was to say that mostly alphas here uh, came from uh, coaxial for BG and the electric coaxial detectors that cut, every cut is very effective. And also a liquid argon vector works very well. Uh, you see here on this plot that uh, after uh, applying liquid argon vector cut, we have uh, practically pure two neutrino beta beta uh, spectrum. So, and now when we apply two cuts together, uh, one can easily see the great complementarity between uh, these two cuts. And uh, after applying these two cuts, we reach the background index uh, for all detectors in uh, uh, analysis window, 5.2, 10 to minus four counts per kef kilogram year, which is the best uh, background in index ever achieved. And so now I, I showed you recently photo of the collaboration when we did recently this uh, remote unblinding. Uh, you see, this is just before unblinding and now da -da -da -da, we unblind our uh, closed window, closed uh, to Q better better. Oh, I forget to mention that for sure now all double beta decay experiments are using this blind approach. So they, we open the window only after uh, we finalized all the cuts and also finalized our background model. But now you see when we open this uh, blinded window, we found two new counts uh, since the last data released here, but I don't want to say fortunately or unfortunately, we didn't still do not have any counts uh, close to Q beta beta. So close. it means we still do not see neutralized double beta decay of germanium 76. So here, uh, our statistical analysis, we use two approaches, frequencies and vibration analysis. And then, uh, the results are best in the field in both cases. So, but in usually people uh, using frequencies analysis. Uh, and so here we have a median sensitivity 1.8, 10 to 26 years. And uh, at the same limit is 1.8, 10 to 26 years for neutrinoless double beta decay of germanium 76. So here, it's already my last slide. I want to tell you that Gerda successfully finished data taken in December 2019. Uh, all uh, our design goals not only reached by even surpassed, as you can see here. Now we have world best median sensitivity and limit. Uh, and I think it's really worth to mention that it's proven that in Gerda phase two, we have uh, 
linear increase of sensitivity versus exposure, as you can see here. And so we can name again our experiment as the first background free uh, neutrinoless double beta decay search. And let me say that the success of the Garrett experiment really promises us bright future for the next step of germanium 76 double beta decay search namely legend experiment thank you for your attention thank you very much constantin for this very nice talk uh we have time for a question if anyone wants to ask a question please raise their hand or 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 type it in the q a Okay, I don't see any questions. Maybe, maybe just a really simple one, Constantin. I, um, I, are there Gerda analyses uh, still ongoing? Not necessarily, not, 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 not the neutrinoless double beta decay, but other analyses? Still yes. In progress? Yeah. Yes, yes, I would answer yes, for sure. For example, uh, uh, for example, the two neutrino double beta decay analysis and also the analysis of um, decay to the excited states, as you know. So yeah, yeah, quite some analysis are still ongoing. So we will give, uh, we will provide some new result soon. I would Very, say. Good. Very good. Thanks again, Constantin. Okay. So uh, is the next speaker ready to present? Yes, I am. Okay. So the next speaker is going to talk about uh, uh, the R2-D2 project, it's a great name, uh, a, a new, uh, new neutrinoless or beta decay experiment. Go ahead. Can you see my slide in full screen? Yes, we can. It looks good. All right. Thank you. Okay. So I will present <clears throat> the first result that we got for the R2-D2 project. Uh, I will not describe at all the neutrinoless double beta decay because it's been quite I mean, deeply discussed in the previous talk. But as you've seen, to observe such a rare phenomenon, you actually have some requirements. And the main ones are that you need an excellent energy resolution, you need a low background, and you need large massive of isotope. So the question that we ask ourselves is, can we meet all the requirements at the same time? And this is indeed the goal of the R2D2 uh, R&D, which stands for Rare Decays with Radial Detector. So R2D2 is an R&D. With the, with the aim of developing a zero background tone scale detector for the search of a neutrinous double beta decay. And we would like to do it using a spherical high pressure xenon TPC. So the detector, which was proposed by Jomataris a few years ago, is used today by the NewsG collaboration for the search of dark matter. Of course, we have to uh, change a little bit the design because we want to reduce the background in a regime of energy, which is different. Uh, in our case, is around the qubit of beta xenon 136, so around 2.458 MeV. On the left-hand side, you see a cartoon that shows our detector work. So the outer sphere is grounded. And at the center, you have a, a positive anode, so you have high voltage on it. And all around, you have gas, xenon gas with high pressure. So when a truck crosses uh, the detector, it ionizes it, so you produce electron. The electron are drifted towards the central anode. When you get close to it, you, you, you basically enter the avalanche region, so they got multiplied, and you register your signal on the anode. So the, the detector has many important features. The first one, which is important for us, is the energy resolution. Our goal is to, uh, to have 1% full widal maximum at the xenon 136 qubit beta. This is what we want to validate and it's the main goal actual of the, of the actual phase of the R&D. It's an extremely low background, uh, basically just because of the material budget. So this is reduced to a minimum uh, in order exactly to have as low as background as possible. It's a scalable detector because one ton um, uh, xenon gas is just one meter radius sphere of 40 bars. You have low detection threshold, high detection efficiency, and it's a very simple detector. You have only one central readout channel or few of them in an, an upgraded version. We have today a proto collaboration. So we are approved as an IN2P3 R&D. Uh, it started just as a French effort, but uh, lately the Birmingham University from UK joined the effort. And uh, we, have, uh, we have established a roadmap. So we have the first step, which is what we call prototype one. This is what we have today. It's running, it's funded. 
It's a prototype that could host up to 10 kilogram of xenon at 40 bars. It's no radioactivity because we did not care about that at this level. And we want to use this to demonstrate indeed that we can reach the energy resolution that we aim to. If the prototype one is successful and we get funded for the, for the following, then we would like to go to prototype two. This time is a little bit bigger, it's 50 kilogram of xenon detector. And this time would be a low radioactivity detector because with that one, we, were, we would like to have the first physics result and we would like to use it to demonstrate that we can really have zero background. Then of course, if we meet all these uh, requirements and we get findings for the following, we would go to the final experiment, which will be one ton background free detector with which we would like to cover the inverted Maserica region. So as I say, we are now at the prototype one phase. So you see a, a picture of the experimental setup. We were funded in 2018 with, as I say, the main goal to, to demonstrate that we can reach the energy resolution. So we built a 20 centimeters radio sphere, which is made of aluminum. Uh, as I say, this is not low background, but it was cheap. It was built in the house at saint Bege de Bordeaux. And we, we did not care about uh, being radio pure at this level. We did a lot of efforts to reduce the noise as much as possible. So the detector was placed in isolated and temperature control environment because temperature variation, we found out that they would impact basically, in particularly the electronic chain. And of course they would degrade the energy resolution. Uh, we had to take care of vibrational insulation of the supporting of the sphere and of the central anode because the, the detector was quite sensitive to uh, tiny vibration. And we also uh, work on the development of custom uh, low noise electronics. This was actually done in the frame of the Owen project, which is a dedicated grant that was actually gained to, to develop such a, such a low noise electronic. So the setup was commissioned and it's currently being operated with Argon P2, so 98% of Argon, 2% CH4 uh, in Bordeaux with pressure up to 1.1 bar. Now, of course, we would like to do that with Xeno high pressure. The point is that even though the sphere was conceived to hold 40 bars, it's not certified for that. And, and actually it's, uh, it's quite complicated to, to certify the existing one. So we, we will have a new sphere certified 40 bars in October. And in the meantime, we are uh, completing the Xeno recuperation and recirculation system. So this is the reason why the result I'm gonna present today are just uh, with the uh, Argon P2 up to 1.1 bar. Uh, what about the detector operation? So to, to assess the energy resolution and, uh, and to test our understanding of the, the detector, we use a four Becquerel polonium 210 alpha source. So we have an alpha source of 5.3 MeV. Uh, the, the, the source was uh, deposited on a silver film that is uh, placed on a supporting rod, as you can see in the bottom figure here. And then it's inserted in a, in a, in a hole that was uh, made on purpose at the bottom of the sphere in a way that the source is actually at the radius that correspond to the radius of the sphere, so at 20 centimeters from the anode. We take we, we took data with a different pressure, and we used a, a pulse generator as input in the electronic chain in order to, to basically to monitor changes of uh, of the of the electronics. So if we had temperature variation, we would actually see that with a, with a pulse, and we could correct for that. We had typically runs quite short, so at level 30 minutes and we uh, changed the gas after each run. So we did not have to apply any correction due to the gas degradation. Uh, although I'll show you that uh, this is uh, quite understood, it could be corrected offline. We also have a dedicated simulation, which is based on GM4 and Garfield Plus Plus, and that was used to cross-check the obtained result and confirm our understanding of the detector response in terms of tracks, for example, of its direction, as I will show you in a minute. So the first thing we looked at is detector stability. We took short runs over a period of, uh, a period of 14 days without changing the gas. So we wanted to see how the gas uh, degraded in time because if you have electronegative uh, in your gas, basically uh, you, you, you reduce the number of electrons that reach the anode. And this electronegative impurity, they could come from outgassing of material or leakages and it could increase in time. So you expect to have less electron reaching the anode in time. So you, you expect to have a, a the reconstructed energy with changes. So on the top plot, you see, for example, the, 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 the plot that we have for one run. Uh, at this level, we did not care about resolution. So it's just the mean of the peak. The, the, on the left-hand side at 5.3, you see the, the alpha source and higher energy is the generator pulse. And we, uh, we, we look at, uh, at that over 14 days. So you can see the bottom plot, the blue line is the generator, the red line is the source and the green line is the source corrected. 
uh, as you can see, we expect the generator to, to be stable, but at the beginning, we had actually an increase uh, of, uh, of its signal. This is because we had an increase of uh, a change in temperature, actually, that, uh, that would not allow to take a, a measurement in stable condition, but you can correct with it. So you can go from the red line to the green line. We found that we have a loss of about 0.05% per hour in terms of the signal because of the, of the um, outgassing or leakages. And this is something that we can correct offline, or we actually hope to reduce this in a future upgrade of the detector in order to reduce the, the leakage. Today is at the level of five times 10 to minus nine millibar per second, but we think we could we could get better than that. In any case, this will not affect the result that I'll, that I'll show you now, because as I say, we change the gas every time and we had just 30 minutes to run. So, uh, okay, let me spend a little bit of time on this result. Uh, these were taken at 200 millibar. So you have alpha tracks with a length which goes between 15 to 20 centimeters. Uh, for each event, we reconstruct the waveform. And on the waveform, we can reconstruct uh, variables like the reconstructed charge, so the integral of waveform that we call QT, the width of the waveform that we call DT. And based on different variables that we can reconstruct, we can classify the events. Now on the plot on the left-hand side, you see the real data that we took. And on the right-hand side, you see what we got with the simulation. So we were quite happy of finding a good agreement between that and simulation. And in addition, the simulation allowed us to really understand the shape of data because on the left-hand side, so on data, the color code just represents the number of, uh, of events that you have. Whereas on the right-hand side, the color code represents the direction of the alpha tracks. So black points are alphas that goes directly towards the anode, whereas yellow, yellow points are alphas rather orthogonal to the radial uh, direction. So they go against the, the, the outer sphere. So what I call region one, as you can see, uh, these are events for which we do not reconstruct the full charge of the events. This is because actually the alpha tracks end in the outer sphere. So of course it doesn't deposit all the energy inside the gas. And uh, we actually understood also the dependence of the, of the signal width in terms of charge. So for a smaller signal, we find out that because of, uh, of noise, they would go under threshold sooner. So uh, tracks at very large angle would have a, a smaller DT, so they, they would be narrower. Region two represent the events that, that, that we use for the energy resolution. So the events that deposit all the energy inside the, inside the gas. Uh, now, even there, the simulation allows us to really understand what happened because you would expect that tracks with larger angle would have a smaller DT. Why? Because you would have energy deposit at the same radial distance. So all the electrons would drift and reach the anode together. This is not the case. And we found that the smallest DT comes from tracks that actually go directly towards the anode. And this is because the effect that dominates is not the drift of the electron, but is the diffusion. So when, when you actually have uh, electron deposited far away, you have a larger diffusion. And this is the reason why the smallest DT is got with tracks that go directly to the center anode. So we're quite happy to, to really understand the, dete the detector um, response thanks to this detail simulation. Coming to the resolution results. So uh, we compute a resolution of 200 millibar at 1.1 bar. As I say, at 200 millibar, the tracks, uh, alpha tracks goes between 15 and 20 centimeters, whereas about uh, at 1.1 bar, you have between three and four centimeters. Now, as you can see in the two cases, we have roughly the same resolution. So we found 1.2% full width on maximum 1.1 bar and 1.1 at 200 millibar. This is really important for us because we demonstrate that we have no impact on the resolution due to the length of the tracks. And this is important because in neutrinos double beta decay, what you want to reconstruct are electron tracks. So of course, they're not point like energy deposits. And we show that this does not spoil the, the, the resolution. We estimated at the level 0.6% the contribution of the source itself and of the electronics tend to, to test with the generator, which actually gives us an intrinsic resolution of the, detect, of the detector at the level of 1%. Now, uh, what are the next steps? Of course, uh, this is very promising. We're very happy with that. However, what we want to do that is demonstrate that we can have the same energy resolution at high pressure. And as I say, to do that, we need a new detector certified by pressure that we will have in October. We want to do it with electrons. So we already have a bismuth 207 source. However, in order to contain the electrons inside, uh, inside our sphere, we need at least 10 bars. And then again, we need to go up in pressure. So we will do that as soon as we have the new sphere. In October, we also have the recirculation and recuperation system for xenon. So we can go from argon to xenon. 
of course, you know, we do not throw it away after run after each run as we do with argon. So we really need to make sure that we can recuperate it and uh, recirculate it in order to, to, pu to purify it. And we want to do it with a diffuse source. We had some ideas, but we still do not have any clean radon source because uh, the test that we did, I mean, the, the source we had introduces electronegative impurities. So we, I mean, we saw uh, a different energy deposit in terms of the radial position, which is not what we want to, to, to observe. We will carry on with uh, developments of the electronics and we did some tests in order to read the scintillation light with a silicon PN. This is really important because at the end, we would actually like to have the T0 to reconstruct the radial position of the deposit. You can see here a screenshot of the oscilloscope. So this is very preliminary. We just got this measurement. In light blue, you see uh, the first peak of scintillation light. In purple, you see the detector signal, which is about 100 microseconds after because you have the drift of the electrons. And you can even see a small bump when you have the detector signal, which is light from the avalanche. We also work on the possibility to use a multi-sensor anode, which is called Aquinos. This would have several central anodes instead of one. and would love to have basically a lower high voltage uh, on, uh, on the anode to get the same drift field. So these are the, the, the main topics we're working on. So I come to my conclusion. So we have uh, now a collaboration which has been established. We are approved uh, by IN2P3 as an R&D. We did some tests. I mean, so we computed some sensitivity studies and we, we found out that in principle, we could have competitive sensitivity with small masses and potentially we can have a zero background detector with large masses. Of course, this is what we have to demonstrate with this R&D. We have a good detector understanding. So we found a resolution at level of 1.1% with alpha, 5.3 MeV. And we demonstrated that the energy resolution is not degraded going from point like energy deposit to long particle tracks. Uh, now we have to move on and confirm all these things in order high pressure. And of course, depending on the success of this R&D, we really hope to move on and build a prototype that will allow us to do some real physics results. Thank you very much. Thank you for the interesting talk. Um, are there any questions from any of the attendees? Please raise a hand or type it now. Don't see any questions. Maybe I'll ask just a quick one then. Um, I mean, this you, you didn't say so much about the prospects for being zero background. I mean, can you say a few words about that? I mean, what's what? What, what's your expectation in terms of single site versus multi-site discrimination and so on? I, I didn't talk about that because this is not the, the, the goal of prototype one, but we did some sensitivity studies with simulations. So we actually published a paper with the expected sensitivities that we could get with a 50 kilogram detector. Mm. Uh, basically, as I say, the low background comes from the fact that the detector is really simple. So you just have a copper sphere. And when we do this, we did a simulation, we assume 10 micro becquerel, uh, per kilogram of copper, which is actually conservative since we found on the market copper 10 times better. And with that simulation, we found out that the, I mean, the, the intrinsic background could actually uh, come from the copper because all the external background could be reduced. I mean, in the final setup, we would have liquid scintillator outside in order to reduce that. And of course, I'm shielding and you would go on the ground. So uh, with the simulation that we carried out, uh, we ended up with, uh, I think it was about two events per year. But as I say, we were conservative on the estimate on the copper purity that we could have. So then again, this is Gen 4. So we, we will have to, to, to validate step by step. And if we manage to validate the resolution, we will go to a low noise sphere to be operated background, uh, underground to, to really demonstrate that we can go zero background. OK. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, is the last speaker ready? Um, yes. Hi, so uh, um, yep, now we're going to hear about um, the development of a, of a new um, uh, self vetoing structural material that, that may have application in, uh, in low background experiments. That's PEN. Okay, so you can start. We can see. Yes. Okay, uh, so first I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity. I'm presenting on behalf of the PEN working uh, group. Um, I will present the usage of PEN as silver twin structural material in low background experiments. So first let me introduce the PEN consortium. So we are about 
25 uh, people working on different aspects of R&D in order to produce low background pain that could be used as uh, active uh, structural material in low background experiments. And most of the people working on pain also is part of the legend collaboration. So what is the motivation for this type of development? So I uh, was presented in all the previous uh, talks. Uh, you can uh, see that rare event physics experiments demand a very ultra uh, low background. So uh, to do that, so we need ultra pure uh, materials for uh, the structures and also for the detectors itself. So in general, what, uh, what happened in some experiments that is you have the detector, but you need some support structures around the detector to place the, the detector. And if you take, for example, uh, I'm taking just two examples, for example, Core and, and Legend uh, 200 uh, expectation for the background. So you can see that uh, an important source of background or the dominant source of background are the backgrounds coming from the outside. So some backgrounds are produced in the structures, uh, can induce by moons, in more uh, go through these uh, uh, structural materials. And uh, uh, in addition, uh, if the detectors, for example, are placed uh, as, as in the case of legend in uh, liquid argon, so there is light that is produced and can be used uh, to veto these uh, external backgrounds, but these support structures can absorb this light that can be used to, to veto the external background. So we want to go to the next level to one tone experiment, so we need to do better. And uh, that's the answer that we want to to provide with pen, uh, then the idea is replace all these inactive structural materials with uh, some uh, silvotic active material, which we think we is uh, or can be pen. So what is pen? So pen is a commercially available polyester. So it has a yellow strain higher than, than copper at cryogenic temperatures, which is, is very good because most of these experiments work at cryogenic temperatures. Uh, there was a first evidence in 2011 of fluorescence in addition, it has wavelength shifting capabilities. Uh, it has been deployed, for example, in the proto dual phase. And all these properties make pen ideal uh, to use as a structural supporting material. You can, for example, at this publication here. So the first thing that we need to check is uh, the mechanical properties are okay to replace uh, the, the structural materials. In most of the case, uh, copper is used because you can uh, achieve a very good radio purity. And we have performed some tests at room and cryogenic temperatures that you can see here in, in these photos. And it was found that pen has a high structural stability at both room and cryogenic temperatures. In addition, uh, pen is very chemical resistant to most of acids, which uh, is good because it can be aggressively cleaned in order to remove uh, some remaining surface uh, contamination, for example. So, uh, so now uh, we know that we can replace copper uh, by pen. So what about the scintillation properties? So pen scintillates in the blue regime. It's here in this plot, you can have, you can see the emission spectrum. It peaks above 450 uh, nanometer, which is ideal for most of the photosensors. And it has a light yield uh, of about one tier of the standard plastic scintillator, which leads to about a bit more of 3,500 photons per MeV. In addition, as I said before, it can shift the uh, uh, BUV uh, light to visible light, uh, which means that can be used to shift the light from liquid argo or liquid uh, xenon, for example, to visible light to the photosensors. And it can do that with an efficiency of about 40% of TPV, which is the standard material used to, for, for this shifting. But uh, uh, with the advantage that uh, producing big surface is much easier uh, in the case of pen. Uh, in addition, uh, we have the possibility to have a, a PSD, a pool shape discrimination, uh, which is very good because we can do alpha decay identification, for example, to identify surface uh, background, and it has an attenuation uh, length of the order of few centimeters. Here in this example, I'm just showing the light output when we use some pen samples and we excite with a bismuth source. So this peak corresponds to one energy electrons. It's about 400 uh, uh, keV electrons. And here, just to show the, that we can uh, have a good uh, PSD discrimination when using a California source. So we have uh, the scintillation properties. What about the, how easy is to produce any arbitrary shapes? So we need to take into account that PEN is a semi-crystalline polymer uh, and the crystallization uh, can lead to the polymer appearing opaque and we need to avoid that. But uh, PEN, 
uh, must be cooled uh, from about 300 to 200 uh, degrees Celsius in less than 10 seconds in order to remain amorphous and transparent. And this can be done uh, using the inject injection molding technology. Uh, we have uh, done uh, some uh, uh, progress on, on this matter. We have produced uh, different uh, shapes, plates, containers, capsule fibers, and also there are current efforts uh, to, synthesize, to synthesize pen at the uh, ORNL. Here you can uh, see some of the arbitrary shapes that uh, we have produced. We have, for example, this type of capsule that you can imagine that uh, you can encapsulate you the, uh, your detectors to, to protect from the backgrounds coming from the outside, for example. So uh, uh, we have performed some uh, fish production run under clean condition that uh, uh, will be used to produce uh, holders for the Legend 200 experiment. So we're starting uh, from uh, raw material. So you can see here the pellets. Then uh, these pellets were cleaned uh, aggressively. And then uh, in some parts uh, were produced in a clean uh, room uh, using the injection molding uh, technology. You can see here, and here you can see a finished plate. You can see clearly that it is scintillating. And the entire process uh, uh, took less than four minutes, which is good in order to avoid exposition of the material to the uh, backgrounds. And we have used this uh, first production to define a protocol for next uh, productions, and a publication is, is coming soon. So what is the radio purity that we have achieved in this first production run? So we use uh, about 20 kilograms of the pen samples that, uh, that, that were produced to measure at two underground laboratories at uh, LNGS and uh, Modan. And uh, we have this uh, final result. We have a few uh, tens of uh, microbecquerels per kilogram. And uh, if we take into account that from one of these plates, we can uh, uh, machine several holders, uh, which we expect to have about five grams uh, per detector mount base plate, uh, we end uh, up with an uh, uh, activity of less than one uh, microbecquerel per plate, which is, is very good. So as I said, uh, we need to machine these uh, uh, plates in order to produce the holder. We have done uh, this already, a first production. This was done at the Tennessee University Physics uh, Workshop. So in order to prevent a possible contamination, we designed a jig in order to minimize the pen, uh, plate exposure, as you can see here. The pen plate is placed between two uh, acrylic plates, and then the, the, the plates are machined. In, in that way, we minimize the exposure to the possible, uh, to any possible source of uh, contamination. All the tools uh, uh, and machines were cleaned. So we have the, the method that we use. Then, uh, uh, once that uh, this uh, plate were produced, I just uh, want to say that the geometry was optimized do, uh, doing some mechanical simulation in order to minimize uh, the mass. So here you can see the red parts were the parts that uh, were cut. And here you can see a final plate, how it looks like. So first we did some tests at the Tum University in the cryogenic facility. And then uh, the planes uh, uh, were also uh, transported to LNGS, where we were cleaned again, and were uh, mounted uh, with, uh, in some uh, Germanium detectors that are being used for the post test at LNGS. So in about 40% of the detectors, uh, uh, we have uh, some pen plate. And this will allow for the, uh, direct comparison uh, with the silicon plates, as Constantine said, is, uh, in Gerda, silicon plates uh, were used to mount the detectors. But we had some preliminary results that showed that uh, at least a pen is not affecting the response of the detector. And we are analyzing, we're expecting uh, more data that uh, hopefully we can have some uh, preliminary results of uh, how efficiency is a uh, pen in this configuration. And uh, now uh, we are uh, making the production uh, for Legend 200 and also continuing with the more LD. For Legend 1000. I just uh, want to thank uh, the people from Legend that they uh, make it the uh, deployment possible at the LNGS. Now, also, we need to characterize the, the optical properties. And to this end, uh, we have mounted several setups consisting of PMTs where we can place the pen samples and they can with a radioactive source. We have some uh, preliminary numbers for the uh, LIGL. Uh, we now have the, the mission spectrum. Uh, we have uh, we know that the attenuation of, is the order of few centimeters and wavelength dependent. 
and the surface also are being studied. We have developed also a detailed gene force simulation of the setups, and that will allow us to have an absolute uh, uh, values for light yield, for example, and absorption as function of the wavelength, and also to characterize the, the surface effects. Uh, the idea is that uh, we can use then uh, these results as input uh, for uh, uh, detailed studies uh, on optimization of pain in uh, the context of uh, legend. So that, this brings me to the summary. So I, I hope that I have convinced you that pain is an attractive synthetizer that can be used as, a uh, as a active structural material. We have uh, performed a successful production of low background uh, pen holders uh, uh, for Legion, which has been optimized for, for Legion 200. We have defined a, a protocol uh, for uh, production under clean conditions, and uh, also the first uh, prototypes of the, these pen uh, holders were deployed at the LNGS during the post gerda test. Uh, the optical characterization is ongoing. We have some preliminary numbers for, uh, for LIEL uh, attenuation, and also we have developed a detailed for simulation to, to have a um, more complete understanding of the effect of pain in LIEL. Uh, we are preparing uh, papers now on the first production run on the synthesis, so stay tuned for that. And then uh, our next steps will be uh, the production of uh, enough holders to mount uh, the Legend 200 detectors and also extract the absolute optical parameters at like LIEL, attenuation as function of wavelength, uh, and characterize the surface effects. And also study and characterize the wavelength shifting uh, capabilities. Um, of course, continue with uh, much more A and B for Legend 1000. So that's all. Uh, thanks for your attention. I know there are questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the speaker? Please raise your hand or, or type a question. I don't see any questions. Maybe maybe just a very quick one from me. I, if I understand correctly, you, you haven't directly measured the radio purity of the pieces after machining. Is that right? You, 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 you've measured the radio purity of the molded pieces before machining, but not. Yeah, not yeah, yeah that, that, that's right. So we measured before uh, machining uh, using this protocol. But uh, the idea for Legend 200 is that we will uh, produce the uh, the holders with enough anticipation in order to measure before installation in the in the experiment. But for this uh, uh, post Gerta test, we didn't have enough time to measure after the machine. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Okay. I think uh, I think we've come to the end of the session now. So I just want to thank all the speakers again uh, for uh, some very interesting presentations. Um, Thanks everyone for listening in. Um, I don't know if the organizers want to say anything. I think, I think there's a poster session immediately following this that people are of course invited to attend. Do the organizers want to say anything else? No, I think no. Okay, in that case we end the session and thank you very much everybody. Have a nice day, bye. Bye.